I don't even give a fuck if you believe me. This sounds unreal, more like a dream I had, and nobody else believes me. But you guys are more trained in occult bullshit, so what the fuck. Be me. 19. Visiting my grandfather in North Michigan. A bit of backstory about Gramps. Grandpa lives in a cabin, like a pioneer. I never really knew him too well. Only saw him once every few years. All I really know about him is back in the 70s, he was in Nam. When I was 17, he confessed to me that he felt terrible about the things he had to do there. Apparently, beat a kid to death with a shovel. After that, I kind of avoided him. Too freaked out to talk to him, especially since he was clearly unstable. Old guilt caught up with him. Now he knows he's nearing the end of his life. Liver problems. Refuses medication. Invited me over since I'm his last living relative and he wants to spend time with me before he passes. At first I was hesitant, but I decided this is what my father would have wanted. After about three hours of driving, I get to his cabin. Nice place. Looks like it's made of Lincoln logs. He's waiting outside on his cabin porch, smoking a pipe in a rocking chair. Looks straight out of a cartoon, suspenders and all. Looks exhausted. Dark circles under his sacky eyes. He gets up and gives me a bear hug. He's trying to hug me as hard as he can, but he's clearly weak. We hug for a few more minutes, mostly because I find it too awkward to break away. I remind myself that even though I only remember him for a few years, he's known me most of his life. Halfway through, he starts kind of breathing heavy on me. Sniffles. Realize he's been crying silently. Eventually he breaks away, red-eyed. Come inside and on. Okay, Pa. Come inside to a very cozy cabin. It's getting cold, especially in Michigan, so he has the fire going. He has running water, gas stove, and two beds. One of them is very new and high quality. I think he bought it just for me. When I get over the initial off-puttingness of his behavior, I begin to care for him. I kind of remember my grandfather, if that makes sense. The bond of family becomes newly important. Decide to be his living helper until he dies that very day. He starts to make us some decaf, but halfway through, he starts to sweat. I help him to his chair, by the fire, and finish the coffee. My coffee tastes like shit, but he's still very appreciative. Assures me that it's delicious. After the decaf, we get ready for bed. He lies on the beat up small bed, and he tells me to sleep on a new one. When I tell him we should switch, he refuses. I guess he really did buy it for me. He says his prayers and falls asleep. I can't stand watching this dying old man, my own flesh and blood, sleeping on that pile of junk. He's quite small and frail at this age, though not thin. With a bit of effort, I managed to lift him up gently and tuck him in to the big bed. Move the small bed to the window and make sure to sleep facing it. That way, the sun wakes me up. When the sun wakes me up, it's like 6am. I slide the bed back and switch my grandpa back. Lay on the good bed for another 20 minutes before I realize I can't fall asleep again. All that lifting woke me up. Decide to just prepare breakfast and pack his pipe for him. Go to an outhouse near his cabin because flushing might wake him up. When I'm done, I step outside. Notice something behind his cabin. It seems to be a gate holding six black horses. They're shackled in these massive metal chains. Each horse has a huge metal ring around their necks. They're all chained together and all to the ground. Since it's like 6am and the forest is dark, they look creepy as hell. I thought it might have been a trick of the light, but their faces looked fucked up. Pick related is a horse skull. You know how most horses don't look like that skull? These did. Their eyes almost looked red. I thought it might just be a reflection, 
like how cameras show red pupils. God, was I wrong. Stepped back inside to find Grandpa awake, sitting on his bed. Talked about what we were going to do for the day. He said his back felt good enough today that he might want to do some fishing. Not to stroke my own ego, but I attribute that to me letting him sleep in a good bed. Let me tell you, he might as well have been sleeping on the floor. Whatever. After a breakfast of eggs and bacon, I drive him to a pond near the house. We fish for a while, silent the entire time. Wasn't awkward though. It was a comfortable silence. I didn't catch anything, but he caught a free pounder. Had me help him reel it in. He was very proud of himself. And that, that made me happy. Said he used to love to go out fishing. Told him we'd make it into dinner. On the drive back, I asked him about the horses. I had kind of forgotten about them since early morning. Instantly knew I shouldn't have asked him. His cheerful smile was replaced with a kind of stern grin. He looked like he was forcing himself to maintain a rapidly fleeting smile. Told me not to worry about it. They were just some pets. I almost listened to him, except he nervously quivered when he said worry. Never happened before or after, so I doubt it was just an old man thing. When we got back, he showed me how to gut and debone the fish. Marinated it in a dry rub for about 30 minutes while he took a break to puff on his pipe. While he was doing that, I opened the curtains to the back window and peered at the horses. They hadn't moved at all. They hadn't eaten or slept. They didn't look cold, but they were still shooting hot breath from their nose. I know because it was cold. I saw it. I stepped outside to talk to my grandpa about the horses. Pa, did you forget to feed the horses or something? You don't feed these types of horses, son. I had no clue what he meant, but every time I tried to ask, he would just ignore me and change the subject. When he was done, we stepped inside and had our dinner. I noticed he prayed extra long that night. Fast forward to the next morning. I just woke up with the sun and put my grandpa back into his bed. I decided to get a bit closer to the horses this time. Got just barely close enough so I could see them. I don't think they noticed me. Christ, remembering it now sends shivers down my spine. Just as terrifying as I initially thought, if not more so. Shaggy, matted fur, deformed, bent out of shape skulls. I know 100% their rib cages should not have been indented like that. Their teeth looked like they had been chewing on rocks or something. It wasn't just their appearance though. I've been around deformed animals before. It doesn't really bother me so much. They had a fucked up presence. Like the feeling in your stomach after you watch some fucked up gore. Initially, I had felt bad for them. But now, I just wanted them to die. Strangely, however, I also wanted to get closer. Just being around them made me weak in the knees. I couldn't do it. One of them looked me in the eyes, and if I hadn't just used the bathroom, I would have shit myself. Ran back into the cabin and hid. Grandpa was just starting to awake, so I tried to just forget about it and get to work. Today was supplies day, meaning we were going to go into town to refill on food, firewood, toiletries, etc. I decided to buy Grandpa a cake too. Not for any special reason. Just that it's important to have fun while we could. Usually he just got someone to deliver him food, but it was good to get some exercise. Plus, his back was feeling fine. We rode into town and Grandpa said he was getting sick. Poor guy hadn't been in a car for a while. Motion sickness got to him and we had to pull over. After that, I realized we had to go quick. We got to a giant. Except they call them something else there. Good and plenty, something like that. Pick everything up. 
I hide the cake from Grandpa to surprise him with it back at the cabin. When we get back, something is wrong. I feel that same stomach feeling. There is a fucking racket coming from the back of the cabin. I pull up the car and step outside. The horses are going nuts. Littered on the floor behind them are some white balls. Grandpa tells me, very sternly, get in the fucking cabin. Shouldn't we drive away? Son, the worst thing we could do right now is try and escape. I have no clue what the fuck he's on about. When we get inside, he starts explaining. Remember that he's an old man and he's injured, so I can hardly understand him. He starts talking about how he didn't know they were there when he bought the cabin. If he leaves, he's gonna die. They must have eaten something. From what I can piece together, if you feed them, they get stronger and they can lure things in better. Once one of them got a bite, they got enough strength to lure in more and more. The most we can do is hope they run out of things to eat. Snap. A loud fucking crack, like a whip, snaps through the air. Grandpa goes silent. What the fuck was that, Pa? He stares at me, kind of empty-like. Looking back at it, he was accepting his death. One of them broke the chains. What the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck? Pa looks at me with a kind of pain in his eyes. Behind you. I whip around, facing the building. You're a good kid, Sonny. Lose consciousness in a second. I come to with the sun beaming on my face. Wake up in a pile of my own blood. Crowbar at my side. My head aches like fuck. I touch the back of my head. Just a flesh wound. I pick myself up and try not to vomit. Fail. I sit down and try to come to. Everything aches. I'm freezing. Wait, why am I freezing? The right wall of the cabin is full of holes. Looks like someone threw boulders through here. What the fuck? Where's Grandpa? No fucking sign of him. In fact, no sign of anything. I open the door and step outside. Check behind. The gates have been trampled. The chains are broken. I get closer. Those white things were crushed up rabbits. The horses half chewed them and spit them out. Start to piece everything together. Promptly vomit again. Long story short, I walked back to the cabin and picked up a few things. I picked up my grandpa's pipe and his blue grass tobacco. Found a golden cross that he kept hidden in his cabinet. Drove home without stopping. Next day, I called a delivery boy and asked him to deliver to the house so I could see if I dreamed the whole thing. He told me the house was burned down. Guys, I have no idea what the fuck happened that day. I'm sitting here and smoking his pipe. Honestly, it's the only proof I have that any of this happened. My therapist can't explain it since I have physical evidence. My priest can't explain it since there's no records of demon horses or anything as far as we know. My friends tell me I'm full of shit. I don't know who else to turn to, guys. Help me. I got one. Might be long as shit, so I'll green text it. B19. Just got engaged. Fiance likes to stay inside and play video games. Convince her to come with me on a camping trip with some males from work. Load up on liquor, smokes, guns, and ammo. Bring a couple 22s for plinking and a few hundred rounds. Some dangerous animals in the area that we're going to, so bring her AR as well. Meet up with Stonerbro and his sister. Hop into their SUV and pick up the other guy. Overbro is sort of strange and quiet, but a pretty alright dude, if not creepy sometimes. On our way to Stonerbro's secret spot. Almost there, and car runs out of gas. What the fuck? I thought you filled it up before you picked us up. Uh, guess I forgot, dude. Well, 
It isn't too far. We can hike it. Sigh and agree. It was about 11 when we left. Got there about 1 p.m. Hike took around two hours. Mostly for piss breaks, though. Finally arrive at the clearing. Stoner bro, overjoyed, immediately starts smoking. Start setting up a fire, while fiancé sets up the tents and shit. Creepy bro is listening to his iPod. Stoner bro's sister awkwardly tries talking to my fiancé and helps her. Crack open some beers. It's around 5pm after we all get settled in. Roast some hot dogs, marshmallows, make s'mores. Good old-fashioned camping. Creepy bro keeps jerking his head up from his notebook and keeps scribbling shit. Stick around, get a bit fucked up till about 9 or 10 p.m. Finally decide to call it a night. We'll plink the beer bottles and cans in the morning. We all crawl into our tents except for Creepy Bro, who stays up doodling his slender man or whatever. Sleeping, when we hear a loud yelp. Wake up, tactically shit the sleeping bag and peek head out of the tent. Creepy Bro looks like he pissed himself. Ask him what's up. He looks at me and says, Oh, it must have been a fox or something. Sorry for waking you anon. No problem, bro. That JPEG. A bit irritated, but figure he's autistic or something. So just sigh and go back to sleep. Wake up about 30 minutes later to the same yelp. Pissed off, I storm out of my tent and go to talk to Creepy Bro. Creepy Bro is in his tent sleeping. Figure I'm just hearing shit in my half-sleeping state, but look around, just in case. Meh, nothing. As I'm just crawling back into my tent, hear loud breathing and twigs crack. Completely freeze. No idea why I froze, but for some reason, I got this instant feeling of utter fear and dread coursing through my entire body. Stand there half in my tent, my ass hanging out the back of it. Fiance wakes up and asks me what I'm doing. Notices I'm visibly freaked out. Slowly reach for her AR and say, Shh. Load it and rack it. Turn around and look around outside. Nothing. Just a drunk fucking idiot, half naked with an AR. Hear a sudden crackle in the woods, really loud and sudden. Jerk toward the sound and accidentally ND into the woods. Everyone jerks awake and yells what the fuck. Apologize. Tell them I just saw a deer. Go back to sleep. Nothing else except stoner bro pissing on a tree outside and falling over. Morning comes. Everyone's still pissed at me about last night. Do some plinking. Make some chili. Everyone forgets about it after a bit and we have fun again. I still feel that dread from last night so I keep a bit quiet. We hiked around for a bit, took in the breathtaking scenery, and just enjoyed life for the whole day. Nothing unusual, really. Night falls once more. It's a chilly night, so we build a giant, roaring fire. Shit's cash. We roll some logs over to sit on, and just enjoy some marshmallows. Creepy bro stays out of the circle, like usual, and doodles on his notepad. Doodling intensifies. Talking with stoner bro and his sis. Talking about work, how we hate our bosses, normal stuff kids do. Fiance is tired from all the hiking and shit, which is unusual for her because she's fairly fit. She just lays her head on my shoulder while I talk to Stoner Bro when suddenly. Everyone, even Creepy Bro, jumped straight the fuck up. Look around and we all ask what the fuck was that? Is that a fucking tree falling? Instantly, that fear comes back but much worse. The dread as well. We all begin to feel sick. Think someone spiked our liquor with something. Everyone runs to grab the guns. We get our shit and group up close and watch our flanks. Stoner bro, fiance, and stoner bro's sister are freaking the shit out. Suddenly, blood curdling scream from the woods. Then another. And another. Jesus, what the fuck? Everyone starts grabbing whatever's most important to them 
and we jet. Running down the steep hill we walked up the other day, Stonerbro sis trips and hurts her leg or foot or whatever. Suddenly, Creepy Bro runs up to her, and I swear to God, carries her over his shoulder and still runs faster than any of us. Get the truck. Hop in. Shit. No gas. The same noise again, and screams in the distance, and some close by. Creepy Bro grabs Stoner's sis and runs way ahead of us like an idiot. Drops his notebook. Pick it up on the way. We run for God knows how long, or far, until the noises stop following us. Completely out of breath, we rest for a bit. Look up after some minutes and see a naked dude standing in the distance. Dude is staring at us. Get up and stare at him back. Call out. Hey dude, you lost? Silence. Fiance says we need to leave. Why? Says, dude, look at his fucking head. What? Realize his head is a weird triangle shape. Suddenly, that yelp. Maximum fear that web him. Then yelp, 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 all around us. Tactically shit out an entire Abrams and damn near cause World War Three in the woods. We start running again. Stonerbro's sister is so scared, she's limp running faster than my fiance, who ran track for six fucking years. We run for about 20 more minutes when I look back, then just before I turn my head, I trip. Slam my head on concrete. It's the fucking highway. We calm down but keep a quick pace, down the way we came, when we got to a gas station. Finally sat down outside, since it was closed. No one says a word. We all doze off and hitch a ride with an old couple headed our way later that morning. On the way, remember Creepy Bro's notepad. Go to hand it to him, but he's passed out. Decide, may as well see what this kid draws. Flip through. Dragons, furries, and shit. Pretty damn good artist, though. Dates on all of his shit. Flip to the end and see the date from when we arrived. Look at it. He drew trees falling. The next day, like a legion of these dudes with triangle heads. Mind blocked out seeing the naked dude, but seeing his picture, even the stance was exact, and so was the distance. I get that fear and dread once again, and swear to God, heard that yelp again, even though we were miles away at this time. I still have nightmares about this shit, and this was years ago. I'll be here for an hour or so, if anyone has questions. Finally finished it. Sorry for taking so long. Gonna be multiple posts since it's pretty long. For context, this all happened in the Northwest Territories in like 2002. Closest town is around 30 miles away. Don't really know how to green text either. Hope it's fine. Be me, 19. Dad tells me granddad died and after a while, we figure out he left me his old cabin. Think it's weird because we never really talked. Figure it's because we were probably the only real outdoorsy people in the family. Never actually went there, but granddad lived there for a few years apparently. Super off-grid guy. Hated government and loved the wilderness. Hardcore survivor type shit. Had shit tons of guns. Served in Korea. Loved shooting. Left a note with the will for me about the cabin. Location, etc. Surprises me when I go on Google Maps to check the cabin or see if I can see it. No path visible, but the cabin is in a big ass field. Dad convinces me to head out there. Tells me it would be fun and it would be great to do in remembrance. Figure I'll take some friends, since it's not that far from where I live, only a few hours drive. Finally get heading out that way with two buddies, Carter and Jay. I'm poor so all I can bring is an old ass Enfield Grandad gave me for my first gun. Jay goes full Chinese LARP and some old fucking Mao Halloween cosplay with a Glock 45 for some reason. Carter is a little more normal but still brings out some old .308 bolt action. Drive for about 3 hours from starting destination before we reach the old road to head to the cabin. Can hardly see, cause night time 
and snow coming down. Literally only light is the headlights and the stars. No moon, nothing else. Finish the drive down the old dirt road, and the cabin gets illuminated by the headlights. Place is way bigger than I figured it would be. Think a two-story house in the suburbs, but cabin slash wood made. Figure it's just an older picture, and granddad did some renovation or something. Offload all our shit and head inside. No power, just a few candles. Whatever. We brought a shit ton of lights and a generator in the back of the truck. Leave generator outside, gas it up and start hooking up the lights. Get the inside of the house done in about 20 minutes. Decide that that's enough for the night. Only two bedrooms. Carter decides to sleep on couch in the front room. Head to bed. Used to be my granddad's, while Jay goes to the guest room. Room is dusty as fuck, but pretty comfy. Set all my shit up inside. Put all reliable Enfield up against the nightstand and head to bed. Switch off the lights and fall asleep. Wake up to Jay, still in full Chinese LARP gear in my room, shaking my shoulder. If you want, .mp3. Anon, bro, I just heard something crunching in the snow, then the generator went off. Tell him it was probably just a coincidence. Oh fuck, there's totally a person out there. Think to myself it's probably someone fucking with us or some hobo trying to get us to fuck off so we can sleep at the cabin. Ask him if he saw anything out the window, since we placed the generator right out his window. Fuck no. I'm not looking out my window when there's something out there. Call him at our word and tell him to come turn the generator back on with me. I'm not going out there, fuck that man. I'll wait till morning. Call him a pussy and say I'll get Carter. Grab my rifle and flashlight, then head down to the living room to get Carter. Jay follows since his room is downstairs. On my way down the stairs, and I swear I hear something outside crunching through the snow. Stop going down, turn off my flashlight, and sit still. Jay does the same. Dead fucking quiet. Like, completely quiet. No wind, no buzzing, nothing. Freaked the fuck out. Sit for another three to four minutes in the silence before I swear I hear a fucking whoop outside. Not right outside, but in the distance. Jay whispers in my ear. You hear that too. Shitting my pants but respond, yeah. Hear something start moving downstairs, nearly shit myself and turn my light back on while raising my rifle. Carter stands there aiming his rifle at the window. Fucker looks up at me and he does the neck cut stop what you're doing thing with his hand. Turn off my light. Eyes are beginning to adjust to see shapes. Can see Carter staring down his rifle sights at the window. Five or so minutes go by before I can see him lower his rifle. Turn my light back on. There's something out there anon. What did you just say? I couldn't sleep so I've been watching movies when the generator went off. Seen someone go by the window. Someone? Was on two feet I'm pretty sure. Seen it look in and its eyes were at the top of the window. He doesn't realize the window is higher off the ground due to the foundation. Literally like six feet off the ground. Would have been like eight to nine feet to be at the top of the window. Defcon 2. Alright, so are we turning this generator back on or are we going back to bed? Try to explain that if there's a person out there, we should probably tell them to fuck off or something. Keep making up excuses to not go out. Fine, I'll do it myself. Trying to tell me not to go out and that they're seriously freaked the fuck out. Ignore them and head for the door. Go to open it. Suddenly I'm fucking terrified. Literally can't move. Break through whatever fucking trance I'm in and bust that bitch open. Scan with rifle and light for about a second before I see something in the woods moving. Now you have to understand, there was a solid 250 feet of field and I had one of those fucking spotlight things. All it did was illuminate the tree line and I saw it from 250 feet, against the trees and snow. Fucker was pitch fucking black. Not dark, not grey, not dark. 
like a fucking hole in the tree line into the abyss. You know that paint that's like void black or some shit? So dark it stands out even against other black. Like that. Thing stops, and I see it crank its head towards me. Raise my rifle to it. Have a scope kind of like pick related. Not exactly, but similar. Can't take a picture of it since I lost it in a house fire. Look through scope. Heart fucking drops. Thing is moving towards me and has probably already crossed 75 feet. Boom. Thing stops dead in its tracks. Can see it way better now. Still void black, but can see it's some kind of weird fur. Eyes are yellowish from what I've seen. Looks like if Bigfoot got starved out in a Siberian gulag. Literally ape, but it's still super fucking skinny. Like eight feet tall. Thing looks back at me and lets out this fucking shriek. Not roar, shriek. Can feel my fucking ears ring. Entire body freezes. Thing starts running towards me like a half-life sprinter on all fours. Shitting my pants trying to pull my bolt back. Can't pull my fucking bolt. I shit you not, this is what happened. Looking back on it, it's fucking hilarious. But in the moment, I'd probably give my soul to Mao. Jay comes flying out the door in full uniform and produces Glock from waist. Puts easily 10 shots downrange. Can see the fucking thing trip and roll. Carter is firing from window with rifle. Scramble my ass back through the door. Sounds like downtown Detroit. Thing screams and retreats back into the forest. Holy fucking shit, dude. Jay is checking me since apparently I gashed my arm getting through the door. Carter is staring at the fucking window glaring into the woods. Jay bandages my arm up and we all sit in collective silence for 15 minutes. Decide to block all windows with random shit and barricade door. Cue moving dressers and anything else big enough to block the windows to them and moving a couch in front of the door. We all sit in the front room behind a flip table. Literally the terrorists out of the MW2 house raid if they knew 141 was coming. About an hour passes. Hear something come up to window beside us. Hear it move to the front door. Thing lets out this ungodly howl. Scares the shit out of all of us. Things go quiet for about three minutes other than the sound of crumpling snow. Hear probably two to three more things go to the door. Hear grunt. Things all start pounding on the fucking door. Jay stands up and fires three shots through the door. All collectively decide to move upstairs to top of stairs. Set up at top of stairs. After about 30 minutes, the banging at the door stops. More screeching. Things screech off into the woods. All night long these fuckers circle the cabin screeching. All night fucking long. Sun starts coming up. Screeching fades into the woods. Complete silence for about two hours. Pass out from exhaustion. Apparently Carter follows immediately after. Jay stays up. Fucker was overdosing on caffeine the whole time cause fucker was making instant coffee with our hot plate. Wake up after approximately three hours sleep. Not sure if dream or not. Still in bed for like five minutes. Jay knocks on door and comes in. Talk for a while about what the fuck happened. Carter enters. Tells us we need to get the fuck out and get to the truck. Fuck that man. This thing is on our property. We need to kill these fucking things. Agree with Jay. Carter looks at us like we're stupid. These fucking things are going to kill us if we don't get the fuck out. Remind him we're armed. Fuck's sake, fine then. Give me a minute. Comes back like two minutes later with HK-41. G3 but semi-auto. You fucking had that and didn't use it? My bag was on the couch and I didn't really want to go near the door. The fuck, man? Decide with newfound firepower to go outside and try to set up lights and traps. Set up the lights with no incident. Jay pulls out three fucking bear traps. Oh, we're in business now. Tuck them from his dad in case we went bear hunting. Why we would go bear hunting with no dogs or anything is beyond me. Set them up around the porch. Decide to stay on porch and fuck these things up. All set up on the porch. Decide to shoot some rounds into the woods. Fire like three shots. Hear the fucking screech from the area I was shooting. Fuckers were watching us. 
decide that we can see them or something. Suddenly, four to five of the things start storming towards us. We open up like they're the landing craft at Normandy. I hit one in the chest and the fucker tumbles. Jay opens up with Glock at another that turns and runs back to where it came. Carter drops two more. One steps in trap and pulls it ten to fifteen feet in one stride as it falls to the ground and gets lit up by me and Carter. Mission success. Five casualties. I sweep tree line with scope. Looks clear at JPEG. Approach corpse of one of the things. Now for this, I rely on Jane Carter's accounts of the story, as I am nose blind and my smeller doesn't work. Thing smells like fucking utter shit. Described as burning metal mixed with rotting flesh, and the farts of all of China combined in one pack. Back to me. The one I dropped suddenly starts vibrating on the ground. Not like washing machine, but like epileptic kid at rave. We all light the fucker up. Shaking stops. We debate heading home. Probably like 5 to 6 o'clock. Sun's pretty much down. Decide to spend one more night and go in the early morning. All bunker up in the front room and sleep in shifts. Fall asleep after mine and pass out immediately. Sleep through night. Wake up in morning. We all pack our shit. Leave some stuff and move some of the dressers back. Leave others. Exit door. All the bodies are gone. All five. Just gone. The tracks from them running up to us are still there, but whatever came and got them didn't leave any. Decide to run to truck since it's only like 50 feet from house. All the windows are fucking smashed. The tail lights are just gone. Dented to all shit. One tire flat. Fuck it, let's go. Agree with Carter. I'll hop in. Turn the bitch on and put her in drive. Punch that shit out of here. Heading through forest. Look in my mirror. Shit you not. Like twenty of the fuckers running after the truck. Oh fuck. Oh fuck. Fucking shoot them. Carter and Jay make an ISIS Toyota chase look like a joke of the amount of lead going down range. Drop probably like three to four of them while going like 120 kilometers per hour down the fucking shitty gravel road. They aren't quite as fast, but they're keeping up. Scared as shit. Breach turn off and get on highway. Increase speed to like 175 kilometers per hour. Shit you not. Felt like the truck was going to explode. Things don't follow us onto the highway. Drove like 10 minutes at 1.15 to town. Get pulled over by the fucking one cop on highway. Everyone freaks the fuck out and tries to hide the guns. The fuck do you think you're doing going that fast on the fucking highway? It's icy as fuck out here. Try to explain to him what just happened. Expect to get arrested for being high. Cop gets real quiet. You know my granddad, don't you? Yeah, he was my grandpa. Cop looks back at us. I'll get it dealt with. Get it all cleaned up for you. I'll give you a call when it's all done. What the fuck? Y yes sir. Tells us to get out of town, says they follow scent, and cops don't want people to get freaked out by them. Agree. Drive at more moderate speeds all the way out of the province, only stopping once for gas. Head back home, and we all get out at our hangout spot. Discuss what the fuck happened. Retell the story from all POVs about 12 times. Agree not to tell anyone. We split up. I head home. Open door announcing I'm back. Hear dad call my name. I got a call. Uh, oh. Dad starts basically crying. Oh god, I'm so sorry I didn't tell you about them. I thought they had left that area years ago. Try and get him to tell me what they were. Refuses to tell me. Tells me the government will deal with it. Literally first time I've ever heard him say anything positive about the government, ever. Sleep. I got the call from that same cop a few weeks later, and he told me that the cabin had to be replaced. Replaced? Tells me they have to replace the entire fucking cabin every few years to prevent things from returning to the same area. Tells me it's in the same place but completely different now. Only one floor but pretty long. 
Explains that Grandad used to help deal with things. Explains to me that Grandad used to help government kill things that like to kill people. Also feels the need to tell me they aren't human. No shit. Wishes me good luck in future endeavors. Return the wish. Hangs up. That was all 20 years ago. Telling the story for the first time now, due to wanting not only to get it off my chest, but also just wanting to get opinions on it. Sorry if it was too long. I earnestly don't believe it was Bigfoot or Skinwalkers or Wendigo, and that it was something far less known entirely. I've only been back to the cabin twice. Once with the same two and GF, and once solo. Cabin was different both times. I just saw a fucking moth man. I'm posting from my car at home now, but here's the story. I was sitting down on a bench near a lake in the UK, Brecon Beacons, and it was around 9.30pm. The sky was quite dark, but not pitch black, and I decided to head back to my car and drive home. I was with my dog at the time, and he stopped walking alongside me and just stood there behind me, acting kind of strange. I instantly felt a tension, physically, but I kept going in the same direction, because I had to get to my car, which was pretty far away, and it was getting to be pitch black outside. Around 10 seconds later, as I'm walking, I notice that in front of me, I fucking kid you not, is this massive creature with huge pink eyes sitting in a tree. They were glowing kind of like a cat's eyes, and it was shaped just like the stereotypical depiction of Mothman, but its features were obscured by the darkness. It was around 5'9 in height, something like that. Man, I fucking wish I took a photo, but I was in shock. It climbed the tree and then flew off before I could collect my thoughts. It was too dark to make out its features fully, but it had an albino color scheme. Light gray. It couldn't have been an owl or a bat. It was abnormally huge and had long, insect-like wings hanging down its sides. It moved very smoothly. It looked surreal, like a phantom. There was no way it was a bird or a bat. It was the same size as me, probably slightly bigger. And like I said, it didn't move like an animal either. Funnily enough, I recently started getting interested in cryptids again. Never would have thought I'd see something like this though especially in the UK. A story that happened to me. This happened when I was 15 years old. I'm at my friend's house. It was at night, and we were both playing on his Xbox. My friend had two dogs, a Chihuahua and a Labrador. At that time, the two dogs were with us, lying in a corner of the room. His older sister was house-sitting, as their parents were out at an event. We stopped playing and went out to buy snacks. There is a store near her house, but it was closed, and we had to walk about 30 minutes to get to a 7-Eleven to shop. On the way to the 7-Eleven, I felt watched, or rather like there was someone near me. My friend commented that we should hurry, but didn't tell me why. We shopped and started walking back to the house. It was about 11.30 at night, and the stretch we walked was very dark. As we walked back, that feeling of having someone close to me didn't go away, and I told my friend. I thought he was going to mock me or ignore my comment, but I could see in his face that he was worried too. He told me that strange things happen near the street. According to what he has heard from his sister and other friends, it's common to hear voices and whistles, but when you try to find out where those sounds come from, you will realize that you're all alone. I was already freaked out, but the worst came next. We were a couple blocks away from the house, and we started to hear something from behind. It was movement, but it wasn't footsteps. I turned to look, and I could see a dog. It was big and brown-haired. I stayed watching for a moment, and my friend stopped to look too. The dog stared at us, and after a few seconds, it started to come closer. When the dog started walking towards us, I heard it. The fucking dog said, Wait for me. I'm coming with you. 
My friend yelled and ran away. I followed him as fast as I could. From behind, I could hear the dog chasing us, and the fucker started laughing. It was a human laugh, low and maniacal. We ran all the way to his house, and thank God, my friend's dogs were in his yard waiting for us. The fucking dog that was chasing us was still laughing, and when my friend opened the gate to his house, his Labrador shot out into the street. I still remember. When the Labrador came out to defend us, that fucking monster or whatever fought him off. But my friend's dog didn't last long. I was closing the gate and I got to see what happened. My friend was screaming for his sister to help us. The fucking monster dog killed the Labrador. He was biting it by the neck and all of a sudden he let go. He started laughing again. The dog stood up on two legs and grabbed the Labrador's body and carried it away towards some bushes that led to a nearby hill. All this happened in less than two minutes. I was in shock, and my friend had to push me into his house. It took us a few hours to recover. His sister was trying to calm us down, and the chihuahua was shaking as he watched the door. His parents arrived around 1am. They were scared, and asked us what happened. My friend explained, and his parents seemed surprised, but didn't question the story. His mom told us to stop praying, and his dad was locking doors and windows. We were praying, when all of a sudden, we started hearing the same dog laughing, and it sounded like scratching at the windows. His dad started yelling at him and cursing at the thing to go away. It was only about five minutes. Suddenly, the laughter stopped, and he didn't hear anything else. After all this, you could say that everything went back to normal. His parents told us to go to sleep, and that the next day, we would go for help. Well, what happened next may not be familiar to many of you, as this has a lot to do with the legends and superstitions of Mexico, which is where I live. When we woke up, his parents asked us to describe better what happened. I had already overcome the shock of the experience, and I started to tell them everything that happened, and the things I felt when we went shopping. They told me that what we saw was probably a Nahual. For those who do not know, a Nahual is a witch or shaman that has the ability to change its shape to that of an animal after making a pact with evil forces. Maybe you can say that they are similar to skinwalkers. I already knew what they were, but I never thought I would run into one. They told us that they had called a friend to do a cleanse for us, to remove any kind of negative energy or curses that the Nahual had put on us. According to them, if we had not prayed at night, the Nawal would have probably done some harm to us or even kidnapped us. The day passed, and the lady who was a friend of my friend's parents did a cleansing for us. She also cleansed the house and put some things to protect it. Those talismans, if you can call them that, were buried around the house, and she gave us some necklaces to protect us. Those were the events that happened at the time. But over the years, my friend and his sister who are the ones who have told me a couple of their experiences, say that the activity has not completely ended. The worst case of strange activity was when one night they heard their chihuahua barking. When they went to check what was going on, they heard scratching at the door and whining. They didn't open the door, but they looked out the window, and there they saw it. It was a Labrador dog. He was scratching the door and had his head down. His sister almost opened the door, but my friend stopped her, and told her not to even think about opening it. It was sudden. The dog barked and turned to look at them. His eyes were yellow, and he was bleeding from his neck. They looked at each other, and the dog smiled at them, and then went off into the bush. There were a few more stories, but they are only about scratching or barking near their house. His sister doesn't live there anymore, and my friend says he is about to move. I just hope that whatever is terrorizing them doesn't follow him to his new house. Don't know if it's paranormal, but had kinda a spoopy one. Be living in the Ozarks. Ask a bro if he wants to go squirrel hunting. It's fucking cold. Like 10 degrees with heavy wind, overcast, shin deep snow. It's been miserable cold for a week, but supposed to finally get a break in the cloud cover. Figure they'll start moving once the sun comes out. 
spend the whole damn day hiking like five miles. Sun never comes out. Cold as fuck. Beard literally full of ice. Right before we turn around to head back, something walks out into the trail ahead of us, about 300 yards off. Takes a second to tell what it is. It's the biggest fucking coyote I've ever seen. Easily the size of a medium white tail. It's limping pretty bad. Kind of circles around and then heads into the brush. Bro and me look at each other and talk it out. We decide to put it out of its misery, since it looks pretty badly hurt, and spring is a long way off. Not too stoked about chasing a big ass coyote in the brush, but snow is thick, so it should be easy to follow. We take a few minutes to talk it over. By the time we make a decision, it comes back out of the brush. It's walking just fine and looks our way. We're happy we don't have to put it down, so we watch it for a minute, until it disappears, and then head back. On our way back, we keep seeing big ass coyote tracks on or near our trail. Once we reach a hill, I look back and see that big fucker watching us from about a quarter mile off. I let hunting bro know. He turns back and sees it right as it takes off into the brush again. Spend the rest of the hike back, watching our rear, while hunting bro watches on each side of the trail. Get to vehicle, toss shit in car, and fuck off real quick. We've been out there a lot since then. We only see it when the weather is fucking bad, and only at a distance. I'm planning on getting all gillied up this winter, and getting it. I want to make a cowl out of him. Very curious. Reminds me of the story my strict, no-nonsense grandfather told, over and over to anyone who would listen, and swore to its truth, even as his mental state and memory deteriorated later in his life. Be my late grandfather, late 1950s. Born and raised in remote, very religious Greece, mountainous and secluded area, walking back to his own village once late at night. Here is something trotting behind him. It's a little dog, almost puppy-sized. Grandfather thinks it's strange. Hadn't encountered any dogs of that kind, especially alone in such a remote area. Doesn't think much of it, keeps walking. Continues to hear trotting. Turns around again. This time, he swears the dog was a little larger than before, but he dismisses it as his imagination. He is slightly spooked, but the dog still seems harmless, if not a little strange in following him. Trotting seems to get louder. Grandfather turns around once more. There is no disputing it this time. The dog was definitely larger, considerably so, growling quietly. Now he's definitely frightened, and every time he looks over his shoulder, the dog is getting larger and larger, and seems to have evolved into some kind of hellhound or demon. He's running now for his life from this demonic hound, convinced entirely he had somehow attracted some demon or other. Along the lonely road, he passes by a chapel and busts inside, slamming the door shut and encasing himself in darkness. He leans against the door, panting in terror. As he does so, he swears to this day he heard a cold voice on the other side of the door that chills him to this day. You're lucky you were protected tonight. Grandfather believes the demon was referring to the piece of an orthodox saint's fabric that he died in, I think, otherwise something similar blessed. He kept on him for protection. The saint had a connection to my grandfather's region. Other relatives from the same and neighboring villages experienced similar demons, if anyone is curious. So this happened to my cousin and not to me, but my cousin is a very honest dude, being in the military, not one to really joke around. We live very close to each other, rural eastern PA, and I also have some weird stories about things in the area. Be my cousin, driving home after visiting a few friends. Roads are windy and narrow around here, so necessary to take your time when traversing them. House is located in a dense forested area, 
watching out for deer or coyotes crossing the road. The tail end of something big, leaping into the forest, enters his headlights. Looks like a dog or a wolf, but really big, maybe six at the shoulder. Cousin is spooked, obviously. Drives home faster than is safe. Gets there okay. Brings the family dogs inside. Goes to bed. Next day, takes his rifle and his German shepherd into the woods near his house, close to where he saw the big wolf. Doesn't take long and finds a massive den. His German shepherd is whining like hell. Time to leave that PNG. Halfway home, dog goes ballistic. About 40 yards to his right, he sees the creature from last night. Massive dog slash wolf, easily 6.5 at the shoulder. Black, shaggy hair, just watching him. Him and his dog bolt. Supposedly, the thing doesn't give chase. Told me he still hears strange howls at night by his home. Hopes to bag the beast one day. Thought I'd contribute. Be up at friend's place in a large town in rural Ontario. His house is on the border between the suburb and endless former fields. In the middle, off to the north, has a long, abandoned, yet still maintained, historical village of the original town. We regularly go to the town, which isn't anyone's property, and have little nerf fights. On one typical day, we were just coming back when it was particularly foggy. I looked behind us. Standing maybe 400 meters away from us in the town was a very tall, maybe 8 to 10 foot, man thing. I'm not concerned at first, thinking it could be literally anything and point it out to my buddy. He looks at it and is just as confused. We stand there for a bit, trying to unravel what it could possibly be. It had horns as wide as its shoulders, but no other distinguishable features, aside from its long slender arms that reached towards the ground and its very wide chest. We decide we should probably get the fuck out and we do. Never talk about it after, or even acknowledge its existence. We were like 12 at the time, so maybe we were just R-worded. The town we were in was Uxbridge, Ontario, if that means anything. I have a story, and it's one that makes me think a lot of skinwalker encounters are bullshit, but not for the exact reason you might think. I do think skinwalkers are real, but what they are is much different than some Native American warlocks. I'll green text my encounter, and then get into some finer details. Be me, 20. Year is 2009. On a camping trip in Ireland, because I'm an outdoorsy type, and the Emerald Isle is gorgeous. Everything's mostly normal. I go to bed around 10pm. Have a dream that night. I'm standing in a grotto, naked. I can feel horns slowly protruding from my skull through my forehead. Goat horns. It's not painful. Really feels kind of like a building tightness. A towering, satyr-like figure walks out of the trees surrounding the grotto. When I say walks out of the trees, I don't mean as in he emerged from between them. It was like he stepped right out of one of the trees. I immediately feel a sense of dread in his presence, like a kid sitting in the principal's office, waiting for the principal to come back. He huffs at me. Kind of like a horse. Somehow I understand his message. Transfers this knowledge to me, all at once, that his children are, or were, the changelings of old folklore. Tells me that they've become corrupted, and that I should leave the place I'm camping at, because his bastard children are around. His bastard children eat human flesh. Wake up in a daze. Usually, my dreams are very foggy. This one was, and still is crystal clear in my memory. It's the very early morning, 4am or so, sweating, even though it's quite chilly out. Light up the campfire again, hear rustling from the forest around me. I shine my flashlight between the trees and bushes, and I don't see anything. I hear a young, feminine voice call out to me from the woods. Who are you? Why are you here? I think it's just someone who lived near and I had accidentally camped on his land, or some kind of ranger. Oh, I'm um, immediately shut myself up because I remembered something I had learned on X recently at the time. What was that? Go on. Girl shouts back. Notice her voice is slightly different. 
She had a faint Irish accent when she first called out. Now her voice had a southern twang. I'm just camping here, I thought no one lived on this land. What's your name? She shouted back, angry and with an entirely different voice. She sounded like my mom. What? I shut up and put out my campfire, grabbing my shit and my flashlight. Briskly walk off the site I was camping at, taking the same trail I followed the night before to get there. It's much, much longer than it was before. Feels like I've been walking for a few hours, but the sky hasn't changed at all. I'm getting goosebumps at this point, but I keep pushing on. I hear a female voice again, asking me what my name is. Sounds like it's right behind me. It's been around on my heel. Insanely tall figure standing behind me. So tall that I think I was about knee height with it. In the blink of an eye, it suddenly becomes a deer. Stares at me for a second. Hisses at me like a snake and bears wolf-like teeth before bounding off into the woods. Frozen for a second, in complete shock. Blink again. Suddenly it's much brighter out. And when I turn around, I'm just a few feet from my car. I had another dream, much like the one with the satyr man, when I got back to the States. I can't remember it as vividly, but he told me that I had encountered one of his bastard children, and now I'm marked. I had a few minor, but related, encounters afterwards. I had to move to a big city after getting back to the States from my job, and every time I leave the city, to go back to the small town I grew up in to meet with family, I have weird as fuck encounters with wildlife. Much like the deer with wolf teeth. An example that stands out in my memory was pulling over by the side of the road to check some text messages from my husband when I noticed there was a fawn standing partially behind a tree a short distance from my car. I stopped and stared at it for a second and it walked up from behind the tree fully. Its hind legs looked like those of a dog, and it had a possum-like tail. It made a bizarre chattering noise at me, before it sprinted off much faster than I've seen any fawn run before. I think that skinwalkers are a misinterpretation of something wrong that happened to the fae. The fae are already a malevolent force, and known to trick humans and cause misfortune. But based on the dream I had, and the mutated animals, and what was probably a shapeshifter that I encountered, I have the hypothesis that skinwalkers are the fae warped and turned far more malevolent and evil. Once creatures that merely like to prank, now turned into monsters that feast on people. So I read some creepy stories from people serving in the army in their respective countries yesterday and I decided to share my story. Short info, I served in the Norwegian army. In Norway, we have a mandatory year of service if our psychological and physical health is good. I went as north as Norway goes, hoping to get to guard the Norwegian-Russian border as a border Jaeger. This is one of the more prioritized sections of the Norwegian army. So there is also a selection of who gets to go to the border doing operative missions. Long story short, after six months, I was put in a group of four men, regular patrol with medic, patrol leader, next in command, and a calm man. We left the big garrison and went to smaller stations with different areas of responsibility along the border. 19 years old, me and my crew, four people, off to a new mission. We are specialized in observation, not being seen behind enemy lines. Mike drives us out about three kilometers where the road ends. Put on our gear, start walking along a small gravel road, which leads to the observation tower. Winter is coming, that JPEG. It's getting colder and darker each day. No problem though, as we have trained in the worst weather that this part of our country has to offer. Five hours later, we reach our destination. 25 meter high tower with a small cabin at the bottom. We'll stay here for the next 22 days with no phones. We've been here before. It's our usual base while out on missions. Our job is basically just to watch 
over the Norwegian-Russian border 24-7 and walk patrols along the borderline. On arrival, we talk some shit with the guys who guarded the base before we came. Information about what they had experienced. Just some administration bullshit. Then they leave. One of the guys who left talked about seeing some big, dark figure moving through the woods at one of his shifts. Probably a moose or bear. No worries. Now, the base described in the green text is a very remote location. There are no buildings, nor people, for several kilometers around. After carrying all of our gear, weapons, and food inside of the cabin, we start cleaning our gear as it's full of snow. The medic is up in the tower, as it needs to have at least one person up there at all times, as I said, 24-7. Me and my patrol leader, Olav, started preparing dinner while our calm guy, Peter, was doing an inspection of the base, making sure the patrol who left upon our arrival had cleaned everything properly. Now, the dark is coming, and without any light sources other than a red lamp on top of the tower, it's dark outside our base. The temperature outside is rapidly falling to about minus 24 degrees Celsius. I go to our storage room, get a bag of firewood, and light up the fireplace. After dinner is done, me, Peter, and Olaf sit down in the living room, turn on the television, and start to eat. Potatoes, some greens, and elk meat, I believe it was. After about 20 minutes, Roy, the medic, calls down. We have a phone which connects the first floor to the tower so that we can communicate more efficiently. I pick up the phone, and he informs me about having seen something lurking through the woods about one kilometer from our position on the Russian side of the border. The radar also picked up movement in that direction. I tell him to just keep his eyes up and use the thermal binoculars if he feels he needs to. Roy didn't sound scared or anything, just wanted to inform us about it, in case we needed to get up there and assist him, or get out and find the suspect potentially crossing the border illegally. Anyway, the time is around 8.30pm, and my shift starts at 9pm. Go take a shower, make myself a mug of coffee, and watch TV for 5 more minutes before going up to the tower room. After 1 million steps, I'm there. Open the hatch and climb the last ladder into the OP room. Roy is doing good. Nothing to report except that shit he saw in the woods, which he already informed us about earlier. Roy says good watch and leaves. A fucking stupid tradition, but it's nice. Sit down, pour myself a cup of coffee, and relax. So we have a lot of equipment in the tower. Much of it is actually confidential, so I can't share too much about it. But we have a computer, with internet only for mails and a chatting program, which is connected to other bases along the border. I start talking to a friend of mine on the chatting program. We talk about your regular run-of-the-mill shit. Nothing special, just to make the time go by. Just to make it clear, it's pitch black outside, and the only light is the stars, the moon, and the aurora borealis, which is fucking beautiful by the way. Sitting there, cursing to myself, why the fuck do we need to sit here all night? You don't even see shit when it's night time. One hour goes by, then two. Only one hour left now, and Pete will take over. Boom. Lights out. What the fuck, that JPEG? I know I said we don't have any light sources outside, but inside we do. Not that we keep them on at night, but all the electronical devices inside the tower went black. Never experienced a power surge out here, ever, and as far as I know, no one else did either. Panicking, knowing I can't leave the fucking tower and can't get a hold of the guys downstairs as the phone is dead as well. Contemplating what to do for maybe five minutes, and then the power turns on again. Thank you, Jesus, that gif. Pick related. It's a pick taken where all of this took place. So this is about the time where our troubles began. Peter comes up, talks some smack, explain the power surge shit to him. 
Hope it doesn't happen to me. <laughs> what will I do if the computers are down? Good watch. Go downstairs. Reach the living room. No one there, as the time is now 12.10am. Roy and Olaf probably went to bed. Go to the fridge. Get myself some ham and cheese, and make a late night snack before hitting the bunk beds. Watch some more TV. Only source of entertainment up there. Clean my plate off, and head to our bedroom. The bedroom is small, with four beds, one for each patrol member. There is also a phone inside the bedroom, which works as a alarm clock of sorts. If the guy who has to take over the shift doesn't wake up, the guy in the tower can call down and wake up him or anyone who can wake him up. The phone can also be used to call for assistance if needed. I take off my clothes, set my alarm on my watch, and close my eyes, listening to my two patrol members snoring like a woodwork. I can do not though. Just as I found a good sleeping position, the phone calls. In my head, I think, fuck, have the officers decided to do an exercise in the middle of the night? And just as I'm about to go to sleep as well, fuck me. But it was Peter. His voice was actually shaking, so I took things a bit more serious. Dude, you need to wake up the rest of the guys, he said. Peter, tell me what's going on. Is there some Syrian refugee trying to cross? What's up? Just wake them the fuck up and on, and send them all up here. Hangs up. I, also affected by Peter's voice, feel the adrenaline rushing through my veins. I wake up the guys, tell them that this is no fucking joke, and that Peter is panicking up into the tower. They, half asleep, put on their clothes as efficiently as possible, and we all run as fast as we can up the steps to the tower. Upon reaching the OP room, we meet Peter, who by all means does not look himself. Even if it's dark inside the room, the moonlight shines through the windows and hits his paper pale face. Olaf, who's our leader, but more than just a friend with that title, asks him what the fuck is going on, clearly affected by sleep deprivation. I saw something cross the border. It was fucking huge, I tell you. Not a bear, not a moose, no animal at all, and bigger than a human. Olav kind of looks at him with disbelief, as he says, You sure? I mean, it's 12.30am. Isn't it just the coffee and lack of sleep playing games with you? No, I swear to God, it's something down there. I tried to find it with the thermal binoculars, but I couldn't spot it. Two of you need to go down there. We all look at each other. During situations like these, two people go out and two stay in the tower. And to prevent an all-out crisis along the border because of something that we most likely thought was an animal, we didn't call in the information to our main station. Olaf. Okay, Anon and Roy, you go out to these coordinates along the borderline and look for traces. Me and Peter will stay in the tower trying to look for what he saw. Keep your comms on at all times. Yes, cook Sarah.gif. We go down, get our gear on, load our rifles, turn on comms and GPSs, and walk out. It's a steep hill that leads down to a big pool of water on the south side of the base, and we were to walk towards the water along the borderline. It's fucking cold outside, but not too windy, very silent. We walk, no info from the tower pair, and no signs of any crossing anywhere. After about 30 minutes, we reach the coordinates given to us, turn on our flashlights, and start looking around. What the actual fuck, that weapon. Huge prints in the snow, like fucking gigantic holes. No signs of fingers, claws, or a print. Just holes, like someone shoved a clenched fist in the size of a big log, straight down into the snow. The footprints, or whatever the fuck they were, were clustered together in a relatively big area of maybe two by three meters, but the range between each cluster was a whole different story. Estimated to be maybe two and a half to three meters between each cluster. Fuck me. Now the adrenaline started pumping for real. Me and Roy just looked at each other in disbelief, and Roy said, which I remember very clearly. What 
in the actual fuck could have made these prints? The calm goes off. Both me and Roy jumps like a motherfucker. It's Olaf. You guys need to get back up here. Now. It sounded like a bad horror movie. And I immediately thought of encountering a huge fucking bear. But a bear wouldn't have made those prints. Why? I replied. I saw something. I don't know what. But it's the same thing as Peter saw. You need to get back to base. It's huge. Okay. Scared as fuck? I asked. Where did you last see it? It was just by the name of the lake slash pool of water, maybe 200 meters north. Now, as I said earlier, it's dark outside, but the snow and clear sky with moonlight kind of illuminates the forest, and me and Roy had obviously been walking towards the large pool of water the whole time, and at this point, we were most likely less than half a kilometer away from it. We started running, but through deep snow, with heavy gear on our shoulders, it didn't go as fast as we wanted. We halted for a second, got some water from our now almost frozen camel bags, and then it came. A fucking shriek like you wouldn't believe. It was the most non-human shriek I have ever heard. I can't even explain it with words. It was so loud and powerful. The snow from the trees surrounding us started to slip down on our heads. We turned our heads towards where the scream came from, and there it was, as tall as the trees that it stood amongst. A dark, pale creature with what looked like several long limbs to support its size. In utter shock, we stood still, staring towards what looked like a mythological demon. It was maybe 200 to 300 meters away from us, so it was hard to get a good look at it, but you definitely saw it was there. Also. It was as tall as I said, not particularly big in width, but tall as the medium tall trees growing around this area. I'm certain it was maybe around eight to nine meters tall. Fuck, 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 run, Roy. We need to fucking run. And everything went kind of black. I can't really remember anything from our run, only the sensation of blood in my mouth and the focus on every step I took while running making sure not to fucking fall over. After running for as long as we could, we needed to stop yet again. Weapons ready this time. No visual signs of the thing, but yet another shriek, just as terrible as the first one. Then thumping, loud, ground-shaking thumping. You know the Jurassic Park movies? When the biggest dinosaurs walk? That kind of experience. It felt like the whole damn ground moved. Instead of waiting to get a visual on this fucker, we decided to start running again, but clearly exhausted, our speed slowly but surely went from decent to plain walking. Constantly thinking of the utter and complete terrifying shit we just had seen, we threw our backpacks away, hoping this would make our retreat at least a bit more effective. It did. We came over the last little hill and could clearly see the tower now. Calm started making noises. Afraid the thing might pinpoint our location, I turned the volume down. Olav came onto the calm. I have no fucking idea what the creature is. Nothing like I've ever seen. But it's not far behind. It's lurking in the more overgrown areas just beside the trail you're on. I constantly find and lose it through the tower binoculars. You guys just need to get the hell back here. Thump. 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 Thump, thump, thump. I imagine it started running, and from the sound towards us, we did the same. Literally running for our fucking lives. The shrieks became louder, more angry behind us, as it continued to follow us. That's at least what I believe it did. I'm sure I can talk for Roy as well when I say it felt like we were about to die from exhaustion. We forced ourselves up to the last 50 meters of the trail before we reached the front door. Hands were shaking, trying to type in the code on the door lock as quickly as possible. Door opens. We both kind of jump in, making sure the door is as locked as it can be. Take Olav's and Peter's weapons with ammo, carry it all up into the tower room, and explain what we had seen much more close up to Peter and Olav. They are both as pale as ghosts now. Roy can hardly speak. 
we write it all down as detailed as we can and deliver it to the main station via mail. The rest of the night, everyone is constantly on their toes, watching over the landscape, not saying a word to each other. This was also our last mission before ending our one-year service to the Norwegian army. We decided to reschedule our patrol plan so that everyone walked during the short amount of daytime. The officers didn't believe us and kind of mocked us, but was glad we didn't call in for support because of some animal. I'm 22 now, so this was three years ago. I no longer have any contact with Olav or Peter. I know Roy got PTSS and took his own life last year. This is the best I could find online representing the creature we saw. Pick related. Imagine it without that black cape. Three times taller, standing up. On a scale of 1 to 10, what's the surest you've ever been at any one moment that something absolutely sinister was looking straight at you? I'd rate my experience earlier tonight at about an 8. I was driving home from my parents' house around 10 p.m. They only live about 10 minutes drive from me, but what a difference 10 minutes makes. They're out in the country, no streetlights. It's Michigan in the middle of winter, and I'd made the terrific decision to take a relatively unkept road home. The same road where I collided with a deer not two months ago, instantly vaporizing my Christmas fund. It's deer central out there. Well, I was headed down this road at about half the speed limit, eyes peeled for some of the four-legged, white-tailed terrors, and my eyes were starting to get strained by the headlights of an oncoming vehicle. It was at least half a mile away, but the high beams were on. I guessed it was a truck, though I didn't want to look too closely and then to be blinded by some furry wrecking machine sauntering out in front of me, so I kept my eyes off that side of the road as much as I dared. As I got closer, I realized I was right. It was a pickup truck, but it wasn't heading toward me. It was parked on the shoulder, and the emergency lights were blinking. I slowed down even more, waiting to see the telltale signs of a deer collision. Imploded grill, cracked windshield, missing side mirror, and, obviously, a deer corpse. Once I was alongside the pickup, I still hadn't seen any damage. Now that I was out of the light's glare, I could see that the truck was pulling a horse trailer. The trailer must have been wired in, because the red lights on the back were blinking on and off, in time with the emergency lights on the truck. I rolled down my window to talk to whoever was in the cab, but once I looked closer, I realized the truck was empty. Hello? I called. No answer. Then I heard the scraping and thumping. It sounded like someone slamming an upside down bowl onto a surface repeatedly. It was coming from behind the trailer. I looked out my windshield and saw a loop of rough rope making up part of a knot around the handle on the back of the trailer. I couldn't see the rest of the rope, but the knot seemed to be sliding up and down the handle a bit. I inched forward in my car, peering around the corner of the trailer. Sudden movement startled me. Then I realized what an idiot I was. The rope led to a harness fastened to a horse. The large brown creature was scraping and stomping its hooves on the ground, standing close to the ditch, stretching its rope across the back of the trailer. As I pulled up further, it glanced at me, snorted, and then went back to stomping. Thinking I was probably irritating it, and knowing there were no other cars for miles, I switched off my headlights. It kept stomping. I looked at the ground around its hooves. The snow was tossed up, and in some spots, the horse had chipped off bits of the dirt shoulder. He'd been out here a while. Hello? I called again, fully expecting a response from the dark field on the other side of the ditch. Nothing. I looked at the horse again. Steam shot from its nostrils. Then I looked back at its hooves and the ground around them. I'm not a boy scout, but fresh snow makes it fairly easy to piece simple stories together. 
In the brief, flashing intervals of dim red light afforded me by the trailer, I was easily able to make out boot prints alongside the trailer, obviously coming from the cab. They turned and led along the back of the trailer, then into the ditch, past the bubble of red light. Then there were the same boot prints coming up from the ditch, accompanied by hoof prints. Presumably, this guy's horse had gotten out of his barn or a pasture nearby, and he was out here to retrieve it. That was my Columbo moment. Then there was the whole area in between the horse and the side of the trailer closest to me. I could see the boot prints, but they weren't in a straight line. They seemed to be all over the place, pointing everywhere, like a person jumping around or hopping from one foot to the next, and mixed in with them were other prints. The new prints looked a bit like the inside of a peace sign, a Y with an extra line between the forked lines, about twice their length. There was no real sole or pad, but each toe, if you could call it that, was thick, at least a couple inches wide, and at the end of each toe print, including the long rear protrusion, the handle of the fork I suppose, the snow seemed to have another flaw in it. Not an imprint really, more like a slit, like from a claw. These prints were as mixed up as the boot prints were, but tended to stay closer to the road. Whatever made them, the guy wearing the boots would have to get past it to get back to the cab. Out from that mess of prints, both human and, I guess, animal will do, erupted a straight line of boot prints, with long strides heading back along the road, away from the truck and trailer, past the edge of the red light. They continued into the darkness that I knew would be uninterrupted until the first street light a mile away. The other prints were mixed in with these ones, weaving in and out of the same line, in other words, following. Their strides were at least as long as the bootman's. I stole one more look at that horse, still clearly agitated, and at the prints right behind the trailer. Now, obviously, snow being white, and the trailer's pulsing lights being red. All the snow in the range of the lights was going to be red. But I know it wasn't my imagination that some patches here and there were a different shade of red than the rest. And with the dim light and the horse's dark fur, it was hard to be sure. But I thought a few long lines were glistening down the animal's side. I like to think I'm not a stupid man. I saw no benefit in staying here to play detective. I decided to distance myself from the horse, trailer, truck, and prints. I flipped my lights on and started rolling away. The horse never stopped staring at me. I swear. It had the closest thing I've ever seen on an animal to the expression of a homeless man who hasn't gotten a penny all day. But as I pulled forward, I just was not able to take my eyes off the footprints and whatever prints on the side of the road. About ten feet past where the red light would have ended, there was another scuffle. Both sets of prints mashed together. Definitely a couple spots of dark pink snow. And then just the boot prints, continuing their journey. But off to one side, they had left behind a much larger imprint, roughly human-sized. There were shapes on both sides of the body. They were wide and somewhat wrinkled, like the imprint of a jacket a child would leave after laying in the snow. They fanned out from the main body, leaving drag marks, like something unfurling. They were also ribbed. I admit, I was only viewing this in passing, but I swear, I know what I saw. It's Hard to describe exactly, but thinking back, I'd say that comparing that shape to a snow angel would seem wrong in more ways than one. I kept moving, picking up just a bit of speed, but I was still going fairly slowly, so that my tires wouldn't burn out on the snow and ice. I could see the free-toed prints moving from the larger shape back to the chase, just for a few feet, and then 
they just ended. The bootprints carried on for another 40 feet or so, then they ended too. At this point, I had to stop. I don't mean that I really decided that I wanted to. It's like my brain just needed to verify that I was seeing this right. Two sets of prints, one human, one not. Both just ending. No sign of a change of course, or a dive to the ground, or anything. Pure, untouched snow on all sides. Well, not totally undisturbed. I think something in my brain was just misfiring at that point, trying to make it all fit. And so I looked back, once at the trailer and truck, highlighted in a blinking red aura. I could see the horse, still watching me. And then, in the road ahead of the truck, something shifted. It was the truck's headlights. They bounced. The truck's taillights also bounced. Just a slight dip toward the ground. Then back up. Like a brief pressure on the suspension, the trailer shifted just a touch. Now the horse wasn't looking at me. It was looking at the black space above the truck and trailer. The spot on the roof of the trailer that no light could reach. And it was straining against its rope harder than I've ever seen anything fight in my life. My tires burned out briefly before they found traction. So, that was my eight moment. I really lost count of how many times on the way home I nearly slid into a ditch. I went sideways once, but I always kept control. Using some combination of luck and sheer force of will to not get stranded on the road tonight. Now I'm in my driveway, and I'm wishing my garage door was working. Because right now, I'm having my ten moment. The porch light is illuminating a portion of the roof on one wing of my house. All around me, the freshly fallen snow is undisturbed. But in that one little corner of the roof, I can just make out a pair of imprints marring the scene. I probably don't have to describe them to you. My front door is maybe 30 feet away. 30 feet. I'm wondering if I should try sleeping in the car tonight. Pick very vaguely related. So, this happened years ago. I'm 29 now, and this was probably 13 years ago, almost to the day. We were hunting on a track of land that spanned something like 15,000 plus acres. I think George, the man whose family owned it since at least the Civil War era, has since sold off some sections of it though. This land was truly huge, and I spent so much time riding four-wheelers all over parts of it and always found new places to get lost in. I even found some type of psilocybin mushrooms growing in some cow shit a few times. Didn't take them no long. There were even a couple of old graveyards off the dirt road a mile or so north from the locale this happened in. I believe that one was actually for slaves, and the other was an old family gravesite. It was September to October, or hell, it could have even been November. I don't remember the exact date, and I'm not even going to try to make one up. I remember getting into the woods before dawn, my dad helping me hoist my bag and SKS up into the tree with a rope and pulley that we had set up next to the platform about 15 feet off the ground. He then bid me farewell for the morning and set out across the road to where he'd set up a ground blind. I'd say I was about 150 yards off the road and he was about 500 yards from me, being at least 300 yards off the same road, opposite of my position. Once the crunching of leaves faded out, I sat back and watched the stars slowly fade and listened to the forest come alive, at least that's how it usually goes. I don't remember much besides getting there, seeing this and my dad coming to get me. Now anyways, here's where shit gets… strange. The timing of this I'm still not sure of, but it was some time after sunrise. 
The sun was just popping above the trees to my right. I became acutely aware of this huge thing drifting towards the road, just about at tree level. It looked like it was made of mylar, brightly shimmering with incredibly long, shimmering tendrils, legs, streamers. I have no clue. But it looked like a huge fucking jellyfish. I don't even recall feeling fearful or even what I felt watching this thing drift along. It was probably 30 feet above the cutover and at least 100 feet long. The next thing I remember is my dad crunching through the leaves to come help me down and that thing was gone. This is a setup for some sort of weather balloon pun, isn't it? I wish, lol. It's just the best description I can recall for this thing. I'm hesitant to be more descriptive because I don't want to make up details that aren't true. It almost looked like the shimmering, which I didn't mention before, was in a rainbow type color. Think like the way colors look on an abalone shell, but in this case, not so blue. I have a feeling that given the sun's position, it shouldn't have been shimmering like this from where I was, unless this light was coming from the object itself and not just reflecting the morning sun. Space jellyfish, literally. Google Evora Portugal, 1959, angel hair. Then Google angel hair phenomenon. The Evora Portugal professor was able to capture a sample and took a picture with a microscope. Captures a single felled organism that looked remarkably similar to a starfish. Not OP, but that's some very interesting stuff. Apparently on a Vora case, there were many reports of two UFOs in the sky right before the angel hairs starting to fall. If that were the case, then why the hell would ETs be dropping these things from ships? I think they are space jellyfish that are end of life cycle or some of a reason they fall into the lower atmosphere and some eventually make it down to surface before igniting in the oxygen-rich environment. So this is one I've shared here before. I have a friend whose dad came over from Mexico as a young lad. Naturally, he had a guide that helped him and a group of other guys navigate the Mexican wilderness in their journey towards the border. They call these guides coyotes, and one of their most important skills is knowing where all of the cartel routes and territories lie. They help you steer clear of all these areas so you don't get killed in the middle of the night. Friend's dad is about 16 years old. He and a group of guys are being led to the US-Mexico border by the coyote, an older man. He's a bit curt, but seems to be quite knowledgeable with the area, which puts my friend's dad at ease. The trek takes many days. At one point, they're forced to take an alternate route because the coyote feels uneasy about something. This adds an extra couple of days to the trip. The coyote hurries them along to make up for lost time. They walk from sunrise to sunset, and sometimes even after dark. One night, the coyote tells them, we'll have to stay here tonight. He says it should be safe, but at this point, they've gone very much out of the way and they're all a little on edge. But they're also exhausted, and even lying on the hard ground, they all begin to drift off to sleep. Everyone except my friend's dad, who keeps hearing something skittering around in the darkness. Sounds too fast to be a person. He sits up to scan the area. Now, keep in mind, this is the Mexican desert. No electricity, just the cold moonlight falling in patches through tall cacti and small rock formations. It's hard to see much of anything. But then, a shape dashes from behind one cacti to another, and for a moment, my friend's dad sees it in the moonlight. It looked like a spider, but it was much too big. So he strains his eyes, and soon he can make out shapes skittering around in the darkness. Just then, my friend's dad hears the quick padding of another thing's footsteps. A shape rushes out of the darkness 
into the moonlight, and this time it's in view for a solid two seconds. It's a huge spider, with the body about the size of a watermelon. The legs were long and made it look huge. My friend's dad woke someone else up and told them about the spiders. They sleepily told him to fuck off and went back to sleep. Then the coyote told him, Don't worry, they won't hurt you, just go to sleep. He seemed pretty confident, so my friend's dad laid back down and before he shut his eyes, he watched a couple of them rush out into the moonlight, moving ungodly fast. Then he shut his eyes, and soon, he was asleep. He told me that he kept waking up, hearing them padding around really close as they slept. They were so large that one of them could have walked over his entire body as he slept and wouldn't have touched him. I lived on the Pakistan-Indian border for a couple years as a missionary. There was a humongous web strung up between two trees that had a dead child all wrapped up. The kid had been climbing trees and became entangled. When the locals cut him down, they said his insides were like soup, like he was just a huge flesh bag full of liquid. I did see them cut him out of the webs, and when they picked him up, his eyes were like backwards, if that makes sense. Like, not that the back of his eyes were in the front, but that his eyes were drooping inward, as opposed to being flush with the face. When they sat him upright, I guess it broke the surface tension, and they just sort of melted out of his eye sockets. If you've ever seen a big glob of fat in a roast pen or something, it kind of looked like that. Like greasy, chunky jelly. It was honestly horrible. The locals did not bother calling the police, because the police there were honestly completely unhelpful. You had to bribe them to get them to do anything, and even then, they only halfway try. So, they know about it. They just kind of shrug and say, a big spider got him, and leave it at that. Nobody thinks it's strange or anything. Apparently, it's really reclusive, and they usually do not see it. When I asked how big it actually is, the guy I was talking to just spread his arms as far as they go, so I'm going to say like four feet in diameter, maybe three, I don't know. Just hold your arms out lengthwise, then vertical, and you'll have as much info as I have. Probably not really what the Fred is aimed at, but I always thought it was just interesting that there are just big ass tree dwelling spiders in India slash Pakistan, and nobody talks about it. Be me. 12.30 a.m. November 12th, 2020. Sophomore in college, bringing my GF to my place to meet the family. Home is in the middle of Tennessee. Semi-rural. There is a large forest behind my parents' house that is hundreds of acres. We are awake at night, so we can get the PS5 which was releasing at 4am at the local GameStop. Full moon. Super clear and bright night. Let's go look at the stars up at the cat wires. There are TVA cat wires running an electrical grid through the forest. Huge clearing at the top of a hill in the forest next to the cat wires. We see my neighbor's giant white cat playing around the entrance to the path. Pet cot. We go to the top of the hill in the forest. Was lit. Got my dick sucked too at the catwire. Nothing suspicious yet. Appreciating the stars. Around 1am, we start to walk back to my truck, which is parked at the edge of the forest. Begin to hear a strange howl or who about a mile away and in two separate places. Could be a coyote, owl, or other wild animal, so we thought nothing of it. Keep walking. We are only about 500 to 1,000 feet away from my truck now. Howell proceeds to approach us and turns into something that sounds like an Aztec death whistle with loud clicks in one second intervals. Sound is very close now, coming from the treetops. At this point, my GF and I didn't even say anything, but we were now running for our lives. The sound is now coming from about four different directions, all in the forest 
and couldn't be more than 500 feet away from us, and closing in fast. We break through the forest shrubbery, ditching the regular path to my truck. I quickly jump into the bed while GF is already starting the truck. Peel out. I stare into the wilderness, and at this point, I can only hear my heartbeat and the engine. Later, at GameStop parking lot, my GF tells me she saw what was chasing us in the forest. Said it looked like a human-sized grey raccoon running swiftly on its hind legs. Never seen my GF more afraid in my life. Never spoken of again. I have something. Be me. Last summer. Be wanting to complete Stalker Challenge. Abandoned cement barge beached on a sandbar on woody coastline. Seems like the perfect place to camp. Brought a WASR. Two magazines. All the magazines I had at the time. I was poor. Went to check out this barge. It was pretty sick. There were barnacles growing on some of it. So I assumed that, at high tide, it was partially submerged. It had a cargo hold and an upper deck. There were two portholes in the upper deck, with rusty ladders that descended down into the cargo hold. Decided to camp on the beach where the sandbar connects with dry land, because I didn't want to drown in my sleeping bag if high tide. Completely covered the vessel somehow. Explored the barge just a little more first. Noticed some rusted out metal stuff in a little square pool on the upper deck. Reached down into the water. Pulled out a rifle casing. Recognized it as a nugget food casing. Wait till Kay hears about this. Finally, get finished closely examining all the cool old rusted bits of the barge. Valves, moorings, etc. Head over to the beach to make camp. Paste it off. It's 60 or so yards from the barge. Not quite stalker challenge legal, but safety first, right? What's 10 yards? Make a little fire pit with rocks for shiggles. Put driftwood in it. Whipped out the zippo. Lit her up. Looked at my watch. It was about four. Pick related kind of shows the shoreline I was camped on. Pick related also shows the part of the upper deck where the barge was split in two. Anyhow, sitting on the beach in front of weak ass fire. WASR laying by my side. Pull out a green plastic dollar store harmonica. No idea how to play it. Just make noises with it. Start doing the Jaws theme with it for giggles. Laugh at my own cleverness. Try to do something like the national anthem. Hear laughter coming from the trees. Stop playing. Look over. Hello? Laughter continues. Same tone as before. It kind of sounds like me, come to think of it. Begin to smell something kind of metallic. Smell is kind of salty, too. I was camped by the sound, mind you, so it was already a little salty. But this smell was saltier than normal. It's still only five, not quite sundown. I'm scanning the tree line, but I don't see nothing. Reach for my harmonica to resume playing. Realize the salty metallic smell kind of resembles blood. In fact, it strongly resembles the smell of blood. Same laugh comes from the woods. Begin to put two and two together. Chamber around in the WASR. Hello? Sit there, staring at the woods for a long ass time. Nothing. Cook my beans on the fire, glancing over at the woods periodically. Just as the sun is going down, here, hello, come at me from the woods. That sounds a lot like me. Noped the fuck out of there. Packed my shit up in a flash, ran to the barge. Pick related was taken two weeks prior, while hiking with a buddy. We spent all of five minutes there and continued on our way. Anyways, darted to the barge, leapt inside, frantically climbed up onto the upper deck, jumped across the crack onto the bow, went prone, aimed my WASR back out across the sandbar, eyes golf ball wide, 
sit like that for a while. Check watch, periodically. Just as the sun is finishing setting, realize I'm going to want some fire. Go down onto the sandbar, rifle slung and at the ready. Gather up a little driftwood. Light a rather weak fire on the deck. Make one last trip just at the beginning of dusk. Find some good wood. Fire achieves respectable size. Spend the first few hours of the night rifle shouldered, prone, aiming down the sandbar. Remember that several of my relatives suffer from various mental illnesses. You probably just hallucinated that shit anon. You need to go get checked out, I tell myself. Then I hear the heavy breaking of brush from the coastline, and something muffled blows to me on the breeze. Laughter, and a pretty unpleasant smell. Oh shit. Hold my rifle tight. Point it threateningly at the coast. It's pretty well dark by now. Remember I brought a flashlight. Go over to my pack, laying on the deck by the stem. Get it out. Come back. Shine it down along the sandbar. See something glint as I sweep. Swing beam back onto the gleaming thing. Two little dots. Eyes. Fucking eyes. Something big and dark is attached to them. It's pretty damn tall. It's just standing there. Halfway down the sandbar. Can't see it well. Low battery and it was kind of far away. Try to tell myself it's just an animal. That's one big ass animal. Is it a bear? Human eyes don't glow in the dark, so it can't be a person. Can't hurt to shoot it, right? Chamber around. A live round is ejected and skitters across the deck. I already chambered one on the beach. I'm a dumbass. Go prone. Take aim. Touch one off. If I only had a flash hider instead of a slanted break. Blinded for what felt like an eternity. Blinking frantically in hopes of restoring my sight the whole time. Get to the point where I can see again. Frantically shine my mag light all up and down the sandbar. No eyes. Maybe I scared it off. Hear the crunching of gravelly sand below me. Somebody says hello once again. And it sounds a hell of a lot like me. In full panic mode. Stand on the railing. Point WSR over the side. Mag dump. Hear and see nothing for a good while. Settle in. Got my legs in a sleeping bag. Head and arms out with the WASR aimed at the portholes that lead from the hold up onto the deck. A couple of hours pass. My eyelids get heavy. Hear that laugh again. This time it's below me. Nearly wet myself in sheer terror. Begin focusing intently. Hear small waves lapping up against the side of the barge. The tide has risen. After ten minutes or so, begin to hear sloshing in the hold below. Something's walking around down there, and it's beginning to fill with water. There is only one direction this can go now. Up. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Hello? Scream, shut the fuck up. Shove my WASR down the porthole. Blind fire like a madman. There goes all of my ammo. Heart is hammering. Slowly back away from the porthole. Heard something clanging against metal. It's climbing the ladder. Unsheath my bayonet. I don't know how that thing fit for the porthole, but it did. Fight or flight engages. There was nowhere to run to. Charge. Screaming. It happened in a flash. The bayonet plunged into the thing. A heavy paw or something bitch slapped me across the chest and I went tumbling off the barge into the drink. I now have no weapon and I'm in the water. Play dead. Lay on my back. Hope it doesn't see me. Heart is pounding uncontrollably still. Not worried about hypothermia because it's June. Slowly drift away with the current. See a hulking silhouette next to the fire as I drift off. Current dumps me on a beach a few miles east. Hike home. Never go near that place again. One summer, when I was ten, me and my stepdad 
were going on a cross-country drive to Bond. My mom was in prison. We were driving somewhat close to the Humboldt Toyabe Forest, and a man came walking out of the woods who looked like a human pig. I'm not talking as if he was fat or had kind of an upturned nose. He flat out looked like a pig that grew to six feet somehow and learned to walk upright. He was also wearing gloves and had claw-like hands, but no hooves. He just walked right in front of us, nonchalantly. We drove up to a rest stop after that and stayed there for hours, barely saying anything. We couldn't believe what we saw, and my stepdad was scared to drive because he thought he'd gone crazy. I know this whole thing sounds stupid. People always brought up that Pigman episode of Seinfeld, but it really happened. And while it's certainly possible the creature we saw was just some guy wearing a costume, it wasn't a slip on mask or something. It was full on Hollywood tear prosthetics that moved with the guy's face and his hands were made up too. Maybe he was shooting a commercial or a movie or something, but if so, I've never been able to find it, and it seems pretty unlikely that people would go out of their way to shoot a movie slash commercial all the way out in the woods and risk letting their star go walking out on the middle of the highway, especially if they had such a good makeup budget. The closest thing I've been able to find were these energy hog commercials, see picture, but those didn't come out until 2005, and this was 1997. Plus, the costumes in those weren't nearly as good. I'm sure there's a logical explanation, but it was still the eeriest experience of my life. Scary story slash urban legend Fred, here's one that happened to me a few months back. I want to stress that you can literally google this incident if you want proof, although the articles I've been reading here have been highly sanitized, which is part of the reason I'm posting this. Be me, South African, going on a trip to Botswana. My sister is marrying a guy who's a game ranger, and I'm going on this trip to spend time with the dude and get to know him. I'm supposed to be the best man at the wedding, even though we barely know each other. I arrive after a really long drive. Spend first day drinking and driving dirt bikes around, generally having a great time. Next day, sister's fiance suggests that we go driving around the outskirts of the Okavango Delta in an attempt to see some wildlife. I agree. We go driving around and manage to spot some giraffes, a leopard, hippos, and some different birds. Really fun, but insanely fucking hot. No elephant spotted. This comes up later. Eventually, we head back to the place we're staying at each night. We start to cook and drink. Sister's fiancé, I'll just call him John, gets a call as the sun's going down. I notice how weirded out he is by what he's being told on the phone. He hangs up, but definitely seems a little freaked out as we eat dinner. I ask what's up, but John just dismisses it, says it's nothing serious. After dinner, we start drinking more and more. John starts ranting about his boss. That's who was on the phone. Says that they found some dead elephants, and he wants John to go and check it out. John tells him it's too dark to see anything, but he'll go tomorrow. John apologizes to me, tells me that he's going to be busy working tomorrow. I said it's not a problem. John, kind of drunk, feels really bad, says we're supposed to be bonding, but now he's leaving me in a shitty little chalet with no company. Night goes on. After a few more beers, John tells me that I should come with him tomorrow. I'm reluctant. I don't love the idea of inspecting dead elephants. John insists, says that we'll go by helicopter, says it'll be much better than driving in the heat. I agree to go along. Next day, we eat breakfast and head to a small airstrip. Helicopter looks rickety as fuck, but I feel like complaining would be rude. There are lots of pre-flight procedures, 
and we end up taking off just after midday. We fly around for about an hour. We're able to search a huge amount of area really quickly. There's me, John, another ranger, a dude who I think was a ranger in training, and the pilot. John and the other rangers have trank rifles ready, just in case they need to inspect a live elephant up close. We finally spot something, about three elephants lying in the sun. We land a few meters away and hop out. The stench is horrible. Flies are everywhere. The corpses are half rotten and half eaten. I think it's weird that three elephants are dead together, but nothing too shocking beyond that. John and the others are discussing something. Conversation seemed pretty intense. I try to join the conversation so I don't seem like the silent artist of the group lurking in the background. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing some poachers shot them, huh? Everyone looks at me and they, they all seem annoyed. I think they were pissed that John invited a normie who didn't know shit along with them. Eventually, John says, doesn't seem like poachers. The elephants still have their tusks. I hadn't thought of that and now I felt like a dumbass. They keep inspecting the bodies and both rangers seem really interested in one of the smaller ones. It was lying on its side, but its face was pointed at an odd angle towards the ground, like it had been trying to stick its head in the ground. Finally, the other ranger suggests that we keep looking to see if there are any others. We get back up into the air and fly around for about another hour. Ranger seems really troubled, but we see absolutely nothing. We land, and they have another conversation about what to do next, while I just sit awkwardly in the helicopter with my feet hanging out. We have some lunch, and John informs me that we're going to do one more search before heading back, as we only have enough fuel for about another hour. We were flying back and forth, so we were only about 45 minutes from the airstrip. Before we finish eating, I overhear the ranger tell John that the smaller elephant really seemed like it had a broken neck. I blurt out, how the fuck does that happen? Ranger just glares at me and keeps eating. We finish eating and take off again, and continue searching. After about 30 minutes, the pilot tells us that we're heading back, and turns towards home. But after just 5 minutes, the ranger in training starts pointing and shouting. Lying on the ground, near a clearing of trees, are about a dozen dead elephants. The sun's going down and the shadows from the corpses are really easy to see stretching along the ground. We land nearby and make our way over. Smell is even worse than last time, and the bodies are ruined. I'm not much of a nature lover, so I don't know exactly what animals can do to other animals. Even so, I could tell some bodies had been picked at by scavengers. Their stomachs were torn open and intestines spewed out everywhere. Again, all of the tusks were present. I asked John if maybe someone had just shot at them just for the fuck of it. He says probably not. To kill this many, you need a helicopter to fire from above. And when that happens, like when they're tranked, they form a circle around the younger ones. But these bodies were all spread out, over a distance of about a kilometer or two, like they had been running away in a full-on panic. He then pointed out the state of some of the other bodies. A couple feet and legs were missing, which may be possible after being chewed on for a few days, but I can't imagine why some lions and hyenas will go for the legs and feet first while leaving the stomach untouched. After some inspecting, we all ended up standing around the body of a smaller elephant, maybe a teenager, who was missing its head. I don't mean its skin and flesh had been picked off by birds and wild dogs, I mean its head, neck, and right shoulder were gone, like they'd been pulled off. Also, while this body was smaller, it was still probably a couple of tons and twice the height of a human. I actually wondered if someone had magically fed this thing a stick of dynamite or something. At this point, John and the other ranger are swearing and ranting about how fucked all of this is, but I think the rest of us all knew that they were using anger to cover up their growing confusion and worry. After I let them vent a little, I ask what we do now. 
the other ranger snaps at me and says that we're going to go home and try to figure out how to explain this to the Department of Environmental Affairs. We all start to head back to the helicopter. When the ranger in training says, What about the hole? We all turn and look at him and John says, What hole? The ranger in training starts leading us towards a small hill, while saying, I thought you all saw it when we flew overhead. Sure enough, there in the side of this hill is a hole dug at maybe 15 or 20 degree angle downwards. This thing is fucking massive. It looks like a mole's hill, except that it's as big as a subway tunnel. I asked John what I'm looking at, still thinking that this is some natural phenomena that I've never heard about, but he just mumbles that he has no idea. Finally, the pilot asks if we're going in. What the fuck pepe.jpg? What did this man just say? I just look at him like he's a fucking crazy person. Why the fuck would we go in there? Luckily, the other ranger says, Nah, it's almost dark. Let's just take some pictures and get back. We'll report this and let someone else figure it out. I'm beginning to like this dude. We start walking back. The pilot and I take our time, checking the body some more, because the other three are taking pictures, and there's no hurry. Although I did feel really creeped out, I didn't say anything. Eventually, we all end up in the helicopter, except for the ranger who has climbed up a body and is taking his last pictures. For some reason, I only noticed then how silent it was. No animals except flies, which I thought was weird, considering how much raw meat was present. As the ranger jumps off the body and starts hitting back, we all hear a massive grating noise. Sounded like something huge was shifting against the sand. I immediately assumed that one of the elephants was still alive and was trying to stand up. We all pile out of the helicopter and make our way toward the noise. I can't see anything because the light's fading fast and the horizon is dotted with giant elephant carcasses. I notice John and the others are making their way up some bodies and I jump onto a nearby, fairly intact corpse to get a vantage point. As I crest the elephant, never thought I'd ever type that sentence, I stare out at the black silhouettes lying on the ground against the afternoon sky. For a while I see nothing but suddenly my eyes pick up movement. At first I think it's something coming out of the hole, like it's a fucking worm from Dune or something, and I tactically shit my pants. Then I notice that it seems to be an elephant, trying to drag itself into the hole. John and the other ranger are already down the carcasses and heading for the hole, and the rest of us are following. I'm not sure why. Maybe we just wanted to see a living elephant after all of these dead ones. I won't pretend it was rational, and I can't speak for the others, but I just felt like if we saw this thing up close, we might be able to get some understanding of what happened here. We all come around the side of a truly massive dead elephant and stare towards the entrance to the hole. At this point, the light was dying fast and a lot of the detail was lost in the shadow of the tunnel. But I swear to God, I saw enough to know I wasn't imagining anything. Standing at the entrance to the hole is a person crouched over like a gorilla. The hair was long and matted and they were completely naked, but the real problem was their size. This person was crouched over the elephant. Their body was actually slightly cramped in this subway sized hole. The elephant's body looked like a big great dog next to this literal giant. Its proportions were completely fucked. Its top half was stretched out and spidery, with arms as long as a truck, folded so that it could fit inside the tunnel, ending in these wiry fingers with needle-like claws. Meanwhile, its bottom half was stubby and emaciated. This thing's legs were human enough in appearance, though each was the size of a fully grown man, but they were so withered compared to the rest of it that they almost seemed vestigial. We came to see it just as it was getting back into the tunnel. What had seemed like an elephant crawling into the hole had actually been an elephant body, 
being dragged by the leg into the earth. We all stood in abject horror as this thing pulled at the elephant's corpse like a sack of potatoes. We hadn't made a sound, but at some point, it turned its head around, not like it heard something, but rather like it was a wild animal checking its surroundings from time to time. Its eyes immediately snapped towards us. This thing's face was so fucked up. The eyes were white and milky, but I could still tell that it saw us. The nose was upturned like a bat, and its mouth hung slightly open as it breathed, revealing massive, slab-like teeth, like something you'd see in a hippo's mouth. They were all crooked, and some protruded out at odd angles, but they all looked as hard as steel, and I could immediately imagine them tearing through the legs and heads of the bodies that we'd seen so far. The strangest part was the shape of its head. It seemed disfigured and bulbous, like a fetus's skull. It also bent in on one side more than the other. The best way I can describe it is like the lady from the painting in It, except wider and obviously far larger. The skin was veiny and although its shoulders and back were covered in dirt, it was as white as a sheet, almost to the point of being translucent. The skin around its eyes had enough wrinkles to almost act like eyebrows which gave it a very surprised, slightly confused look. After a split second of confusion, this thing's face contorts into a look of absolute rage. It lets out this awful fucking roar. Sounds almost like the scream a deaf person might make. Sort of low and monotone, but it's loud enough that my hands instinctively slam into my ears to try and block out the sound. We all start sprinting towards the helicopter, John shouting something, but my ears are ringing, and it's too muffled to make out. We all climb into the helicopter in complete terror. I strap myself in and look back towards the hole. This giant fucking monster is clawing its way towards us. It's clearly moving as fast as it can, but it's still pretty slow. Its back legs are dragging along limply and it's only moving by clawing at the ground and elephant corpses. It moves like someone who's paralyzed from the waist down. We all just sit there, petrified, and stare at it while the pilot starts the helicopter. I remember watching it grab at one of the larger elephants to try and use it as an anchor to pull itself along. The elephant corpse literally slid towards it. Like, a fucking elephant corpse wasn't heavy enough for it to use as a weight. The helicopter starts to lift off, and this thing reaches out for us. It's still a long way off, but it came a hell of a lot closer than I would have thought possible. Its whole body is probably longer than two school buses placed end to end. Ranger fires his trank gun at it, but I honestly didn't even see if it hit or not. Although I'd be amazed if he missed that thing. We don't stay around. Pilot turns helicopter towards home, and we shoot back faster than I thought possible. I think I heard another dull roar as we flew away, but my ears were still ringing too much to be certain. The rest of the night was a blur. I don't remember much of the conversations after we landed, but I wasn't content with being back at the chalet. I just felt like that thing was still crawling towards us in the night, and would eventually smash through the little wooden chalet I was in. I told John I was leaving right away and drove for about six hours before pulling into a petrol station and falling asleep in my car. When I woke up the next morning, I just kept driving until I got home. I got in the shower and just stood there, under the water, for about an hour. Eventually I called John and we spoke for a while about everything that happened. Apparently, they had gotten a massive group together to go search the area, but when they arrived, they only found eight bodies and the hole had partially collapsed. Over the next few weeks, John told me about the attempts to track down whatever that thing was, but eventually they gave up, and some of the other rangers started to think that maybe we all just had a few too many beers, and came up with all of the shit. Apparently he had quite a few arguments over what happened that night. Elephant corpses keep showing up near those holes, but nobody's willing to go walking into them to see what's inside. After another week or two, John quit that job, and now he's working as a delivery man. You're probably wondering why you haven't heard about this. Well, you can find some stories about it, 
but most of them attribute the deaths to some kind of pandemic that spread through the population. You'll also notice that they omit most of the pictures. They'll only show you the pictures of the more intact elephants, so that you don't wonder how such massive creatures can get pulled limb from limb, and they'll never show you the holes dug in and out of the ground. Here's an article though, in case you're interested. Help me fuck. I've got one from last year. B-23. Stalking in a woods. Arkansas Ozarks, with some new gear I'd been saving for months. Boots, tactical vest, even a Milserp gas mask. It was like Christmas. Being where I was, and wanting to field test some personal prototypes, I had my nugget on hand. Wouldn't do much against the big bears, but I'd ruin any snake, stray dog, or cougar's day right to hell. Had a couple strippers and two clippazines I built and wanted to field test in my pouches, some rolled up targets stuck in my loops, and a light complement of survival gear, compass, topo map, thermal blanket, spare undies, extra bullet, MREs, canteen, amphetamines, bug spray, rope, spikes, mallet, e-tool, shower powder, baby powder, TP, the works. Basically practicing for the inevitable invasion of whoever decides to take over. I was having a fucking great time romping around the woods, playing with my FOV in the mask, testing the reliability of the clippazines, generally having fun. I wandered next to a creek bed and decided it was time to practice my guerrilla tactics. It was late summer slash early fall, so no danger of getting my gear wet in the non-existent stream. Shit was in more danger of water damage from my sweat. After triple checking my safety, I proceeded to do a series of scree slides and uphill hustles in full survivalist gear. Needless to say, I got winded right quick. I stood panting in that dry stream bed and decided to check my position with the topo map and compass so I could set a course for home. In the middle of orienteering myself, I caught wind of a smell. In before blood and copper, it wasn't. At first I assumed it was a sweaty fomunda, but the funk quickly evolved into something fucking worse. A dark undercurrent of rot, deep notes of animal musk, a bassy score of raw garbage punctuated by garlic timpani, and a thick black score of something between skunk and rotting onion sludge. A symphony of stench, and the conductor decided to skip the adagio and drive the opening movement straight into the skirt so, because that shit was getting stronger. I went into straight operating mode, popped an addy from my pouch for extra focus, pulled the clippazine from my nugget. It seemed to be working fine, but if I was gonna have to shoot something, I prefer not to have any risk of jamming. I gagged and nearly puked up that addy tab. That smell was that strong at this point. Whatever the source was, it was definitely mobile and getting closer. Fuck it. I pulled my mask up from around my neck and pulled it over my face. It helped slightly, but my fucking dumbass waterline wasn't 100% airtight around the joint. I walked cautiously and slowly along the creek bed to where the slope was shallowest, listening for a twig snap or animal sounds from above. I definitely heard something shuffling around up there, and it sounded bigger than what my nugget was for. It was a near constant snuffle grunt and sloppy, uncoordinated crunching around bark and leaves. That mixed with the smell and my mind immediately jumped to Big Bear. Rabid Big Bear. Let me tell you about Ozark Big Bears, straight from my dad's mouth. My dad's lived in the Ozarks for 58 years, and in that time, only two things have managed to shake him. The challenges of fatherhood, and the Big Bears. According to him, the native black bears were hunted to near extinction between the 40s and 50s. To correct this, the ANRC, NRCS, and Arkansas Fish and Game Commission released 250 bears into the Ozark Mountains. Their website insists that they were all black bears. My dad 
insists that this is bullshit. According to him, more than a few of the bears released into the Ozarks had been brown bears and that they had been interbred with the few remaining locals and the reintroduced black bears. Thanks to a little phenomenon known as hybrid vigor, the resulting offspring were bigger and meaner than their parents and, fuck me, were also fertile. When I asked him to prove it, he simply left the summer porch, went upstairs, and came back with a manila folder labeled BB. He pulled out a couple of Polaroids and asked me to take a look. I saw a big, black and brown something rooting around behind a clothesline. Dad directed my attention to the clothesline about 50 feet away from us, strung between two poles about 5 foot 6 off the ground, the same clothesline in the picture. That something shoulder was about a fart's length under the line, despite being in the goddamn background. I looked through the other pictures, one of them rooting in the trash, another barely concealed by trees, all of them slightly shaky. Detail was hard to come by, but I was convinced. My dad told me two things about how to avoid getting my shit shredded by the big bears. One, big bears are stupid as shit, something to do with them being hybrids. This makes them more dangerous to the other bears, because they're not afraid of you. This also makes them smell like shit, and you'll smell them coming from a mile off. If you smell a big bear, get inside and get upstairs but take the shotgun first and some deer slugs. And two, if you do see a big bear and you ain't at home or you don't have a shotgun loaded with slugs, hide up a tree if you can. They're faster than you and there's no use running. I tell you all of this because after 23 years, I'd finally managed to prove my dad wrong about something. Well, half wrong. There's something in the Ozarks that match my dad's pictures of big bears, but whatever they are, they sure as fuck aren't bears. Back to the woods. I would have stayed in that creek bed and waited for the something to fuck off on its business, but the light was already slanting through the trees, and as bad as my dad made big bears sound, I sure as tits didn't want to be stuck with a goddamned rabbit one after dark. I instead opted to climb up the opposite edge of the creek bed, had to scramble over some big rock outcroppings, and half stand, half lean against the slope of a hill. But I figured that if anything, that would be one more layer of protection against the something. I had gotten a few glimpses of the something over my shoulder as I climbed, but this was my first good look at it. I just fucking stared. Like I said in my previous post, this wasn't a fucking bear. It was bear-like, but not a bear. I'd been into sci-fi my entire life, and even got Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials from my awesome late stepmom. So when I saw the something for the first time, my fucking nerd brain immediately went, Oh, a Sulador. Except it wasn't. It looked like one of those, a grizzly bear, and a sloth had a freeway on top of a garbage heap to make it. It had a long, prognathous snout, like a stubby-ass trunk, big, angular shoulders, feet that looked like manhole covers, covered in dirty, matted fur, and a body like a furry blimp. Its fur was the same charcoal black slash day glow brown I saw in the pictures, and full of mats and clumps of dirt. I mean, I fucking stared at it, drinking in the details, trying to make fucking sense of what I was looking at for a solid two and a half minutes, and it somehow hadn't noticed me. Jesus, these things were dumb. I remember feeling a twinge of relief. If it hadn't noticed me trying to scrabble out of a rocky gully, it wouldn't notice me sneaking away. That was when I farted. The something stopped. My breath stopped. My heart stopped. The only sound in those woods was my fucking fart echoing and the sound of my nose blistering under the something's odiferous assault. Like a slow-mo, the thing turned its head, 
looked back at me, sniffed the air, and then stood up. It had been shuffling around, crouched low to the ground the entire time. What I thought were shoulder blades were its fucking elbows. It could tie its shoes without bending down, but its paws probably would have crushed its Air Jordans to bits. They were like trash can lids. It sniffed the air again and coughed or barked like it was asking me a god damn question. Gorp, I swear on me mum, that's what it fucking sounded like. Gorp, be me. Be dumb fuck who doesn't listen to his dad. Be awkward cringe lord who fucking farts when he's trying to sneaky breaky away from a goddamn gorp. Aim for center mass. Fire. The bullet didn't fwalk into the gorp because hey, if you're gonna die, might as well give your killer a stupid name in your head right. As much as it flumped, there was a puff of dirt and hair when it flumped, and bless my luck, the gorp flinched from the impact. Wait for blood. I guess that gorps are so covered in nasty, flea-ridden hair mats that over time, their poor hygiene gives them natural body armor, because that thing didn't fucking bleed. What it did do was rear up and gorf at me, a low growl that my colon decided was a warning because it was producing bricks enough to construct a barricade. I worked the bolt and fired another shot, this time at its ugly sloth bear elephant face. This time it flocked, so did the dirt a dozen feet to the fucker's left because it ricocheted off of its fucking skull. The gorp just stood there, staring at me. Like it was too dumb to realize, it could have stood in the stream bed and grabbed me by the face while I pelted it with useless bullets and shit myself. I yelled at it and fired a third shot in any direction at all, trying to scare it off. The gorp or gorf or big bear or whatever the fuck it was dropped to all fours, lurched towards me once, then did a 360 and shuffled away. It worked. I stood there until the sky turned from blue to orange before I snapped out of it and tactically retreated back home. When I got back, I told my dad everything. I probably should have mentioned that I was visiting him for a few days. Oops. He could probably smell Big Bear on me and it's no use lying to him. When I got to the part about what Big Bears really were, he refused to believe me. Then he got pissed at me. Then he locked the doors and camped out upstairs for the rest of our visit. I had to fucking bring him beer from downstairs when he wanted to shoot the shit. The weird thing is, as scared as he was and as weirded out as I was seeing my dad as spooked as a kid who's seen a skeleton, I wasn't scared. I remember that very clearly. I wasn't scared. I guess you could say I was too interested to be scared. If I was scared, I would have just bolted and I'd probably be typing this from inside a year-old gorp turd. If I had a guess, it would probably be that fucking Adderall I had popped that kept me from switching into run home scared to mama's tit mode. Well, okay, you probably stopped reading two posts ago, but that's how I met a gorp and left. Help. Bigfoot or something. Please help. I don't know if this has happened to anyone else but I still can't believe what happened to me. I don't know if this is even paranormal, but holy shit. This past week I've been spending in the Springfield area because I'm on break from the school. My parents want me to come with them to our cousin's house. They live in Northern Arkansas, but not too far away. I like my cousins, but who I really like is their dog Lysander. Big fluffy Malamute slash Husky mix. One of the prettiest dogs I've ever seen. He's always so excited to see me. Second day I'm there, yesterday, I decide to go for a hike with him. Uncle wants me to take a gun in case I run into a crazy, but I'm from the Illinois suburbs and I've never shot a gun in my life. I tell him I'll be fine, I'm a big girl now and Lysol will protect me. He agrees, but tells me to stay on the trail. I drive out to a trailhead I found online. Beautiful, mountainous region. This is Northern Arkansas, 
so it's below freezing but totally manageable. The snow is just brushing the ground. I'm walking at a great pace. Air is fresh, throwing sticks for Lyso. The trees are getting thicker. I know I'm never going to break a tree line or anything because these aren't big mountains. Brush is so thick that a lot of this ground doesn't really have snow. Lots of exposed roots, shadows, rocky boulders in the stream beds and such. It's pretty quiet, except for a few birds. Lyso is jumping around. He's so happy. Suddenly he freezes. He stops and sniffs the air. I can tell he's got something on his nose. He seems a little paralyzed. I suddenly feel nervous even though I try to brush it off as normal. I mean, he's a dog. He looks confused. He starts padding around, but he's super alert. Then his ears perk up, and a low growl starts in his throat. I stand behind him. What is it, buddy? His back arches like a cat, and he stands in front of me, still softly growling. I've never seen him do this before. I can literally see his fight or flight reaction working. Flight wins out. He turns and starts to nudge me into the brush off trail. I trust him, so I follow. I'm genuinely scared now. Crazy hill people fears and whatnot. He's not growling anymore, but he looks confused and alert again, and leads me into a little hollow a ways up from the trail. There he starts to scan the landscape, and that's when I see it. I crouch down, scared out of my mind, but peering through the branches in front of me. It's a bear, a really huge one, lumbering through the woods. I know I'm probably not in danger because bears don't usually attack humans, but this one? It's huge. I didn't even know bears were in this area. I'm cursing myself for not bringing that gun. Then I start to notice that the bear is walking funny. It's still a ways off and the branches are hiding it, but it looks like it's swaying from side to side with each step, as if it's drunk or it's dragging something. Like its arms are too long for its legs. When it gets closer, I see that it's definitely not a bear. At least not a normal one. The forearms look way more like human proportions, and its fur looks more like a buffalo or a mountain goat or something. Although its back looks like a bear, its neck is longer, and it has a tail. I've never seen a bear with a tail. It's kind of wagging too, sweeping back and forth. Lyso is dead silent, still on alert, but clearly just as scared as I am. The bear thing is rummaging around, getting closer, but for something that big and ungraceful, it's really quiet. Like... It definitely should be making more noise. Lyso starts to move and I grab him by the collar and put an arm around him, begging him to keep quiet. Too late. He barks, really loud, mean one, and the bear thing looks up quickly. I can't even describe the face. It's like this fat, furry bear moose hybrid, small eyes and weird lip things. It has these small ears and they shoot up as it's looking up the hill, right at me. I'm still holding Lyso, and I'm starting to pray at this point. Then, the bear thing slowly starts to stand up. My heart skips a beat. It's way bigger than I thought it was, and its arms are so terrifyingly long for its body. I let go of Lyso. He bolts down the hill, teeth baring and barking like crazy. The thing looks confused and scared and turns around. It starts to hightail it back the way it came. It's running this weird long-armed bear gallop, breaking branches but still with super quiet footsteps. I run down the hill after it as Lyso chases it away. Thirty seconds later, he comes back and licks my hand. I'm totally shaken. We go back on the trail and head back to my car. What the hell was that? When I got home, my family believed me, but I had a hard time explaining it. My dad and uncle think that it was a bear with some kind of severe deformity, like a growth hormone gene gone wrong and fucking up its bone structure. They said that there's a few bears in those mountains, and maybe inbreeding messed that one up. 
but its face was definitely not a normal animal. I honestly think I saw Bigfoot or maybe whatever people think Bigfoot is. When it stood up on its hind legs, its silhouette could definitely pass for a furry primate. And holy shit it was huge. This is literally my first time even posting on X, but since I knew 4chan, I came here. OP, did it look like this? Yes, yes, wait, sort of? What the fuck is that? The nose was bigger and I don't know about the tongue, but is that a dogman sighting? Nope, not a dogman, but that is a ground sloth. These things are out there too. You're not the only one to have seen them. This is fucking nuts. I'm looking up photos of ground sloths, and these are almost exactly what I saw. Like down to the exact shape of the head. Tell me other people have seen these. Holy shit, I'm convinced that's what it was. This is insane. I'm totally freaking out. I've lived in Southern MO for the past 15 years, and I've seen ground sloths twice. First time was up close, when I was hunting. I was actually tracking another animal when I saw the thing mosey right past me. Either it wasn't spooked or it didn't sense my presence. Second time was across a field, further away, but there was no denying that it was the same animal. I figure they must have underground burrows or something, but I didn't go looking, because even I understand that endangered creatures need to be left alone. For a while I called what I saw a branch bear, because the first time I saw one, it was eating branches. Only learned about the ground sloth classification four years ago. I managed to get in contact with a man who worked at the Peabody Museum at Yale. He actually took me seriously, but he still had a lot of doubt. He said my description was that of this. Apparently they have a whole skeleton of this kind at Yale. He said that all the big mammals in North America died out at the end of the last ice age. Probably due to human impact actually. Everywhere that humans went across the globe, large mammals and other large creatures have died out. He said that the specimens they have are about 10,000 to 11,000 years old, which is when the sloths died out. But he did make a point about how that's actually a really short time, evolutionary speaking. He didn't think it was possible that there were any around today, but he said if they did, it was more likely that smaller variety that survived. I have only shared this with a few people, and still, when I think about it, it freaks me the fuck out. I was 16 or so, and growing up in a small town, exploring out in the hills was the thing to do. This incident took place at the north end of Ruby Valley in Elko County, Nevada. Someday I will play around on Google Earth to try to find this place, but it's slightly north off the road, off the highway. 93 that goes into Ruby Valley. I always like checking out old mine shafts and ghost towns. That shit really intrigues me. At the Burger Bar in Wells, Nevada, where I'm from and grew up, they had these old turn of the century maps under glass on the tables. On one of them, it showed several ghost towns just north of Ruby Valley. So I figured I would go check them out as I had not been in the area very often. I gassed up my 72 Dodge W200 pickup and being a redneck in K before 4chan even, I grabbed my HK91 and set out. I had some old foundations in the lower country and started heading into the mountains themselves and started finding abandoned mine shafts. Shit was pretty cool, so I kept going. I took this ancient road that was no more than an overgrown cattle path by this point in history and came upon a tree blocking the road. It was an old pinion pine tree, about two feet in diameter, that blocked the road. After the tree, the road continued straight for about 200 yards, then hooked right before coming back 180 degrees. Continuing, gonna sketch up some key locations for next post. I parked my truck in front of the tree and set out on foot. I grabbed my HK-91 with one 20 round magazine in the rifle and put one 20 round mag in my back left pocket. I always had a rifle with me 
as I have encountered mountain lions in mineshafts before, and just generally like to shoot shit, and get up on ridge lines and shoot boulders from a couple hundred yards away. Anyways, as soon as I climbed over the fallen tree, I had a fucking creepy feeling, as if I was being watched. I continued on for about 200 yards, to the point where the road started curving right and gaining elevation, going towards the cabin. At this point, I had the realization that not only did I feel like I was being watched, it was also dead fucking quiet out. This was in June or so, as school had just got out. Everywhere you went, you could hear those fucking cicadas, but not here. It seemed as soon as I crossed the fallen tree, the mountains were silent. No bugs, no birds, nothing. Deafening silence. As I came up to the turn, there was this big fucking rock. The thing had to be about 15 feet in diameter. You could tell that it used to be on the road, but due to years of erosion, snow and all that shit, it had slid down just slightly off the road. It seemed to be red limestone, or something like that. It stood out, since they are not that common in this area. I looked at the rock, and you could tell that there were carvings in it at some point in time. Due to weathering though, whatever was carved on it had been worn off. I kept walking up the road, being creeped out like fuck, but I really wanted to check out the old cabin, as it was pretty obvious no one had been there in quite a while. At this point, I was probably three hours off-road to get to this point. I got up to the cabin, and as far as abandoned houses and cabins in Nevada go, this one was in pretty good shape. All of the glass on the windows was still intact, and there were remnants of curtains behind the windows. By this point, there was something in the back of my mind telling me that I should be going. I went in the cabin, and that is where I started to get the feeling that something was off. Most cabins you find out in the middle of nowhere in Nevada are barren. Nothing really left, maybe a bit of broken furniture. This one was completely furnished. Time had taken its toll, but everything was still there. What was left of an old mattress and bedding was still there. There were plates and other cookware throughout the house, along with tattered clothing and personal effects such as a chest, faded pictures, and the like. What really creeped me the fuck out was the dinner table. It was set up for four people. Dinner plate, glasses, and silverware. This was the first cabin I had ever found that was in this condition. It was as if whoever resided here had just up and left everything behind. I felt like I should not be in the cabin, and went outside to see if I could find the mineshaft or anything else. Once I was out the door, I decided to chamber around on my HK-91. The sound of me racking around echoed through the canyon and broke the silence. A little of a thing as it was, this calmed my nerves very slightly. Directly behind the cabin was a well. It was still intact, and as I got closer, it sounded like there was a noise coming from it, like a slight breeze rustling through it. When I got within about 30 feet of it, I started to smell something. It smelled absolutely fucking putrid. Definitely something had died in the well. The smell of decay was heavy in the air, with an acrid copper scent that tore up my nostrils. I did not want to get any closer to the well, and started walking towards the left, where I could see the opening to a mineshaft up on the hill. The closer I got to it, I could start feeling a breeze coming out of it. This is not really uncommon if you have explored mineshafts before, as the breeze could be coming in from another opening for the mine. But the thing was, it was perfectly calm. As far as I could see, there were no trees moving or any signs of wind. As I got closer, another thing that struck me as odd was the breeze coming out of the shaft was hot. Most of the time it's cool, as most mine shafts maintain a constant temperature. The closer I got to the shaft, the slower I moved towards it. 
Nothing since I crossed the fallen tree seemed right. The closer I got to the opening of the mineshaft, the more of a feeling of dread and being watched I got. I got within about 15 feet of the shaft when the fucking smell hit me. It was the smell of decay and copper, but much stronger than the well. Right then, all of my spidey senses started going off. I had to get out of there. I started turning left to book it out of there when I saw a dark shadow moving in the opening of the mineshaft. Whatever it was, it appeared to be crouched down to fit in the mineshaft. Most mineshafts I have been in have 8 to 10 foot ceilings. At first I thought it was a mountain lion. Then I remembered how big the fucking shafts were. My mind raced trying to think what the fuck it was. It was too big to be a black bear, which are rare in Nevada anyway. I nearly froze with panic, and it slowly kept coming towards the opening of the mineshaft. It was probably within 10 feet of the opening, and the light was starting to show whatever the fuck it was, was covered from head to toe in grayish brown fur. Then, it fucking screamed. It was unlike anything I have ever heard in my fucking life. My ears were ringing from it. I flipped into panic mode and did what any good redneck would do. I fucking shot it. I pulled up my HK-91, placed the front blade on what appeared to be its center mass, and ripped off five rounds as fast as I could accurately shoot. If you have ever shot big game with a large caliber rifle, you know the sound when you connect with something. I had four solid thwunks, and one round that went high. This made it scream even louder than it had, in pain. At this time, I started hearing more, and separate screams, coming from over in the well, and in the hills above the mineshaft. I started running down the hill as fast as I fucking could. In the tree line above the road, approximately 75 to 125 yards, I could see fast movement. Rocks were tumbling down the hill, and there were several other screams. From the mineshaft, I could hear the wailing of whatever the fuck I had shot. Whatever it was, I had definitely connected, and it was hurting. Whatever it was up in the tree line, they were running from tree to tree on all fours, getting closer to me. As I ran towards the rock, I was shooting in the general vicinity of the movement on top of the hill. By the time I got to the limestone rock, I had expended the 20 round mag in the rifle. I ripped it out and put in my spare magazine, chambered around, and started sprinting towards the fallen tree, approximately 200 yards away by now. I kept glancing back and whatever they were, they were staying in the trees. I could make out their masses and fur, but they would not stay in the open. I got back to the fallen tree and ate shit trying to jump over it. I got up off my ass, fired between 12 to 15 rounds at the closest movement, which was approximately 50 yards away from now. I heard a few rounds connect, and it started screaming louder. Between the screaming and gunshots, my ears were damned near dead. I opened the door out of my truck and got the fuck in, and started it up as fast as I could. Backing up to turn around, I damn near put my truck down in the canyon. As I started going forward to leave on the road that I came in on was when I finally got a look at one of them. It was crouched over with its front feet on the tree. It was covered from head to toe in grayish brown fur with long slender fingers and claws tipping off of the fingers. The back of it was hunched and the face was slender, most closely resembling that of a badger but with sunken in eyes. It was shaking its head back and forth and it sounded like it was attempting to speak, but it was so garbled, and with the noise of my truck, I could not make out what the fuck it was. I averaged 50 to 60 miles per hour on a shitty dirt road that I had done 15 on the way in. I did not slow down or stop until I got back to the pavement. By now I was so shaken, I had to stop and collect myself. I got back to town and was in a bit of a shock. My dad had been a guide in the Ruby Mountains for about 20 years. 
He asked me how my trip went, and where I went. He could tell that I was startled, and asked where I had been. I told him that I had been north of Ruby Valley. He got quiet, and asked if I had seen a cabin with a tree fallen over the road. I told him yes. He looked me in the eyes and told me that is somewhere I should never go again, especially alone. We never spoke about it again after that. I have never been back there. Part of the reason is I live in western Nevada now. But in the back of my mind, there is something that is telling me I should go back. And one day, I do want to go back. This was back in 2001, before camera phones, and I was too broke to afford a digital camera. I want to go back with a camera, preferably a GoPro on my helmet, and with several friends that are armed. Just something about there, even with the shit I experienced, is drawing me back. One day, I will go back. I guess I... I need closure on what happened that day. Definitely want to make it back out there with at least four to five people well fucking armed. That is for damn sure. Still to this day, it gives me goosebumps thinking about this shit. I tried researching it a bit a few years past, asking some old timers, and one of them told me a story about the rubies. I will be quick on it. During the 40s and 50s, the Army Air Corps operated out of the Wendover Air Base. Every now and then, during shit weather, a B-25, B-17, or B-29 would smack the rubies due to poor visibility. Some of the local ranchers got recruited to help the military go up to a crash site during the winter to recover the bodies. Rancher I was talking to told me that it took them about three days to get up to where this crash was on horseback and recover the bodies. He said that when they got to the wreckage, all of the crew members were laid out, side by side, next to each other, in a clearing in the wreckage. Many of them had severed limbs, and it was apparent all died on impact. Somehow, they ended up laid out next to each other. This was at nearly 10,000 feet elevation too. I have a story to tell. It takes place when I am alone in the Ruby Mountains, past Soldier Lake, and up the pass near Hidden Lake. I was alone on this trip, though I had been there before with friends. I carried a Glock 19 with two spare mags. Only the first mag had gold dots, while the others were FMJ. I figured that would be cheaper, and I would not need 60 rounds of ammo for anything. If I wanted to shoot, I did not want to waste my defensive ammo. This is a nice hike. It takes about four hours to get in, and when you get up, it's a nice place, with plains and prairie at the top, surrounded by mountains. I took lots of pictures the first day, and I will post them as I go along. I have to resize them, and I am typing as I go along, so be patient. I will say this though. I will never return to those trails, nor hidden lake. Pick is of a stream on the lower part of the trail. For those that don't know, Hidden Lake gets its name from the fact that it's up on a ridge and can't be seen from the trails. It's a great camping and fishing spot, and the view is awesome. To get there, you hike up the Soldier Pass trail and turn at the stick in the ground. It was a hot day, but I still decided to shoot up the trail for a four-day weekend. I got to the top in about 3.5 hours or so, made pretty good time. I set up camp, which was just a pup tent, and set about making dinner. I had gotten stuck in Elko for the first part of the day, and when I had finished making the climb, it was starting to get late. I cooked dinner on the fire, and crashed hard. The first couple of nights passed without anything unusual happening. Spent the days dicking around, hiking, fishing, and relaxing. Things begin late in the night, Saturday, my last night there. Pick is the stick you have to turn at. Saturday, I am sitting on the lake's ridge, making my way over to a spring to refill my water bottle. The water here is glass clear, but everything gets the pills just in case. 
As I am walking, I hear this godforsaken sound, like dragging metal on cement, just painfully loud and uncomfortable to hear. I looked around, but I could see no source. At this time, all the bugs and birds stopped making noise. There was always this background noise, right? You don't notice it, but it's there. I think this was the only time I was ever aware of it, because it all stopped. All I could hear was the spring, and my own breathing. I don't think I have ever felt that alone in my entire life. I would have killed to be able to hear the sound of a car engine, or a horn, or people talking. Anything but the silence. I was on the far side of the lake, near the snow outcrop, in the picture when this happened. A good 10 to 15 minute walk back if you are in a hurry. I filled my water bottle up and headed back. The sounds of the animals returned, but I was still nervous. When I got back, my campsite was destroyed, including my bag. Everything was scattered everywhere, and it felt like a bomb had gone off. Everything was broken or rendered useless. Even silverware was bent and twisted. The fire, which less than an hour before was burning brightly, was as dead as if someone dumped a bucket of water on it. Picture is of the lake. I stopped being nervous and started to get pissed. I figured some kids had done it. I had not seen a soul since I made the climb, but that did not mean much. I started gathering my broken belongings. I had seen a nice fairy hole, a natural hole in rock along one of the ridges, and decided I would relocate my camp there. I got the fire burning again, and stuff that was not repairable or useless, I burned to save weight. As I went around cleaning up, I got this feeling. I'm not quite sure how to describe it. Like, you walked into someone's house without them being home, and they didn't know you were there. Like you shouldn't be there. But that's inadequate wording. I was getting nervous, and hurried up the ridge. Then I saw it first. A dark mass moving alongside the edge of the lake, too far away to make out any details. But as I watched, I saw that it was following the same path I had taken. It was thin though, long and thin and dark. Now, I took the simplest path, so maybe it was just following that. But I felt like it was tracking me. Why would it need to go to a spring to drink rather than a lake? I was starting to get a little unhinged when I saw it. I have been hunted by a mountain lion before, and the feeling I had then was just that. Hunted. I was being stalked, but in a way, we were equals. Both cats and I are apex predators, and the tides could easily turn. When I saw this, any thought of killing it left my mind. I just wanted to run and hide, run as fast and hard as I could. I was prey. I could do nothing to this thing. The way it moved was so certain, so clean, that I knew I could not kill it. My gun that on the way up had made me feel so big felt like a toy. It moved between moving on four feet and two. I hurried up the slope and threw my stuff in the hole. I used rocks and the broken tent stakes and poles to barricade one end of it. The side ended in a drop off and I pulled rocks and other debris to the other side. I curled up in a ball and lodged myself in the hole, clutching my pistol in one hand and a pocket knife in the other. I could hear rocks shifting outside, further down the slope. Last bit. I heard something get up the slope and start squeaking around. It was this squeak mixed with a hiss. Through the few holes I had left, I could see flashes of dark matted fur. It had small, dark eyes, thin, long snout, almost badger-like, tapered. I could not breathe. I could hear claws clicking on the rocks not ten feet away. It searched around outside for about half hour and then left. The rest of the night, I could hear rocks shifting as something moved around on them. I think it knew I was there, but he did not see me as a threat of any kind. 
I never slept that night. In the morning, I left, and I have not been back since. Sorry. No epic combat ending. Just me hiding. I don't like those mountains anymore. I don't know what looks up there, and those thin passes. Maybe it was just a critter of some sort, and my imagination ran with it. I don't know. It sounds cliche, but going through these pictures made me kind of nervous by themselves. I don't like to tell the story, and it's the first time I told it to Kay. The feeling I had is what still shakes me up. I was prey. Nothing more, nothing less. Has anyone else heard of something strange in the rubies? I've seen some weird shit in Arizona. I've got a place right on the edge of the desert, down in the valley, and a really nice concrete cabin right on the edge of the forest in Flagstaff. One thing both have in common are coyotes. There are shitloads of coyotes that live right on the edges of civilization. They thrive there, scavenging and eating people's pets. When I'm in the valley, I like to go on full walks during full moons. It's so bright outside that you can see almost perfectly, and the sun isn't beating down on you constantly. This was one such night, and I decided to go out. I followed the wash out to the canal, which has three trails next to it that extend out into the desert, and I decided to take the one that meanders out away from the canal into the wilderness proper. After a mile or so, the trail does a 90 degree turn when it meets the Indian reservation border. You're not supposed to go in there, but people do all the time. The views were spectacular. Nothing like seeing the red rock formations on the horizon with that pale moon glow to them. I wasn't liking the idea of taking my eyes off the scenery in order to navigate through the desert, so I stayed on the trail. I could hear a pack of coyotes pretty close by, doing their crazy howling, yipping thing that they do when they tear apart a cat or something. I didn't care. Coyotes are pussies, and they never attack humans. I kept walking, scanning the horizon for owls or something else interesting. I look over to the shoddy barbed wire fence that's a border to the reservation, and I see a pack of coyotes not 200 feet away. There are lots of fairly deep dips in the trail, so it makes sense that I didn't see them until now. I freeze to watch, and the moonlight illuminates things pretty clearly for me, in a colorless way. I notice that one of the coyotes seems to be way bigger than the others. More than that, it looks really fucked up, and isn't moving properly. At first I think it's a dead dog or something, and they're eating it, which made sense with the way they were all milling around in a circle around it. I stared with morbid curiosity as the coyotes seemed to take turns, looking back at me. Then the thing stands up, which scared the shit out of me, thinking it was dead, and even more because it stood onto its hind legs and was at least five feet tall. As it raised its arms into the air, I realized that this was a person, or at least looked like one. He was wearing coyote pelts all over his body, and was carrying some darkly colored dead animal in one of his hands that the coyotes kept leaping and trying to get at as he raised it into the air. I had no fucking idea what to do at that point. I knew coyotes weren't really dangerous, but this guy was obviously completely insane. He was inside the reservation, so I guessed he had to be a native doing some crazy goddamn thing. I'd only been standing there for a few seconds at this point, when he realized his coyotes were looking at something and turned towards me. The moonlight wasn't enough to make out his face, and it was shadowed by pelts anyway. He just stared at me for a second or two as the coyotes walked in circles around him, looking at him, then looking at me, then at him again. He turned away from me and bolted into the desert, sprinting and jumping and doing a nearly perfect coyote yipping noise which started the rest of them doing it. Weird. I've always wanted to live in Arizona, just for the nature. Any other stories? I should mention that you cannot sprint through the desert around here. It's a goddamn minefield of cactus that don't give a fuck what kind of footwear you have on. Even if you put on heavy boots, within 30 seconds, you'd be walking on little lopsided islands of spines 
that are stuck to your feet and just begging you to lift your foot high enough to brush against your other leg's calf. I never made a habit of going onto the reservation. There are stories of natives riding up and escorting trespassers out at gunpoint, but I don't know what the fuck I saw that night. I think about it every single time I hear the coyotes go apeshit. Be me. Native American, but not going to name my tribe out of fear of retaliation. I don't know if skinwalkers use X. Notice people's fascination with skinwalkers. Say fuck it and post this to get it off my chest. This part of the story doesn't make much sense, but it will later on. Around the 70s or early 80s, grandma and grandpa drop mom off at babysitter. Mom is about five or so at the time. Grandma and grandpa have some sort of family blood relationship with the babysitter, but will never tell me if they're my uncles or my grandpas or what. Mom gets dropped off and all is good, until Babysitter's husband assaults my mom. Mom didn't understand. Babysitter's husband and my grandpa get into it when he becomes aware of what happened to my mom. They stop taking my mom over there and both sides have a huge falling out. He is exposed to his community and loses respect. That's basically this guy's evil villain backstory who keeps fucking with me and my family. I won't go into any more detail than that, but here is some spoopy candy for y'all. That first part is just for context. I will speak from my own experience with these dumbasses. Skinwalkers are not gods. They're pathetic, low self-esteemed people like me and you who use black magic when shit doesn't go their way. Want to go to a sick punk rock show because my friends are playing also YOLO. Mom agrees to take me, but starts worrying about COVID and social distancing and shit. Whatever, I don't want to go anymore. Me and mom get into it about some dumb shit. We get home. I sit in the car for a while while my mom goes inside. I'm glad I stayed in the car because my mom comes back out to check on me, and this is when she first notices it. She hears an owl, but she's not sure if it's passing through or what. She starts freaking out. Why, mom? explains to me that owls are an omen for death. She keeps hearing them and grabs her mega beam light and starts shining it through our whole parking zone. It's not one, but two fucking owls. Both are staring at us once they are discovered, like in a fuck you for discovering us manner. Sneaky bastards. Mom freaks out and basically tells me to never go outside again. They don't come back for maybe a week. Go back, maybe early October of this year. Me and Buddy having a good time, laughing and shit, watching YouTube and whatnot. Hey OP, let's go smoke a bowl before I have to dip. Okay. Goes outside into alleyway. Live in a major city, not gonna say where. Live in a quiet residential area, but still surrounded by towers and buses and shit. It's dark. We spark the first hit. All is fine until we hear a cat. Kitty? Call out kitty kitty kitty. No response. No movement. Not coming from one direction or one place. It seems to be all around us. Fucking owl starts hooting. They're fucking back. The owls are fucking back. Homie knows something is up because don't owls hunt cats? And owls don't live in the city. Wrap up smoke sesh and say goodbye to homie. Owl is still hooting. But I go inside. Maybe a week or two weeks later, I go outside to smoke a bowl and they're back. Don't get scared this time. Instead, stand straight up and kick it like a G, smoking my trees. Don't give in to fear. Fuck you, owl skinwalkers. End up seshing until the sun comes up and people start jogging and shit. Go to eat and see a movie with my boyfriend. See ya, mom. Mom has work next morning, so let her sleep. Spend the night at boyfriend's. Mom said I came home that night and said, Mom, I'm back to her. I never came back that night. Slept in my boyfriend's arms till morning. She says in a pissed off tone, These things are fucking with us. Forever scared to leave my mom alone like that again. Find a bunch of feathers across the apartment over the next few days. Fuckers. 
Be me. Life is good until 10 years old. Move to Redacted to live with grandparents because mom cannot afford us all. Grandparents' place is naturally spoopy on the outside, but our house has a cool fireplace and looks and feels nice inside. Shit is obviously haunted. Whenever I'm alone, cabinets and doors fly open and shit, but I don't mind. As long as whatever ghost is here doesn't try to fuck with us, and it never has. Go to sleep with doors unlocked, because white suburban neighborhood, everyone does it. Sleep on living room floor next to fireplace. One night, I crash out and left the door open as usual. Sleep through the night. Wake up the next day. All seems alright. Look in the mirror. Notice a piece of my hair is clean cut straight off with a pair of scissors. Must have been done while I was sleeping. Question to do something about it or not do anything at all. Ignore it for the next decade. Over time, through friends telling me not to leave my hair around after I combed it, I learned that hair can be used to witch someone, and they were using it to control me and my emotions. Don't tell anyone until 10 years later. Feel defeated in a way. Do some pretty cringe, questionable shit during that time. Basically pick up my hair and my family's hair all the time now, in fear of those weirdos fucking with our beautiful hair. Grandma is an expert at crystal glazing and using prayers and ceremonies to our advantage. Been doing it all her life. She doesn't hesitate to help anyone that she cares about. Always preaches that this work should be done for free and medicine men who charge money are whack. She helps us with this owl skinwalker bullshit that keeps happening to us. Not going to say how she helped us or what technique she uses due to fear of retaliation from a higher power. Basically come to find out that the owls are shape-shifting skinwalkers. Also, my hair was taken by the same people who let my mom get assaulted at five years old. They're coming after us, her children, because they're ashamed of what they did, and the only option that they have is to kill my mom and her kids. They're coming after us because we ruined their reputation and image. Basically get explained that these people will try to bring me down for the rest of my life until they die. Forbidden from going anywhere at night from now on. I want to run off. I wait until about before the sun comes up this time. They haven't been back since, but during that time, my dad's dad passed away from cancer. I don't know if the events are related yet, but I don't think so. Anyways, the owl shape-shifting skinwalkers have never come back since. I have this feeling they're going to come back smarter this time and really do me wrong when I least expect it. All I can do is pray and watch my back. That's some spooky shit I wanted to share with X, because I feel speaking about it through my mouth can bring them back or some fucked up shit. It's been something that bothers me and every time I hear a little noise, I panic. I thought you guys might enjoy the read too. I'm up for questions if anyone has any while I'm still active on the thread. Be junkie. There's this heroin slash coke dealer who has his little crew and is always throwing cash around, doing dumb shit. One day over there, buying my shit for the day. Announced they're all going camping. They love to do impulsive random shit. Bike to go with. I love camping, especially with crazy cool people such as these folks. Leave Minneapolis to the wilderness outside Duluth. Group of seven people. Setting up camp, disorganized as fuck. One couple already fucking in their tent, lol. With all the chaos and getting high, events weren't clear until later. Two dudes go to get firewood and make sure nobody else is around to see us using needles and call the cops. Nobody really takes note or cares to remember that they leave. 30 minutes later, one guy comes back. Where's the other one? I don't know, I went for wood. He went to make sure we were safe to get high. Whatever. He's probably just nodding off somewhere. Two goddamn hours later, other guy strolls into camp looking very not high. Where were you? Oh, looking at birds. Lol, what the fuck? What junkie likes bird watching? Nighttime comes around. Dude who came back later, acting strange, seems generally confused by our weird activities. Looks almost pissed confused. Sits down on a log by fire suddenly, 
awkwardly, like he's really drunk. Hard junkies don't drink. Junkies be acting strange always, whatever. Been almost nine hours since we arrived. People getting dope sick, withdrawal. Time to get stoned. Dope is passed around. Everyone desperately starts cooking up. Between cooking and strapping up, I notice the guy just smelling the chunk of dope, looking like he can't handle the smell. What the fuck again? Everyone's done shooting up. The guy is still sniffing the chunk. By now, everyone notices. He cautiously licks the dope, has incredibly strong taste and smell of uber vinegar, makes this horrible animal gagging slash hacking sound. The fuck? The main dealer guy offers to cook and prepare the shot for him. He was already high and didn't notice strange behavior too much. The guy mumbles, mm, yeah, shoots him up. Note, your average junkie does enough dope in one shot to kill King Kong and his whole family. Tolerance is a bitch. Guy's whole body starts to shake. His eyes are popping out. Everyone's still staring with dopey glazed eyes. He makes this strange, panicked, choking breathing sound like there's a wet towel in his mouth or throat. Blood literally pops out of his nose, incredibly dark colored. He starts to make this intense, high pitched screech or screaming noise. He stops to choke and cough suddenly every second or two. These are not normal OD symptoms. This horrible, horrible stench permeates the camp. Ho. Lee, shit. Dude falls over backwards. Panic ensues. Dude, you gave him too much. Fuck. Fuck. Main guy goes to help him up. Can't. Stench increases to the point where the rest of us are gagging or puking. Hear very distant scream from Forrest. Amid the panic, I think nobody else notices. Hear other screams and screeching join in. Everywhere. What the fuck? The panic levels cannot be contained. Junkies are screaming inside the camp too. Screeching outside the camp grows and grows. My ears are ringing. Stench is clogging my lungs. I can't take it. Overwhelming smell and high pitch ringing. Too much to handle. I black out. Awake in the morning. Look around. Very shaky. Can smell hints of stench from last night. Nobody to be seen except that fucking guy. The goddamn guy. Boots sticking up from the log he fell off. Walk over slowly. Looks like he's been dead weeks. Skin is tight over his face. White and blue. Eyes sunken. Looks like he lost 80 pounds before dying. Blood covering him. I don't know from where. Realize I am covered in blood too. There are scrapes and dents slash holes all over the ground. Some are obviously animal tracks, human footprints, handprints, and combinations of them all. Some seem to be dragged. Withdrawing and losing my mind, steal the main dealer's car, go home, and never speak of it again. Never heard a word from or about any of those people ever again, except for one girl who got put in a psych ward I heard. I never visited her. Sub X working a night shift and decided why not recount this story from back when I was a teen. Never posted on this board so forgive any shitty formatting. Be me, around 2018 to 19 give or take. Fresh out of junior year of high school, hyped as fuck for the summer. Live in rural NorCal, town about an hour out of Sacramento. Be huge fisherman, go every day if I can. Buddies tell me of some spot on a creek near my house. Decide fuck it. Might as well check it out. Drive out there. Entrance is a large fire gate going down a big ass dirt road. No cars or people around in at least a mile in each direction. But fuck it. I wanna fish. Hop out of the car and grab my gear. Start walking down the path towards the water. Woods on either side are extremely thick. Thick to the point I can't see more than 20 feet in. Creeped out already. Walk about 10 minutes. Get to a small hill. As I descend the hill, the temperature drops significantly. Almost to the point where it feels off. 
Now, fishermen and most folks know, when you get closer to water, especially on a hot day, the temperature will drop. But this wasn't normal. It felt fucking freezing. Decide fuck it. I want to catch a damn bass and no cold is going to stop me. Walk about 20 more minutes. Cold goes away as I exit the tree line to the lake. Hot summer that year. Drought in full effect. So lake is more of a puddle with about 200 feet of bare bank surrounding it, leading to a dense tree line. As I'm descending to throw a line, notice a small figure on the other side of the lake. Looks to be a coyote, but way too big. About the size of a large German shepherd, if not bigger. Coyotes in my area are usually no bigger than a small lab, and skittish as all fuck. This one was just sitting on the waterline watching me. Felt weirded the fuck out, but didn't think much of it. Just some weird dog. Keep fishing for about an hour, until eventually I come parallel to the thing. It's still sitting, watching me. Decide fuck it. Stupid thing needs to leave. Pick up a serviceable stone, and hucked it as hard as I could at the fucker. This is where it gets interesting. Fucking thing was about 50 feet away, give or take, and my arm isn't strong. Stone lands about 30 feet from its target. Now this is what still fucks with me. Instead of running off like a normal coyote, this thing turns and starts running parallel to the water. As it does, this fucking thing gets up on its hind legs, and in one swift motion, starts to run with the bound of a man. I'm not talking the weird stutter step that canines do on their hind legs. No. This fuck was full on running. It runs about three seconds parallel, and then cuts up into the tree line, for a total of me watching it for about 15 seconds. This wasn't a out of the corner of my eye kind of thing, either. I stared at that fuck. It cuts into the tree line and disappears, and my entire body is consumed with fear. The kind of, I'm going to die here fear. I haphazardly grab my fishing shit and book it towards the trail, not looking back once. The whole time I'm running about a mile back, all I can think is that it's going to catch me and kill me. The same feeling if you've ever had a big cat stalk you, where you are suddenly the prey, the hunted, and the scared. I'm running as fast as my fat high schooler legs can take me when I hear in the bushes behind me rattling and this wheezing I won't shake for the rest of time. Sounds like an iron lung got hit with a semi-truck, but somehow wet and animalistic. I pick up the fucking pace. I peeled around the corner, seeing the fire gate and my car. I was so sure that the thing was right on my ass, so I jump the gate, sprint to the car, and throw all of my shit in. Hop in the driver's seat, turn that shit and drive, and peel right out of there. I didn't look back. I flew down the road at 90 till I was back to Highway 50. My face went. I've never been so happy to see traffic in my life. Native pal said don't go back. Rest in peace, any solo adventures. Alright X, I'm posting my Skinwalker story. It's a fucking strange one. I've never read one like this before, so here goes. I'll try and keep as much detail as I can remember. Still have the route saved, so... I should be able to tell y'all exactly where these events took place. Also, I'm not pre-writing this, so be a bro and don't post until the story is finished. Be me. Live in South Carolina. Really into camping from an early age. Camp all up and down the East Coast from New York to Florida. Never gone east of Nashville. Decide to take a two-week road trip and camp in as many national forests as I can. Bring girlfriend because she's just as into camping as me. Pack gear and set off for Bankhead National Forest in Alabama. Arrive at Randolph Trailhead Parking. Follow trail north about half a mile, cut east for about two miles to Little Ugly Canyon. Cross the river and head north up the hill about a quarter of a mile. Make a camp, cook food, relax by a small campfire. Girlfriend is drawing. I'm cleaning my mess kit when I notice that I can't hear any wildlife. No crickets, no frogs, no birds, no nothing. 
Now, I've been camping since I was 12 years old. I know that the forest can get quiet sometimes, but in my nearly 12 additional years of camping, I've never once heard the forest go completely silent. Probably a bear.jpg. Pack up food, hang bear back, go to bed. Nothing much happened that night. Natural sounds came back a few minutes before I fell asleep. Not sure if this particular event was related to what happened in the following days, but I'll include it for context. The next leg of our trip was in the Ozark National Forest. This was also where the first real signs of a skinwalker being present. Park at Wolfpen Recreational Area. Cross the Mulberry River and hike south to Short Grotto Falls. Hike east about a mile and set up camp off trail. Eat and go to bed. Wake up in the middle of the night to take a piss. Walk a few feet outside camp and piss. Walk back to camp and stoke campfire a little bit. Suddenly the smell hits me. That smelly smell that smells smelly that empty for. Tactically shit myself as every late night reading on X flashes through my mind. Quietly go back into tent and get my bag. Unstrap rifle on the side of my pack. A Winchester 94 in 3030 for you commandos and throw another log on the fire. Sit outside of tent and keep fire going for the rest of the night. Smell faded right before sunrise. Break down camp as soon as girlfriend wakes up. Explain the situation to her when we get to the car. She was remarkably calm about the whole thing. Even offered to drive the next leg and let me catch up on some sleep. The next two days, we spent in hotels in Texas, driving around and seeing the sights. Third night out in the woods was in Lincoln National Forest. Take Indian Service Route 45 into the forest. Hike south about a mile and a half and set up camp. You know the song and dance by now. Girlfriend and I are up talking when I see her crinkle her nose. Smell hits me a second later. That's Smelly Smell, part two, her electric boogaloo. Girlfriend reaches into tent and grabs my rifle, hands it to me. Remember something about fire keeping these things away. Build up campfire and grab as much firewood off the ground as I can. Didn't sleep that night. All night we heard this thing stalking around our camp. All. Damn. Night. Smell goes away right after sunrise. Girlfriend is understandably freaked out and insists that we stay the night in a hotel. Spend the night in a hotel in El Paso. We spend three nights in El Paso, just enough to let things calm down and let our nerves settle. Our last night in the woods was in Gila National Forest. This is where things kind of came to a head. Drive into Gila National Forest, Route 20E, pulled off the road and hiked along a creek and set up camp. Camping activities occur, food is consumed, y'all know what's up. Sun goes down, all is well. Think that we might get a regular night of camping in. Girlfriend and I go to sleep. Wake up a few hours later to a scream in the woods outside of the camp. Tactically shit our pants, knock the tent over trying to get out. Make it out of the tent, fumble with rifle and frantically scan the tree line for any form of movement. Second scream comes from my right. Protective boyfriend instincts kick in. Tell girlfriend to grab her bag as I throw mine over my shoulder. Branch snaps to my left. Snap a rifle in that direction and catch a blur of gray motion darting into the tree line. Fire in that direction. Tell girlfriend to run as I work the action on my rifle. Book it back to the car. Something crashing in the bush behind us. I make it to my car. Turn and fire into the bush again. Throw our shit into the back seat and speed off down the road. Averaging 50 to 60 miles per hour on a dirt road that I should have maybe been going 30 on. Drove all the way back to Lubbock on the adrenaline. Come back to SC right after that. I'm not sure if I just have shitty luck or if I'm connecting dots that aren't there or if too much time on X has made me paranoid. But there's my tale. If nothing else, I hope you all enjoyed the thread. I've only heard a skinwalker story from this big Tongan guy who was doing a mission trip in southern Utah. They lived out in BFE in a cabin on some Indian reservation, or right off of one, I forget. He's a Mormon, so they wear the white underwear. That is relevant. Anyway, he and his buddy were eating dinner 
when he asked about skinwalkers. Apparently his buddy, a Utah native, went pale, well, paler, and climbed up. He wouldn't talk about it. He kind of shrugged it off, until one night, they were making their way back from an appointment on the res, and he was driving. His buddy said, Elder, his last name, you need to drive faster. Well, he had gotten hit by the res police for doing 28 in a 25, so he wasn't really eager for another ticket. He looked at him and said, Are you joking? And his companion just pointed at something out of the window. It was someone on all fours running like a dog straight at them. He gunned it back to their home and pulled in, ran inside and locked all the doors. The guy had kept up with them for the whole 20 minutes back. The person or thing, which his companion now told him was a skinwalker, was screaming and hitting the doors and windows. Well, this guy is 6'4 and 350 pounds and he's Tongan, so he told his buddy he was going to check on it. His buddy cried and begged him not to. He opened the door anyway and said, Hey Skinwalker, come here and fight me, man to man. He said it was quiet for a minute, and then he heard a whisper to the side and behind him, off the corner of the house, say, Why don't you take off your garments and fight me, man to man? I've got another incident I can tell you all about, to kill time while I'm on call. I'm OP from these two previous threads. Tired of green texting, and this one is a little on the long side, so I figured typing it out normally would be best. This happened when myself, my brother from another mother, and some other guys decided on going for a cross-country road trip the summer after we graduated high school. Some of us were signing up with the military when we got back. Others were going off to their college of choice, but one of us, Baker, he had plans for going off to Europe for a few years to backpack and see the sights of the old country. He was also a massive paranormal fanboy. Anything remotely creepy or paranormal would grab his goat, and he'd run off headfirst into whatever situation had arisen, just to sate his curiosity. Most of us liked paranormal shit as well, or at least tolerated his shenanigans, because usually it ended up with us exploring some old busted ass buildings or houses, and once an entire ass beached steamboat that had seen much better days. So when Baker announced he was plotting our course across the country to hit as many paranormal slash creepy spots as possible, none of us were surprised, nor did we express any sort of argument against it. We just rolled with it in the spirit of adventure. The trip would go on to be a fucking blast. Some spots were genuinely creepy, others were a letdown. Mostly, the fun came from each of us trying to scare the bejesus out of each other whenever possible. Which, admittedly, was whenever we could do it, and the journey to each spot. That all changed when we hit New Mexico. Baker was originally from NM, having moved out of there when he was still shitting yellow in his diapers, and was almost hell-bent on having a stop as much as possible while we were driving through here. We didn't mind. Most of us had never left our home state, so everything was new to us, and we were generally enjoying ourselves. We made a stop in Animas at Baker's request. Apparently, he had family that lived there and they'd agreed to let us crash at their place for the night. We figured why not. We wouldn't have to set up camp or rent a hotel, and Baker would get to see family he hadn't ever met before. It's a win-win. We pull up to their place. Baker hops out and walks up, starts talking to an older guy in his 50s who walked out of the house for a few minutes. Then the two of them walk back towards our vehicle. Introductions are made, and we find out the guy is Baker's only uncle. We shoot the shit for a bit, when his uncle tells us he has their old bunkhouse from back when they had a little ranch ready for us to stay in. This was considered a great win for us, as that meant no double bunking, and that everyone actually got a bed for once, instead of a sleeping bag or a cot. So we pull around to where it is and unload our stuff for the evening and get our beds picked and set for the night. We get dinner situated and end up eating outside around a fire pit alongside Baker's uncle, who's shooting the shit with us while catching up with Baker about his family. Pretty soon though, of course, Baker turns the talk 
towards spooky shit in the area. We all see his uncle's face sort of fall, like someone who's trying not to think of some bad shit that happened, so people don't realize they hit a nerve. He sits there for a few minutes, silently. Baker is badgering him about it, until he gets up and walks inside. We all start giving Baker shit, because from what we can all tell, he just ruined his uncle's night and he falls into that defensive silence someone who knows they fucked up tends to put on. But a few minutes later, his uncle walks back out, a bottle of tequila in hand, and eight glasses. He passes one to each of us, pours each of us about three fingers worth, then takes a good, long swig while staring into the fire. Then he takes a seat and starts to talk. He begins to tell us about an event that had happened roughly 30 years before, about how he lost a friend and a lover to it, and that if we really wanted to hear something creepy, then we'd shut the fuck up and listen, because he was only going to tell us once. So, we all sat back, buttoned up our lips, and let the man speak. It started off with him telling us about his friend and his friend's brother, and how the three of them had met while working as miners, and had quickly become fast friends. He said he became a miner so he wouldn't have to deal with working the ranch, a job he hated, and that the two men he met made the job bearable, but only barely. Since they were Mexican, they usually got the short end of the stick, but as long as they were together, they could deal with it. Then, the uncle and his friend's brother slowly began to realize that the two of them were more alike than they thought, leading to the two men confessing that they swung for the same team, and they quickly began a relationship in secret. He said he told us this so that we'd know how painful it was for him to talk about the event. Baker looked surprised. He didn't have the best track record with same-sex couples, and the shock of finding out his only uncle was a part of that lifestyle was pretty evident on his face, but he kept his mouth shut as his uncle continued on. A few months into the men meeting one another, ranchers in the area started reporting missing animals, or finding animals dead and desiccated, where the day before, the animal would have been alive and in good health. Of course, that got the local ranchers agitated, and regular hunting parties were organized to see if the animal or person responsible could be found, and either killed if it was an animal, or brought to justice if it was a man. I don't need to tell y'all what kind of justice his uncle was talking about. I'm sure y'all can put two and two together. This continued on into the winter months. At this part, his uncle took a short pause, still staring into the fire, then took a shot from the tequila and continued. The ranchers were getting more and more angry. They were losing animals, but had yet to find any sort of tracks or traces of whatever or whoever was doing it. Hell, even the miners began to talk about it, whispering that if it was some sort of animal taking down cattle, whatever it was would be able to take down a person as well, especially if it was a mountain lion or similar. They also began to talk about hearing weird noises in the deeper mine shafts, stuff like faint growling or what sounded like claws moving across rock. Some of them began refusing to go into the deep unless they had more than one other person with them, something that earned those miners nervous laughter from the rest of them, and calls of them being cowards and pussies. Baker's uncle told us how he, his friend, and his lover would routinely be forced to work the deeper shafts, since the others would either refuse to go down there, or were higher seniority on the minor totem pole, and that it would just be them for hours at a time down there. Eventually, the three of them stopped bitching about it and just focused on their work, figuring the faster they dug during the shifts, the faster they'd get out. He said they would occasionally hear the noises that the other miners reported, but would try and ignore them as best as they could and focus on their work. It worked, until the night that it didn't. He told us that they got in the graveyard shift that night, as well as the deepest part of the shaft they were assigned to. So off the three went, grumbling under their breath about the whole situation. 
they stepped out of the elevator, and the guys going up had scared looks on their faces. So Baker's uncle asked one of them that he was on somewhat cordial speaking terms with what was wrong. The guy seemed to hesitate, then told the fray that they'd been hearing strange noises coming from the lower shafts all shift, and that they'd been pretty disturbing, but that they attributed it to wind gusting through from an unknown cave connected to the shaft, and that the proper authorities would be checking it out the next day to make sure that part of the mine shaft was in no danger of collapsing, but for them to be careful, since they were going to be right smack dab in the middle of it all night. That did not make the free men feel any better as they walked towards where they'd been assigned, setting about getting to work. Ten minutes into their shift, the lights went out. From the way he said it, it seemed like the lines had been cut. One moment they were all lit, the next, they were standing in complete and utter darkness, while only the sound of each other breathing letting them know the other two were still there. They scrambled to get their helmet lights turned on, and while doing so, they start hearing the claw on rock noise, and it was approaching fast. He said that as far as he knew, the other two felt like he did, that something bad was coming their way. So the three of them began booking it back towards the lift. The clawing sound picked up speed, almost like it was running full tilt at them. When he heard his friend scream in pain and fear, he said his lover and himself turned to see his friend and lover's brother laying face down on the ground, his body going limp, as what he described as an albino, almost hairless rat dog took a chunk out of his neck while looking at the two of them, before letting out a squeal like the cross between an angry cat hissing and grease sizzling on a hot skillet. The two of them turned and began running again, him saying that he disgustingly hoped that whatever it was would have stopped to eat his friend so the two of them could get away, and being absolutely terrified when he heard those clawing noises getting close. That's when Baker's uncle stopped talking again, still staring into the fire. He was quiet for so long, we began to assume that he was either not going to tell the rest of what happened, or that he'd gotten too drunk to remember it. Neither of those was the case. That's when I felt him grab me and throw me out of the way, and I saw the thing fly past me, barely missing. We weren't too far from the elevator, and thankfully, the power was still on in that part of the mineshaft, so we hoped, like a motherfucker, that the lights would act as a deterrent. They didn't do shit. He told us how his lover pushed him into the elevator as the rat dog thing charged at them and tried to get in while the thing was picking itself up off the ground, already starting to charge at them. The thing was fast, too fast, and in what he said was almost an eye blink, it was on his lover, biting and scratching at him, before finally tearing out his throat. He said for the second time that night, he felt disgusted at how he felt as he slapped the ascent button on the lift part of him hoping it would hurry, and the other part cussing at him for being a coward and not helping out his lover. The lift began to ascend, and he said the thing locked eyes with him and screeched, charging. Luckily for him, it apparently could not climb and barely missed the lift, smacking headlong into the mine shaft wall. He said he could hear it screeching the entire way up, with the miners who had gathered around the top of the elevator shaft hearing it as well. One of them asked where the other two men were, and why he looked so terrified. So, working quickly, he concocted a story about how there was an albino wolf that had somehow gotten into the shaft that ended up killing both of his partners. It was here that his uncle fell silent for the third time that night, this time for much longer, so long that we began to worry about him though he did stand up slowly, after a few moments, and then excusing himself. All of us were quiet after he went inside the house, contemplating whether or not what we just heard was real or not. 
most of us came to the same conclusion, that his uncle was telling some form of the truth. But Baker? Baker came to a totally different conclusion. Baker wanted to go see the shaft in person. We all began discussing it amongst ourselves, and eventually, we all, minus Baker, came to the conclusion that Baker had a death wish, but he would just not let it go, and eventually persuaded every one of us that it was the spirit of adventure calling, and that there were eight of us, so whatever it was, wouldn't try anything, if there was, in fact, something to the story. So we all filed into the bunkhouse, with a plan forming to go monster hunting. The next morning, we awoke, wondering if Baker would still be dead set on his little monster hunting adventure. Mostly because all of us, during the night, had come to the same conclusion. None of us wanted to go spelunking in some old mine shafts and run the risk of something happening and all of us getting trapped down there. But when Baker awoke, the first thing out of his mouth when he walked out to the kitchen was to ask if we were all ready for it. Half-hearted affirms were had from some of us. Others were saying various things about safety issues, but he brushed them aside and simply stated that if we weren't going with him, he'd go it alone. The rest of us shared a look, knowing that none of us were going to let our friend do something as stupid as that alone. So we gathered together outside and went over the plan. Admittedly, it wasn't much of a plan. It went like this. Step 1. Find the mineshaft in question, which Baker set off to question his uncle about. The rest of us were left to come up with a step 2, which, at the end of our brainstorming session, composed of us taking some form of weapons with us. Two of us had handguns. One a little 38 revolver that one of the guy's dads had given him in case we ran into trouble on the road, and the other guy was a high power that the guy religiously carried, and still carries. The gun guys amongst us were not confident in the stopping power of the 38, but figured between it and the 9mm we'd at least be able to injure it, enough to make it back off. The rest of us were relegated to walking sticks that were more like wooden poles, since that was what we could find laying around the area. Step 3 didn't even get considered, and in hindsight, we probably should have come up with one, but hindsight is a bitch, so we aren't to talk about it yet. Baker walked out about half an hour later. In his hands was an old map, which he gleefully yelled at us as he walked over was one from the early 70s with each of the mines in the area marked, and the one in question circled with a black marker. He informed us it was about an hour's drive away and asked if we were ready. So, with our poles tossed in the back, we stopped at a store to grab some flashlights and bottled water, then headed out into the desert on our monster hunting expedition. The way there, we were all mostly silent, with Baker in the passenger seat and my brother from another mother driving, with another of us reading a map to try and match up service roads with the map Baker had. And surprisingly, we managed to find the mine after about two hours of backtracking and arguments. The entrance had a few dilapidated buildings scattered around, what we figured would have been the main office and rest area, along with machinery that looked like pulleys for the elevator or minecarts, and some rails for said minecarts. There was also an old rusted out pickup truck parked close to what we thought would be the office, and one of the guys a car guy through and through, lamented about it, I guess to try and lighten the mood a little. We scattered around the area, looking but not knowing really what we were looking for, honestly hoping for someone else to finally take the plunge and walk into the mine itself. And wouldn't you know it, but Baker was the first one to do so. He walked over, looked the entrance over, then declared he was going in, which brought our attention back to why we were here. So, Almost single file, we marched into the mine, flashlights at the ready. The inside was littered with mining tools, laying here or there, debris like old and newer beer cans and trash, some broken down mine carts as well. We all agreed that we wouldn't be trying to descend using the elevator shaft, and instead opted to follow the rails 
further in. We did this for a bit, thanking the flashlights we had, as the sunlight died down pretty quickly past the entrance, and once we rounded the first corner, it was non-existent. The temperature also dropped a few degrees, something we were all thankful for, as it was a scorcher of a day. Every now and then we'd hear water dripping further ahead of us, so we, Baker really, decided to use that as a destination. His thinking being, if there was something down here, it would need to drink, and water dripping meant there had to be a puddle or similar close enough, so why not start there? The walls of the mine shaft had some graffiti here and there, but it didn't go too far in. We stopped seeing stuff like that about 10 minutes around the first bend that we took. One of the guys thought that was odd, as back home, he'd find graffiti all over the place in old mine shafts, even deeper ones, since people tend to use them for partying, and the further you are in, the less likely the police or game wardens are to keep going in to evict you from the place. We brushed it off, but he had a point, though none of us wanted to say that. The water would drip around every minute or so, and eventually, we found the source. A crack in the ceiling that was allowing the water to drip into an old, rusty bucket. This caught our attention, as cracks just open over conveniently placed buckets so it can catch whatever drips out. And Baker took it as a sign that something was down here. Someone in the back spoke up about maybe some teenagers had done it during a party or something. But Baker pointed out the lack of trash or graffiti in the area, which silenced him and all of us, for that matter. Baker, always the confident idiot, declared he was going deeper, since in his mind, it was obvious his uncle was telling the truth, and whatever it was just had to be a little further in. We hated him for being so goddamn right. We continued to follow the rails, eventually coming to a larger room in the shape of a circle, and from what we could see, it must have been something like a crossroads type room, where minecarts could be sent off to different parts of the mine. A few broken or rusted carts were still on some of the rails, with some pickaxes leaning against one wall, and what looked like a small office shed against another. We sort of split apart, and began looking around the area, with Baker and myself checking out the office. The inside held an old style desk and chair, a fridge, some file cabinets, with paper littering the floor. Everything was dusty as hell, and from the paperwork that I read, it just looked like somewhere they kept haul amounts and worker timesheets. Nothing interesting. Baker had rifled through the desk, finding a set of old keys on a rabbit's foot keychain, and the two of us figured they belonged to the truck up top. That's when one of the guys called out for us to come to him, so the pair of us walked out and over to where the rest of us were gathering. The guy was not down, his light aimed at the dirt floor, illuminating a set of tracks that led off down a part of the shaft that we hadn't been yet. They looked like dog prints, but longer and with an extra toe, the spacing between each print indicating that whatever had made them was long itself. We all looked at one another, and Baker had a look on his face that betrayed what he was thinking. Oh fuck, there is something down there. That was when we heard it. It sounded further down the shaft than we were all currently clustered up against. And as all of us turned our lights to peer into the darkness, the sound of a hammer cocking let us know our 38 friend had drawn his weapon. The sound we heard. What sounded like bone scraping against bare metal. Was slow. Almost like whatever was causing it was doing it to try and unnerve us. It was working. My brother from another mother was the first one to voice the opinion of us getting the fuck out of Dodge right then and there. But Baker. Fucking Baker. He wanted to at least see whatever it was. To see if it was just a normal animal or if his uncle was actually telling the truth. So he took a few slow steps into the shaft then picked up the pace. The rest of us not wanting our friend to get attacked, cussed his ass out, but we followed. 38 revolver and high power near the front and on either side of Baker. 
With each step we took, the noise got louder and more frequent, until we heard a low hissing begin from ahead of us and around a slight curve of the tunnel. We stopped as one, our nerves beginning to fray, when Baker took one more step towards the noise, and then it happened. Something pale, wrinkled, and about the size of a mastiff charged around the corner, all of our lights hitting it square on at once, which seemed to blind it for a few moments and let us all get a good look at it. Baker's uncle had not lied to us at all. Whatever it was, looked like a rat and dog had somehow crossbred, but along the way had lost all of its hair. The claws on it looked similar to a rat's, but more squared at the tips, almost like they were meant for digging. The eyes were jet black and about the size of cue balls. Its ears laid back against the head, its tail looking like one belonging to a dog with mange. It didn't stay stunned for long, but us, we were frozen, especially Baker. And that's when the thing lunged and grabbed him by his leg, and all hell broke loose. The thing began trying to drag Baker away from us, Baker kicking at it with his free leg, and our two gun friends running up to get close enough to shoot it without hitting Baker. 38 friend dumped all six rounds into the thing's hip, causing it to let Baker go and start going after him. High power friend began to fire center mass into it as two of us grabbed Baker and began to drag him away, getting its attention away from 38 friend. We heard the unmistakable click of a dry chamber as he mag dumped into it, then began cussing up a storm as he reloaded and fired some more. The thing decided that we were too much at that point and retreated back the way we came, and we chose that moment to scoop Baker up into a fireman's carry and get the fuck out of Dodge. Our ears were ringing, our blood and adrenaline were pumping hard, and we were running like madmen. Then, we heard it. The sound that thing had been making, but coming from various other mine shafts. We all turned into track stars, not wanting to be caught by a group of whatever the fuck that thing was, and soon found ourselves looking at the entrance to the mine. We spilled out into the sunlight, hoping and praying that they wouldn't follow us and made a beeline for our vehicle. At least we would have, but we had company waiting for us. Parked behind our vehicle sat three SUVs, and around those stood a ground of around 12 men in uniforms, wearing carriers and with rifles at the ready. We skidded to a stop, looking at the group, who was yelling at us to raise our hands and not try anything funny. The guy carrying Baker said that our friend needed medical assistance, and one of the men said that would be handled once they knew we weren't a threat. One of us, I can't remember who, yelled about not worrying about us, and instead, they should point the rifles into the cave, since at this point, you could still hear the hornet's nest that we kicked going off. Three of the men moved to the entrance and took position, while the rest covered us while two more began frisking us. The whole time, the one who seemed to be in charge eyed us, even more so when the revolver and high power were placed on the hood of our vehicle, and then he questioned us. Baker, thankfully, did all of the talking, probably because he was in pain and just wanted the shit to end. At the end of it all, the man called all of us idiots and said we were lucky to be alive, then ordered one of his men to begin cleaning up Baker's wound. They had taken our IDs, and while the man spoke, one of the others took photos of them before passing them back to us. He told us that we were on government property and were trespassing but that they would let us off just this once, and that they knew who we were and where we lived, so we should keep everything hush-hush if we knew what was good for us. We all agreed, and once we were given our IDs back and the two guys were returned their weapons, we sped out of that place as fast as we could. All of us were quiet on the drive back to Baker's uncle, and when he saw all of us and the bandages on Baker's leg, he said that he warned us, and called all of us stupid fucks. We spent the night there, all of us sitting around the fire 
and passing a bottle around, each of us in deep thought at what had happened. I spoke up once, telling everyone what I think we were all feeling. We should go home and forget this day and never talk about it again. The next day, we thanked his uncle for letting us stay, then piled into the vehicle and began the long drive back across country to home. We didn't stop very often, only to change Baker's bandages and were back home in three days' time, having alternated between drivers. My family asked me how the road trip was, but they could tell something had happened, though they never pushed to hear about it too hard. My little sister knows some of it, and Baker's parents as well, since his uncle called us a few months later to check on him, but outside of that, we don't speak about it to each other, at least the ones of us that are still alive. 38 friend bought the farm in Iraq. Three years later, to an IED. Baker enlisted as well, and was killed in Afghanistan about a year after 38 friend. Baker had been dead set against joining the military, but after what had happened, something changed in him. The rest of us still keep in contact with each other, and get together at least twice a year, to remember Baker and 38 friend but we never talk about that time in New Mexico. Only reason I told you all about it is because even if those men somehow find out about it, I'm dead in a few months anyway, as I have pancreatic cancer and the treatment isn't stopping it any. And y'all will appreciate the story even if most of y'all think it's fake. Just take some advice from me and don't go exploring an old mine shafts in the New Mexico desert. You might not come out, or you may end up hurt, and no one wants to die alone in a mineshaft, away from their loved ones. Hello X, I have lurked here, and on 4chan in general for a while now, and I have read many scary and disturbing stories from you guys. Well, I think that it's high time that I share my own story with X. I don't really give a rat's ass whether you believe me or not. I'm just recounting to you a nightmarish experience that me and my friends had. Here we go. Be me. American. Early 20s. About 13 years ago. Just finished getting an engineering degree at college. Relaxing in a cafe with the boys. We're all roommates, so we know each other pretty well. Me and three of our friends. Greg. Maximilian, yes, that is his name, and I'm really fucking jealous of him for that, since I think it sounds really fucking cool, and I'll be referring to him as Max occasionally. And Franklin, or Frank, what most people call him, decide to go on a bro trip. We decide on camping. We are not exactly experienced at inner woods camping, but we have gone regular camping before and enjoyed it. Decide that as we are not very experienced, we need a place to stay that is not way out there, in the event that we manage to fuck up something and need to leave. Franklin lived in New Jersey at the time. He suggests camping in the Pine Barrens. It covers a surprisingly large area, and is as remote as we are going to get, considering our budget and where we live, Frank explains. The rest of us agree that the place sounds good. We start to plan out the trip. Decide that we need to go during summer or fall as a cold camping trip would suck ass. Maximilian proposes that instead of camping at some basic bitch campsite with like two other people, why not just go hiking? Find a suitable clearing off the trail and camp there for three or four days. We all like this idea. Greg says that his cousin could drop us off and pick us up, as we would not really have a place to buck a car for several days while we romp around in the woods. Fast forward a few days later. We have the trip all planned out, for the most part. Gonna be out there for four days and three nights, leaving on Friday and returning on Monday. Greg's cousin will drop us off at the edge of the woods. Rendezvous with his cousin at the intersection of Long Island Expressway and Wading River Road on the fourth day. We have the following. A one-shot twenty-two rifle for each of us. Additionally, Maximilian has a 45 ACP 1911, and Frank has a revolver, 38 or 22, 
I can't remember which. Camping essentials. I'd rather not waste time describing them all. I think Greg brought a fishing rod, a few changes of clothes. We decided against bringing our girlfriends, as Greg had just broken up with his, and we didn't want him to feel alone. And the other ones were not too crazy about spending several nights in a woods. Fast forward to the Friday. I have my shit packed and ready to go. At like 10 or 11 a.m., Greg's cousin pulls up to our house in a dark green Plymouth minivan. We toss our stuff in the back and head off. It was like an hour and a half drive from the house to where we would get dropped off. For the sake of brevity, I will refer to Greg's cousin as Carl. Carl seems like a pretty cool guy. He graduated uni a few years before we did. The drive there is fun. We mainly talk about what we are going to do, where we are going to hike, and where we are going to eat. Fast forward to us driving along the forest's edge. Check for officers. Area secure.jpg. We pull off to the side of the road that we are on. Unpack and hop out. Wave and say goodbye to Greg's cousin. Head off into the woods. We plan on hiking for a few hours until we find a good clearing. Hike a mile or two into the woods. It has been pretty nice so far. Little amounts of trash. Seen a few chipmunks and squirrels. Hear the birds singing. We definitely heard a few woodpeckers. We reach a clearing. It's roughly 45 or 50 feet in diameter. Worst part of it was the poison ivy patch on the northeast edge of the clearing. We made sure to avoid this area. Here is a pic of the area. Pic related. We set up our tents in the area. We then build a fire pit and gather firewood. Because why do that at night? Do you want a sprained ankle from tripping on some branch? After setting up home base, we decide to hike some more and plink some targets. Hike is going nicely. See some geese flying in the distance in their familiar V formation. Unfortunately, see a few plastic bottles in some bushes. Sort of depressing and annoying. We can see some fucking Jewel Osco grocery bag stuck in a tree. We aren't exactly Al Gore, but something about being so far into the woods and still seeing some lazy fuckers trash really annoyed us. Frank is somewhat good at climbing, so he decides to climb up there and pull it down. Sets his pack on the ground and begins the climb. The plastic bag is about 15 above the ground. It takes Frank about 3 minutes to get it. Oh fuck, he yells. What is it? You okay? Yeah, I'll tell you once I get down. Frank untangles the bag from the branches that it was caught on and jumps back down to us. I saw some fucked up animal up there, he says. What was it? A fucked up raccoon, bro. Shit, like, how fucked up? Its head was mashed in and the chest was torn open, with all the ribs looking broken. Also, it smelled like burnt rubber. That's fucking gross. You didn't touch it, did you? It might have had some weird disease. Oh shit. I hadn't even considered that. Well, did you? No, but I'm gonna put some hydrogen peroxide on my hands just to be safe. What do you think did it? My guess is that some hawk was carrying it, dropped it, got it back, and was in the middle of eating it when we showed up. It probably got scared and flew a safe distance away. Sounds about right. Anyway... What was your plan with the plastic bag, now that you're stuck with it? I hadn't thought of what I'm supposed to do with it. It's not like there's a dumpster nearby. Just put it in your back pocket and let's get back to hiking. We've dicked around here for long enough, and I don't want to be hiking to camp in the dark. Sure thing. We continue on our hike. Some quick info. Since I live in the suburbs, I'm used to seeing a bunch of fat and slow squirrels and chipmunks that only run if you are right next to them. So it's always sort of a weird experience for me to go in a woods and see timid, skinny squirrels and how rarely you see them compared to the suburbs. So I was already feeling a bit weird due to how far I was out of my environment. I told myself that everything was fine and that any weird feeling or concerns of mine were just from living around many humans and technology. I know that was worded kind of badly, but you get what I mean. I'm including this because I figure that it would be helpful to know more about my state of mind and attitude towards spoopy fields in the woods. Anyway, back to the story. We are marching along. 
see the sun just beginning to set. Tell the boys, and we start to head back. Head back the same way that we came. We don't want to get lost. By now, the sky has that orange-yellow hue to it that you sometimes get as the sun sets. It was quite pretty, to be honest. We are passing the tree that Frank pulled the plastic bag from. Greg trips on a large root that was protruding from the ground. He falls face first, as his hands were in his pockets. Gigakek, that JPEG. He stands himself back up. I'm about to ask if he is okay, when I see a large, reddish-brown stain on his jacket that wasn't there before. The fuck is that? I ask. Huh? Maximilian says. Greg looks down at his jacket, sees the stain, and starts freaking out. The fuck is this? Fuck! I just got this two weeks ago with Sarah, he yelled. Sarah was his girlfriend at the time. Solid 8 out of 10. Maximilian grabs a longish stick and pokes at where Greg fell, pushes a few leaves out of the way, exposing the corpse of a possum. The corpse was not a fresh one. The thing had its chest ripped open, with maggots all over it. Surprisingly, there was no noticeable smell. Seeing that the corpse was full of maggots, Greg was starting to go crazy. He ripped off the jacket while screaming. Fucking God, ugh! I've got the fucking little grub fuckers on me. Fuck, 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 damn it! Or something similar. Greg began to swing his jacket into some tree, probably in an attempt to get the maggots and the blood off. Frank grabs a wad of dry leaves and handed them to Greg. Use this and try and wash off as much of the scum as you can. The fuck is a handful of leaves gonna fucking do? I need a fucking scrub brush and a hose. Greg bugs at him. Hey asshole, shut the fuck up. Frank is just trying to fucking help you. And for right now, that's the best cleaning supplies you can hope to get your hands on. We're in the middle of the goddamn woods, remember? I yell. Greg is about to fire a retort when Maximilian chimes in. Anon has a point, Greg. You'll have to wait till we get back to our campsite before you can actually wash it. So I'm going crazy over a bit of blood. We're here to relax and celebrate a graduation, remember? Yelling at each other and screeching about a bit of fucking gunk isn't exactly my idea of relaxing. Greg is able to get most of it off, but there was still a fist-sized, reddish-brown spot. We resume our hike back, with most of the sunlight gone. This inspires us to move at a much faster pace since trying to find your way through unfamiliar woods at night is almost fucking hopeless, and we can't just set up camp, as all of our sleeping gear was back at the clearing. Thankfully, we reach the clearing after roughly 30 minutes, and don't get lost in the woods at night. Maximilian gets the fire started, as me and Frank get the food out. Greg is trying to remove the possum blood with some dish soap, paper towels, and some of the distilled water we brought with us. Max asks us what food we packed. Me and Frank take turns announcing each thing we packed as we pull them out. Jerky. Uh, refried beans. Uh, spam. The magical fruit. Wait, what? The magical fruit, Frank answers. You know, beans. Greg, who must have been listening to us, adds in. I have literally never heard a sane person refer to baked beans as the magical fruit. Why do you call it that? It doesn't even look like it could be a fruit. My dad and his side of the family, they have a goofy little song that they sing when they're eating beans. Frank responds, who wants to hear it? I egg him on saying, sure dude, who wouldn't want to hear some hillbilly song about eating them? I'm not a hillbilly dick. Do you want to hear it or not? Yeah. Okay then, Frank says. Here it is. Beans, beans, the magical fruit. The more you eat, the more you toot. The more you toot, the better you feel, so I have beans with every meal. What you think? Funny? Maximilian speaks first. I wouldn't say that was high-class humor, but I did find it funny to imagine you and like five of a grown-ass men singing that at the dinner table. By the way, Frank is pretty buff, and so are all the other guys in his family. So the image of like six buff men singing The More You Toot is absurd enough for me and my guys to get a keck out of the song. We all enjoy a good hearty keck, and Franklin seems quite pleased with himself. The meal we decide on 
just so happens to be baked beans. Max yells that it's dinner time. The rest of us head over, grab a plate, Max serves us our share, and we sit down on some large rocks. Frank immediately goes, and a one, and a two, and a three. We all break into song, sort of in unison. We all cheer with completion of our badly synchronized recital and begin to consume our dish. Ayo, this dude eating beans, dot pdf. In the middle of our ritual of the consumption of the big beans, a loud shriek tears through the woods. I don't really know how to describe it since I don't hear animal cries where I live, but rest assured, it was really fucking loud and was more painful to hear than being in a room full of people scratching their nails across the chalkboard. What the hell was that? Was that some sort of animal's death screech? I asked my friends. I've heard the screams of dying animals before, and that sounded nothing like one. It was too loud for a dying animal to make. You'd have to be sitting right next to the animal for that kind of volume, Greg tells me. <laughs> Whatever it was, it made me drop my plate, Max groans. I glance over at the ground in his direction. Poor dude's plate landed upside down, and none of his beans survived. Greg offers some of his, and the problem is solved. They all resume their meals like nothing happened, while I sit stunned. What, that's it? None of you are even the slightest bit concerned or even curious? None of you have the slightest clue to what that was, so you guys have decided to ignore it? I guess so. What were you planning to do? Go into the woods at night and try and figure out the source of a scary loud noise, replies Frank. Well, no, but... Then do your best to ignore it. We can sleep on shifts if you want. You can sleep on shifts. I want to get a good night's sleep, adds in Greg. Okay. You sure you're fine with this, Frank? I say. Yes, I am. Stop squealing about it before I change my mind, he answers. I shut up and finish my meal. Frank rolled up a couple of logs around the campfire. We head over and begin to talk around the campfire. We are sharing stories about college. As Maximilian and Greg are telling us about a shitty professor they both had, I look over at Frank. He's staring wide-eyed, past Max and Greg, deep into the woods. I follow his line of sight, and it takes a minute or two before I notice them. The hair on the back of my neck goes straight up, and I get goosebumps on my skin. I can see a pair of two yellow-orange eyes about 20 yards away. I'm not exactly able to tell how high off the ground they are. Max and Greg, noticing that no one is listening to them and are instead looking into the forest, ask us what the fuck is so interesting. Right as they say this, something makes a really loud snort slash grunt. This is followed by a long growl, like a large dog's growl, but deeper, louder, and far more menacing. I get up and realize how big this thing must be. The eyes are at my eye level, and I'm six foot four. Max and Greg, who are the closest to the edge of the clearing, bolt off of their logs and get to our side of the campfire. Frank snaps out of his gaze and grabs his revolver. He stands and aims it at the eyes, yelling at it to fuck off. The rest of us dart over to our tents and retrieve our guns and spare ammo. I load mine. We get in a line. We aim. Frank says, on the count of three, fire. One, two, three. Don't fire it till you see the whites of their eyes. Exe. Fire. We shoot in semi unison. We can't hear if we hit anything because multiple guns firing at once in close proximity on an otherwise quiet night is really fucking loud. Once I regain my full senses, I no longer see the eyes. Fuck. I don't know whether to be relieved or feel more concerned. What the fuck was that thing, says someone. Whatever that was, it's gone now. Okay, Anon. It looks like you've got your wish. We're definitely sleeping in shifts tonight. If we sleep at all. We all reload and set up a sort of perimeter. Kay would not be proud. We just cleared out all that would block our field of view. Basically, all vegetation or rocks over six inches were cleared. 
we use the logs to make a barrier-ish thing. This barricade served more purpose for our own feeling of safety. It did not really serve any realistic purpose of defense. The forest is now dead quiet. Shit is really creepy. Here is our plan. One sleeps while three are awake. One man has the 1911, one man has the revolver, and the other guy has the 422 rifles. The second a person sees something, yellow or orange in the woods, they immediately fire a warning shot into the air to wake the other boys up and hopefully scare it off. Me, Frank, and Greg take the first shift. All is well. Second shift is me, Max, and Greg. At some point, Greg gets more spooked by what he says is some shuffling in the woods. He fires at it. Me and Max nearly jump out of our skin. Frank wakes up. We are pissed at Greg, but nothing else happened that night. Fast forward to the morning. We hastily pack up. We immediately go back the way we think we came, as we will somewhat have an idea of how far we must go. Greg says that he is going to check on the area that he shot at last night. We tell him to wait a few minutes so that the rest of us can go with him, for safety reasons. About five minutes later, we are fully packed, and head over to the area. We are looking around for signs that show that there was some sort of animal here last night. Max shouts out for us to have a look at what he found. There is a distinct trail of hoof prints. They were not deer tracks. These were bigger and were cloven. My blood runs cold. Greg is pleased to see that he was correct to fire. Max reminds him that if this was a human, he would be feeling otherwise. Frank says that maybe this was from a cow or a horse. I tell him that these woods are not a good environment for a fully grown cow, and that it would have been much louder last night if it was a horse that Greg shot at. Greg shuts up. We are all thoroughly spooked and decide to get the fuck out. We begin our trip back to the highway. Our plan is to get to the highway before sundown and then try to hitch a ride. We make sure that our guns are loaded and head off. We are hiking through the undergrowth as fast as possible now. We aren't the fittest people, so we are not moving very fast. However, the hike back is very different from the hike to here. Landmarks are different, or look different, or not there at all. Fallen logs that I remember to be covered in mushrooms are instead covered in thick layers of moss. This may not sound scary or disturbing, but when you are trying to get the fuck out of the woods, and you think that there may or not be an animal stalking you, it is different. These differences in the landmarks and environments throw us off a bit. At roughly noon, we realize that we do not know where we're going. Greg starts to freak out. We all start to freak out. Like the morons that we were, we did not think to bring any sort of flares. It takes the four of us like 30 minutes to get our shit together. Thankfully, me and Frank had packed compasses. When we entered the woods, we went northeast. We decide that our best option is to go straight south. About a half hour after devising the new plan, Frank spots a half-eaten deer. The deer has had its stomach torn open. Intestines aren't visible. Its thighs have been mostly consumed. Its eyes are also eaten. This creeps us out more, but we aren't too concerned by it, since Frank suggested that it was left behind by some coyotes. But I didn't believe that, not for a second. I don't think that the other guys noticed this, but like 20 yards past the deer carcass, I saw four of her dead, half-eaten deer. At least one of them was a buck with a full rack of antlers. I chose not to tell them, as I believe that more fear will not help us escape the woods. I was probably right to do so. Unfortunately for us, that first deer was not the only carcass that the group of us came across. Every 10 to 15 minutes, we would come across a new animal corpse. More deer, birds, rabbits, and squirrels. All are partially eaten. All have the same parts of them eaten as the first deer. Each corpse we find only adds to our anxiety and fear, but we still tell ourselves that it's probably just a pack of coyotes. 
This possibility brings us a sense of security. However, it's only a small sense of security. That was until we found a coyote. It's half eaten, just like the others. Judging from what was left of the creature, it was healthy and muscular. This shatters our theory that coyotes were responsible for all of the dead animals. I don't know very much about coyotes, but I don't see why a pack would just turn on one, kill it, and then eat it in the same fashion as every other animal. Max is the first to put two and two together. The dude goes pale. It takes a second or two for the rest of us to catch on. Oh, fuck me. This epiphany shatters our last nerves. We break into a full sprint in the direction that we have been hiking in. This part is sort of a blur of sticks hitting my face, thorny plants scratching my skin, and sheer panic. I have no idea how long we ran for, but when we stopped running and regrouped, my watch said 4.45pm. We have two hours before sunset. Thankfully, no one got separated or hurt themselves during our mad dash, so we are good to go. We recheck our orientation with the compasses and continue our trek south. We are no longer finding dead animals, which puts our mind more at ease. We start to believe that the worst is over. How fucking wrong we were. The next half hour is mundane, with the most action being Greg almost tripping and falling into a poison ivy patch. It was actually kind of relaxing to just hike through the woods, believing the illusion in that it's safe. But after that calm half hour, shit hit the fan. And fast. Max was the first to notice it. He whispers at the rest of us to stay quiet. We should up and hear it. The distant beating of wings. If you have ever been close to a large bird when it's flying, then you have an idea of what it sounded like. Only problem was, there were no birds in sight. Hide, Max whispers. Each of us scramble for a bush or a log to hide under. We are dead quiet. It takes what felt like hours for the sounds of wings to dissipate, but it was probably only 20 minutes. The fuck was that? Greg asks. I have no idea, but whatever it was, my guess is that it was responsible for all of those dead animals. Frank responds. And let's not be its next meal. We resume our journey yet again, but this time we are all on high alert. We freeze every time a branch snaps, or a squirrel rustles through the trees, or a woodpecker drills a hole. We are moving a lot slower, and it is getting closer and closer to sundown. Nothing really happens for a while. At 6.30, we stop to catch our breath. Orange is starting to appear on the horizon. I check my compass, and we are still on track. We decide on what to do. No one wants to stay another night in the woods, but Max and Greg are against hiking through unknown terrain at night, while me and Frank are convinced that if we don't continue on, we are going to be a midnight snack for the thing that killed off all of those other animals. Unfortunately, this took a grand total of 15 minutes for us to decide, and the sky is orange from the sunset. After 25 minutes, the only light is from the moon, which is very bright, as there were few clouds, and an old oil lantern that Greg brought with. So we are now walking in a single file line, with Greg leading the way, like a bunch of kindergartners. And it's here where shit hits the fan. Greg asks, Hey guys, is it raining? There are literally no clouds in the sky, and we tell him so. Then why am I feeling water dripping onto me? He asks, as he shines the light of the lantern into the trees. Why did God leave us, Dapedia? The light illuminates the face of the ugliest and most terrifying thing I have ever seen. It's a cross of a goat and a horse in shape, with bright yellow goat eyes, but without any fur. It opens its mouth and roars the same roar we heard last night, but a thousand times louder. Its gums are black, its tongue is pink, and like that of a dog, and its teeth are almost as yellow as its eyes. The thing's canines were at least an inch and a half long. Its chin has a few dark brown or black hairs, 
the rest of it is not illuminated enough to make out. It catches all of us by surprise. For one long ass second, we all look on in a mixture of shock, fear, and awe. Then our fight or flight instincts kick in and we bolt. It roars again and takes flight. In the distance, we see the streetlights of a road and run even faster. I'm crying like a bitch with my tears from joy and fear. We make it to the road and continue running down it. Max is ahead of everyone. I'm behind him. Frank is behind me. Greg is behind Frank. But then Greg trips, stumbles for a second and face plants. I screech to a halt and turn around and get a good look at the thing for the first time. Unless I get Alzheimer's or dementia, I will never forget the sight of that abomination approaching my friend. It's a massive beast, and it has the same kind of muscle tone as a Russian powerlifter. It has the body of a hairless horse, and is covered in scars of all different sizes and shapes. Some look like the scars of a knife wound, but others look more like bullet holes. Its skin is a putrid pinkish red color. It has the hind legs of a horse, but instead of having four legs, it has a pair of massive, muscular, human arms with human hands. The nails of the hands are at least an inch long, sharp looking, and black in color. It has a long, rat-like tail. I'd estimate a length of roughly seven to eight feet, with a few sparse patches of dark brown or black hair. The abomination is at least 20 feet long, and six feet at the shoulder. Its neck is like a foot long, but probably like two feet in diameter. I now notice the long, semi-curved horns protruding from its head, like those of a goat. You probably know what I'm talking about now, and if you don't, it's the Jersey Devil. It touches down on all fours, like 30 or 40 feet in front of Greg. Greg fires his twenty-two and hits it square in the chest. It does not acknowledge being shot at all. It walks on all fours and reaches for Greg, who is in the middle of reloading his rifle. I don't want this fucking thing eating my friend. I call it some racial slurs, can't remember which. Slide the bolt into place. I take aim. Pull the trigger and fire. I hit it right next to its eye. This it notices. It rears up on its hind legs, clutching its eye and roaring louder than the police siren. Roar is different this time. It's still loud and deep, but now it also has the sound of a dying cat. Frank and Max stop running and see the predicament that me and Greg are in. They draw their rifles and fire at it, drop the rifles, draw their handguns, and sprint over to where I am. This only seems to anger the beast more, and it grabs Greg. Greg screams in pain, and several audible snaps are heard. Max and Frank shoot at its torso. It throws Greg into a light post and begins to advance on us, and we back up. I see something behind it. A light? I squint my eyes. It's a cop car. I'm hoping that he can call back up or help us shoot it. As the monster quickens in its pace, the cop arrives. To everyone's surprise, the car slams into the monster. The monster is sent sprawling. Two cops exit the vehicle and pull out very shiny lever-action rifles and start to shoot it. It screams like it did when I hit it in the head and contorts its body in pain each time one of the cops fires another round into it. We get the idea and join in the shooting. At some point, the abomination must have decided that we were not worth the pain got up on all fours and ran into the woods. After we were sure that it had left, the three of us run over to check on Greg. We make sure that he is still alive. He is. And then me, Max, and Frank talk to the cops. What in the hell was that? Max asks. They act as if he said nothing. You boys sure are lucky that the two of us were driving down the road. One of the cops, a blonde chubby guy says, those rabid bucks are violent as hell, and a damn sure menace with their antlers. You were not packing anywhere near enough firepower. Me and Frank are about to call his lie, but the other cop, an older-looking man, gives us a death stare. 
that shuts us up. The only thing that you ever saw attack your friend was a large buck with a bad case of rabies, he flatly says. Nothing else. The cop gets an ambulance for Greg and took us to the hospital. Greg had fractured his tailbone, broken several ribs, and broke his right shoulder blade. No one at the hospital asks us what happened after we tell them that it was a rabid buck. Frank calls up Greg's cousin and explains the scenario, minus the monster. The rest of us were fine, minus bruises and scratches. And there you have it. Greg recovered, though he will never be as fit or capable as he used to be. The four of us still keep in touch, as our only validation that this was real, that this really did happen, is the fact that we know what we saw, and that we all saw the same thing. I am the only one of us who still enjoys hiking, but that is probably because I live in Colorado, far away from New Jersey or the Pine Barrens. But every once in a while, if I have an exceptionally bad day at work, or go to sleep very stressed, it visits me in my dreams, chasing me and my friends through the woods and down that road. Things in my life have been pretty crazy in my life recently, X, and I thought I might share since I've heard stories from here. I don't really expect anyone here to believe me, and that's fine. This is intended to be mainly therapeutic to me. I want to tell at least someone what's happening to me. I lived near an old patch of woods in North America when I was about 12. When I say old, I mean primordial old. Shit lives in there that you never knew existed. I lived in a little town at the end of a dead end lane before people started moving in and making changes to the town. I had three friends that I always hung out with over vacations and during the summer. We didn't all go to the same school, but we lived in the same town, Taylor, Josh, Pepper, and me. The woods were kind of ours. Nobody went or goes into the woods. There are no roads that went through them, and it was just better to avoid them unless you were really young, stupid, or high. Sometimes, a neighboring farmer's animal would get lost in the woods. And though attempts would be made to find it, rarely any animals were ever found. If they were, they usually died of shock shortly thereafter. I can detail the sorts of things we found in the woods, but that might be for later. The shit we found was pretty awesome. But in the summer of 98, something happened that I can't really remember. Pep, Taylor, and Josh, and I went into the woods and apparently were kidnapped. We spent nearly 48 hours in there, but I can hardly remember anything. Here's what I can remember. At around 5 o'clock in the evening in August, we all met at the end of the lane where we usually did, before we headed off to play. Because it was before the time of reliable contact with parents, my mom gave me her watch and told me to remember to be back in by 7. We were all a little nervous because people were saying a prowler was living in the woods, and they'd seen him around town, and we were pretty certain we'd seen him too, though I don't remember actually seeing him. I remember running into the woods behind Pep and Taylor. Josh was fastest, and he was already over the fence and into the woods. We must have gone into the fort we found. It was probably the remnants of an old house, but it was pretty unrecognizable to us. I remember hearing something crashing in the woods, and Josh asking if we heard it too. I remember telling Pepper she should stay put, and we would go and check it out. After that, I don't remember anything. After 48 hours, and our parents and people in the town were launching a search for us. They found me in a place they'd already looked. I was backed up into a large oak tree, standing alone in a clearing in the woods. I wasn't wearing shoes, and there were long, bloody gashes on my back and legs. They never found Pep, Josh, or Taylor. A hunter found one of Pep's barrettes some years later, buried under pine needles. He said he'd only seen it because he'd been up in a stand, and he had seen a glint from below him. Some college kids found an old cache of our stuff, 
that we must have left in a kind of burrow. It really troubles me that I can't remember more of what happened, and the stuff that I do remember, the therapist told me, are probably false memories. I want to share some of these with you, if anyone is interested. Alrighty. I remember the Willow Man. He was tall, thin, and had a laugh like thunder. I remember seeing him in the trees, moving so fast we could hardly see him. The day we disappeared, we didn't see him at all, but other days we would see him mostly in the summer. I always wondered why. Maybe because he was harder to spot in the foliage? You could always tell he was there though, because he moved differently from the rest of the trees. We tried telling our parents about him. Mine were alarmed at the thought of a strange person in the woods. Pep's parents, who were very Christian, thought he was either A, a devil, or B, someone trying to scare us. Josh didn't bother telling his folks. He liked to pretend he was more adult than the rest of us, and Taylor only had a mom who was usually out working alone on one of her free jobs. Some people believed about the Willow Man, though. Some people even knew he was there. If we saw him, we didn't stick around. He never seemed to do anything except stand, watching you, about 30 feet or so away, swaying like a tree. To be honest, that summer, we were a little obsessed with the Willow Men. We always knew he was there, but I remember Josh making it his life's mission to find the Willow Men that summer. The rest of us regarded the Willow Man the way you would usually think about a monster in your closet. You were pretty sure he was there, but you didn't have any real proof, except that you were scared as hell. So the summer began with us looking for places the Willow Man could be. This turned out to be pretty stupid. We automatically assumed he would be in dangerous, hard to access, or creepy places. In the woods, there were frequently old, abandoned buildings. Another town used to be next to ours about 200 years ago and had been since consumed by the woods. What happened to the people in the next town and why did it not exist anymore? They probably all moved out into other surrounding towns, but we like to think that the Willow Man had gotten them. You could still find old cobblestone paths peppered throughout the woods and if you followed them, you could trace the outlines of the old towns. We decided that the town's graveyard and what we decided was a cheese factory were the most likely places for the Willow Man to be. I think we quickly decided that the graveyard was a wash. I remember going there one evening and finding a few graves and the dozen or so that were there were empty. While unsettling and creepy, Taylor, Pep, and I didn't take this to be obvious evidence of the Willow Man's movements, but Josh thought otherwise. He was sure it was the Willow Man's work. He had either dug their bodies back up, or these were graves where the people were dead, but no one ever found their bodies. I remember spending a few weeks of sleepless nights, waking up and looking into the woods after that, to make sure the Willow Man hadn't followed me home. The cheese factory was a little different. I can't remember what happened there very well, either, but I remember running and falling out of the woods with Pep and Taylor. I remember we thought we had lost Josh in the factory, but he showed up cranky and pissed that we left him when we had stopped to hop across the town's old cistern. I don't remember any of this happening, but I know whoever we had seen in the cheese factory hadn't been Josh. The old town was generally where we spent the first few weeks looking for the Willow Man. There honestly wasn't that much to explore, since it was all run down and before the advent of electricity. There was also a sort of watchtower made of wood somewhere in the center of the woods. While you might think that we were trespassing, this thing was as old as dirt, hewn from whole trees by probably axes and held together by old, rusty metal nails. It was the most curious construction. Josh decided around the end of May that it was originally built by the old townsfolk to keep a lookout for the Willow Man, and decided in keeping of our forefathers' traditions, we should use it to do the same. 
We planned to have a sleepover in it, in fact. I remember lying straight-faced to my parents about sleeping over at Josh's. We all did, in fact, except Josh. We all snuck into the woods at around five and climbed up the watchtower. It was close enough to the village that I could see the town fire hall, right at the edge of the woods. The watchtower wasn't that tall, maybe 15 feet or so, and it had a great ladder that we discovered could be pulled up through a lever system. We didn't manage to spend the whole night. At around 8, we started hearing this aggravated breathing and crashing through the undergrowth, and then this long moaning. It could have just been someone who was high or drunk, but we spent another hour sweating out the noises before we got too scared and booked it out of the woods. It didn't seem like anything pursued us, but when we went back to the tower the next day, the crackers, fruit snacks, and soda we had brought had been torn through and strewn around the clearing. That part right there scared me more than anything else in the whole ordeal. I think it might be worth telling you that the woods don't belong to anyone. I think it's a state park now, or something, or a preserve or something like that. In any case, no one can use it for foresting, except for growth management every once in like five years or something. As a side note, after the kidnapping, my family moved away from the town for about a decade. We didn't sell the house or anything. We lived with my mom's parents, in the next town over, for a while, before moving out to Seattle for a few years. When I was about 18, we moved back into our old home. I didn't and still don't remember what happened, so going back home didn't feel that traumatic for me. I felt like Pep, Josh, and Taylor are still here. I still do feel that way, to a certain extent. I just don't know where they are, or what happened to them. Your feeling of them still being there is probably due to you not being there to let it sink in that they were gone, and the sudden return of all the old feelings of the town brought that one too. Does anyone have any idea what this thing might be? Anyone heard similar stories or know of any myths? I'm interested now. You're probably right. It still doesn't feel real. I keep expecting them to just show up. In any case, after the watchtower, we found something like a burrow further into the woods. There were three rocks, two propped up and one on top, leading down to a hole in the ground. At first, we were distracted, thinking it was an animal's den or something. But after shining flashlights, tossing in noisemakers, and finally crawling in, we discovered it was actually a deserted cave. There was a rank, rotten smell there, more human than animal. It's weird that I remember it to this day, or maybe I only remember remembering. There were things around the burrow that made you almost think a person lived there. There was a little hole where water dripped down from the ceiling and made a kind of water dish. In the corner, there were old magazines and the ends of gnawed bones. We were puzzled as to what to think of it. We figured it was probably some hobos or college kids, but then Josh decided this was where the willow man took the people he stole and kept them here before they disappeared forever. Taylor chipped in, figured he ate them, but we all knew that wasn't true. The Willow Man didn't eat people. That was just stupid. It took a few days to sufficiently stake out the burrow. In fact, it took about two weeks before we moved on from it, figuring it to be a bust. Nothing ever happened while we were there, so we figured it was safe enough to use for ourselves, and we decided to keep different Willow Man hunting odds and ends there. At one point, we ended up stashing a whole Coleman tent in there, but it ended up getting shredded to hell in the end of July, which was when we decided to stop using the burrow. Besides, we were pretty sure someone else was trying to use it too. When we would visit the burrow, sometimes our stuff would have been gone through, or sometimes missing. Occasionally, there would be drag marks outside the opening of the cave, which creeped us out more than anything. A lot of the other shit is pretty surreal, and probably didn't happen. For example, I remember seeing the Willow Man 
outside of my house, where the woods meets my lawn, clinging to the tree closest to my house and staring into my room. He would reach up and scrape the window to my room with his fingers and whisper, Come play. And I would scream and scream, and no one would come for me. And over time, I remember playing in the treehouse in my yard next to the woods with Pep. We were playing a card game, I think Uno, when we heard the snuffling against the side of the treehouse, like a dog had gotten up there. We both froze, and it continued until it reached the entrance of the treehouse, when we heard something digging into the wood, like an animal scrabbling to get in. We both started screaming in terror, and eventually my dad showed up, but he acted like nothing was wrong. He just popped his head up into the treehouse and asked if we wanted sandwiches for lunch. I think I mentioned before how keyed we were before we disappeared in August. It was kind of like that for the whole summer. Josh became increasingly more irritable and moody, and Taylor would space out and not hear things right away. Pep became kind of skittish and hung around me for comfort. At first, you might think this was just some normal prepubescent stuff, but the change was so sudden and radical that it stood out like a sore thumb. Pep's mom was even threatening to send her to a psychiatrist. We all started suffering from sleepless nights, and when we could sleep, we all had nightmares. I got to the point when I wasn't with my friends, I would just lay listlessly around the house, and I remember hearing this one song around then, just this one little snippet, and it keeps playing on repeat in my head, like a little bit of carnival music. I almost think I hear it when we were out in the woods somewhere. Like I mentioned, I can't remember the day I disappeared entirely clearly, but I do remember snippets. One of the most disturbing things I remember is kneeling on my knees on a wide piece of stone, bedrock I think, with my hands up in front of me, holding something. I don't remember what this was. I also remember being gagged, I think, or something being forced into my mouth. But the first thing after I do remember, after these little splintery memories, is waking up in a hospital room. It took me ages to be convinced that Pep, Josh, and Taylor were missing. After a while, people started saying they were dead. But I knew better. When we moved out, I still knew better. And I know better to this day. Which takes us to the present day. I am 25. I have my own place in town but I frequently crash with my parents because I'm a giant pussy. As I type, I am in my old room in my parents' house, in fact, and I think the Willow Man is back. At some point, I'll come back and tell you all the other weird little things we found in the woods when I was younger, but I want to get what's happening to me right now off my chest. It started a few months back, right before winter started. I was taking the four-wheeler out just for something to do. I only have a part-time job, so I have some free time. And just as I was about to start it, I saw something glinting just past the start of the woods. The woods by now have become something that is only vaguely frightening. Like hearing about something in an urban legend. But when I saw that glinting, like winking in the woods, I began to have a small panic attack. I couldn't identify why I was so scared. But I knew, if I went and looked, I was going to find something that I didn't want to. And yet, against my better judgment, I left the four-wheeler and went to the woods. And though it had only been about 100 feet from where I was standing, it seemed to take forever to get to where the woods began. It had been a pretty fresh, breezy day then, but the woods were still in calm, with almost no wind moving through. But then, the woods were always like that and you can't judge what the weather is like when you're in them. They look so much different from when I played in them when I was a kid. There's lots more undergrowth now behind my property, and it just seemed quieter. No birds, no squirrels, nothing. Just the sound of wind. And where had the thing been that I'd seen flashing at me in the underbrush? I was torn between going further in to investigate and standing just where the woods began because I was terrified. But before I could decide to do either, 
the trees had moved a bit in the wind, and the thing blazed up at me like a tiny beacon. It startled me so much that I jumped back before I could even see what it had been. I had stood frozen where I was before I bent down to check it out. It was just uncovered under a little pile of dead foliage and mallow. It was an X-Men trading card that kept catching in the sun and reflecting back at me, the holographic kind that were popular back in the 90s. This one had Wolverine on it, thrusting his claws at you. It had been Josh's. I tried rationalizing to myself, because the last place it had been was my treehouse, and then in the watchtower in the woods, but I figured it could just have basically migrated, like basically everything in the woods does, but it had been so shiny and untouched by the elements, I knew this wasn't true. In the end, I could not pick it up. I felt like it was a trap, so I turned around and went back inside, leaving the four-wheeler out and getting a lecture from my dad later. When I checked back in the evening later that day to see if the card was still there, it had disappeared. I know I didn't imagine it, and it felt like a trap. It's in northern New York, but that's all I'm going to say. I've been finding different things on the edge of the woods since then, but I haven't gotten the balls to go in and check it out. When there was still no snow cover, I found an empty bottle of lemonade. The label was sun-bleached and faded, and something I remember from being a kid. A compass. Something of Josh's that he had been exceedingly proud of, and we'd used to try to triangulate where the Willow Man would be, unsuccessfully. And a metal ball with tiny little dents in the surface, like an animal had been chewing on it. The last one I have no idea what to make of, but it seems familiar to me somehow. I have no idea how these things keep coming back to me, but it's been frightening me, to say the least. I've been trying to ignore the edge of the woods lately, because the snow cover is gone again, but I'm afraid there was something there, waiting for me. Back again, everyone. Sorry I came back and left so suddenly last night. Some weird shit happened to me. I was headed out my door for work, and I had my phone ready and aimed at the woods to take some pictures when I saw something flash past the viewfinder really fast, so my heart was in my mouth. It appeared to be bipedal and human height or taller, and woods colored, brown, but I told myself it was a deer. So, I turned and walked down my driveway, and started down the street, happily. The street leads me away from the woods. So when I walked through town to get to my job, I managed to shake off a good portion of my fear. When I finally got to the library and was rounding the side of the building to use the back door, I stopped. The library is attached to a fire hall, which, if you recall, is pressed flush to the woods. I remember looking into the woods and seeing something, and the next thing I remember is kneeling on my knees facing my own backyard at five o'clock in the evening. Once again, I didn't have any shoes. My feet were bare and my wrists had pieces of twine tied around them. I didn't have my phone, my personal effects, nothing. So I just kind of wandered into the house, which was warm but empty. I sat down at the kitchen table for I don't know how long, before I started to crave some sort of human interaction and came on here just to know I wasn't the only person in the universe. Then I went to bed. My mom woke me up about 10-ish, asking me if I was okay, and that the library had been calling me, asking where I was, because I didn't show up for work. I might have alarmed her a little bit, because we ended up going to the hospital again. I haven't been feeling really well since then. Everything hurts, and somehow, I've got all these bruises on me. Guys, sorry, I left and didn't return until now. I keep getting fucked with lately. I left work yesterday and got waylaid by Josh's mom. I spent the entire day with her yesterday, and she doesn't have a computer. She was freaking out, for some reason, about wondering where Josh was and if I'd seen him lately. It's been a long while, and she never started showing signs of crazy. 
I was hoping this was just some sort of minor break because of stress. To make her feel better, I spent the day and part of the night with her too. About three in the morning, I woke up. I was sleeping in the living room to hear taps on the patio door. Josh's family have this giant German shepherd, and it's smart enough to claw at the door when it can see someone and wants in. So, half awake, I went to the door, only to find nothing on the other side of the glass. I kind of stood there, stupidly for a while, staring into their backyard, before I saw something glinting in the yard. And then I realized something was staring back at me, or thought there was. There were these two little red lights, winking on and off in the mid-horizon. I tried figuring out if they were possibly cell towers, but then they moved off to their side yard, and I tried convincing myself it was some sort of animal. I huddled back onto the couch. The dog had jumped up, so it had been inside the whole time, and tried getting back to sleep. I didn't mention what I saw to Josh's mom. The next morning, when I left, I saw there was a cow tooth sitting on the porch railing. It had been another one of Josh's keepsakes, something he'd picked up on a trip to a farm in school. So, I had woken up about 5 or 5.30 this morning and made my way home. I didn't bother with the cow tooth. It was still dark, so it was damned unnerving walking back to my house. But I made my way back to the salon, made my way quietly into the house, and threw my ass into bed to try to get a little more sleep. And then, not too long ago, I was woken by this awful shrieking coming from somewhere behind my house. I woke up, sprinted to my parents' room, where the best view of the backyard is. Parents were already at work, and stared into the dark again. I didn't know whether or not to pass it off as animals, because I did hear something brush against the house, and then some low, gnawing growling, but then nothing. It's just started getting a little lighter, so I think I may check outside and see if there is any carnage. To answer some things that were brought up, yeah, there was something up with Josh. He was kind of the leader of the merry band, and he was one of those kids that would grow up into one of those guys that naturally takes charge of things. Also, yes, I am trying to protect my safety as well as yours. I've given you all the hints I feel comfortable giving you, but I will stress again. I live in upstate NY, on the lake. It's about five minutes walk from my house. I forgot entirely to share what else has been happening to me, aside from my random blackouts and the visit to Josh's mother's house. Recently, I'll hear this one strain of music. I think I may have mentioned this before. It's like a little bit of carnival music, and then a little melody of bells. Our town has two churches, and one of them is still in use, and plays melodies every half hour. I recognize what that sounds like, but I'll only hear these different songs when I'm closer to the woods. In retrospect, I seem to remember these from when I was a child too. It's an unsettling sensation, as if something is trying to lure me into the woods. I had a scare around last April I forgot to mention as well. Remember how I told you I had been found barefoot? I discovered one of my old shoes, tied by one of the laces, and dangling from a lower branch as though someone had put it there for someone to claim. I recognized it though. I had been wearing Converse that I had been extremely proud of, with a star emblazoned on the heel. I had been heading out from my parents' house to get back to my place when I had seen it and had approached to get a better look. The shoe was dangling about eye level to me, and everything about it screamed trap. I stood about ten feet away from it, examining it. It was battered and damaged from the elements but I could still make out where the blood had soaked into them. That was when I heard this enormous crashing slightly further off into the woods, in a rather leisurely place. Could it have been deer? Certainly, but I noped the fuck out of there anyway. My mind might have been playing tricks on me, but I swear that I could hear a booming coming back at me from the woods. Sorry guys, I've been kind of busy today to try to keep my mind off of it. I was working on our family's farm when I heard what sounded 
like Josh calling to me from the woods. I didn't go in, but I just kept staring, and there was that thing again. Next time, I will take a tape recorder or a video camera so I can show you all. I have to get back to work for now. Alright X, I don't really trust therapists, and my dad won't talk to me about it. I would have gone on ignoring this too, if I hadn't started having the nightmares again. I need to get this off my chest, and maybe find some closure. I'm not going to green text everything, but a lot of it will be. I'm pre-typing this in notepad, and just trying to stay cohesive. I live in the high desert of Oregon. I won't go into any more specifics for obvious reasons. There's three characters in the story. Me, my dad, and a friend from soccer, Nick. I'll include some pics as they become relevant of similar places in the Badlands from Google. I don't have any original pictures of this, as back then, my phone was a piece of shit just for texting and calls, and I wasn't into photography, so I never got a camera. Be me. 15. Fall of 2012. Live in a fairly rural part of town. Like to be outside, and as I'm homeschooled, dad tries to get me more into extracurricular sports. I make it onto a soccer team that's not really an official team, but it's something to do and I don't get fat, daddy's happy, etc. Make a friend. Great forward. His name is Nick. I'm not changing his name because Nick is a fucking common name, and I'm bad at making new ones. There's somewhere around 80 Nick people in that town anyways. Towards the cooler season, we three decide to go camping. Dad's happy because it's a guy's trip, and that I have a friend. Nick is happy, because he doesn't go that often. I'm happy because I love the desert. Take my family's two dogs, German shepherds, and stuff, for a two-day trip. Dad has three guns, two 22 pistols and a 22 rifle. The pistols are for emergency, home, and car defense. The rifle is for small game sometimes. They're not big guns, but we've never really needed them. Head out to the Badlands. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Pacific Northwest or Oregon. It is mostly rainy, wet, green, mossy, lush, you name it. However, Smack in the lower half of Oregon, there's the Badlands wilderness. The Badlands is fucking intense. Hot as hell in the day, cold as balls at night, and it never really changes by season. Just gets colder or hotter. I won't get into the dangerous desert electrical storms. It's full of brush, rock, and thousands of acres of endless sand and short scrub trees and deadwood. It's like a graveyard most times, because of all the bones and shit out there. I love it still, even after this. But it's a really, really harsh place to be unprepared. We have hikers die out there yearly, just from the weather. A decent amount of it is hiking trails, owned land, etc. But the vast, vast majority is undeveloped wasteland. We camp in the wasteland. Drive to a trailhead. Walk in a few miles, and then weave off. Dad and I have walked our dogs out here numerous times. We know where we are, and where we're going. And there's more landmarks in the way of stones and shit. Dogs are off lead, just doing dog things. Nick, Dad, and I are all talking. Generally, just being dudes, etc. Make it a good five or six miles off of the trail before dark. It's a bit dusky. Beautiful sunset, all that shit. Set up in between some rocks. I would have pictures, but this was years and years ago. They've been since lost, and my phone was dog shit at that time anyways. No fire, because we are law-abiding citizens. Got some cook stoves and shit though. Pop it up outside the tent. Roast some hot dogs and BS like that over the tiny-ass flame. It's absurd, but fun, and we're all enjoying it. Dogs get a bit weird as the evening goes on. These are not couch potato ass dogs. One of them was a Schutzhund competitor. Read 
trained guard, sport dog. The other was an adopted adult that was generally just a good boy. Commence enjoyment anyways. Dogs eventually settle down, but on alert. Period low growls. We figure they were just new to this particular area, or maybe there's a scavenger animal. The night passes without any issue. Get up next morning. Eat some shitty camp breakfast that we all love because my outdoors. Dad takes a nap, keeps the 22 pistols, but gives Nick and I the 22 rifle. I'm responsible enough to handle it, and Nick's not a total idiot. Maybe we plink some rabbits or some shit, we think, but really we're just taking pot shots at dead trees and rock formations like idiots, squeezing off shots and playing around with the scope. Neither of us are a bad shot, and we're just out exploring and being 15 and 16 year olds, basically. We have compasses and packs, and like I said, neither of us are full potato. I'll cut the green text for a bit more of a description for this place. It's about a mile north of the broken rock formation where we were camped, across some flat nothingness. It's a small grove-esque clusterfuck of rock chunks and dead trees, maybe a living juniper or two. Not big, not thick more spread out than lush, enough cluster to be shady and notably a bit of an oasis from the waste. Nick and I have no fucking idea what's in there, if anything. Could be some coyotes, man. Hardcore as hell. We rambo our asses up there, crouching like it's Skyrim, slowly creeping in. I've got a rifle drawn and around chambered. It's the desert, though, and we're still being loud enough that no small game would stick around for us anyways. It's quiet, and there's no animals in sight. As we get into the rock and tree cluster, it darkens up a bit and gives a really neat aesthetic to the whole deal. We stop creeping like idiots and stand up, and check out the whole area. Probably a solid four or five hundred square feet of loosely collected rock spires, chunks, logs, dead trees, and a couple living trees. Some of the logs and branches fell against a bent tree, and some stone like a little natural hut, thicket, whatever. There's a bunch of bones and collected detritus inside. Nothing artificial, but there's some stiff, long dead and dried animal hide scraps. The sand is dark, just general appearances of being a den of sorts. Nick's interested, and I'm not too phased, as this isn't my first time outdoors, nor in the Badlands. You get piles of animal bones pretty often if you're looking several miles out. Coyotes just gnaw the fuck out of anything dead and leave them in piles. Den smells like a fucking garbage heap mixed with sulfur. Absolutely atrocious. We get the fuck out from that noise after the smell hits us. Continue to inspect the grove, and from now on, in the story, I'm calling it the grove. There's a climbable tree. Technically, most of them are, but this one's the most sturdy looking. The problem with Badlands trees is that they're incredibly fragile and breakable, given that even when they're alive, they're very dry. Finding one that my ass can get up without snapping is difficult, as my height and weight are not compatible for these types of things. Prop myself up about 12 feet or so, take a look with the scope, pretty cool, drop down, Nick's back to looking at the den. We should come back later and see if the owner is home. Technically, even if this owner was home, it wouldn't have been legal to kill it unless this was Monty Python's deaf rabbit, as we didn't have any tags or licenses for coyote or otherwise. Still think it'd be cool to snag a look at something in its home. Nick's never seen this, and though I've seen and shot many coyotes, I've never seen one at home. We agree to do so, but with the dogs, just in case. Coyotes are cowards, but this might be a group hideout, and we don't want to get nipped before we gun them down for self-defense, if necessary. Continue fucking around the rest of the day. Go back to find that Dad has walked the dogs and come back. Small cook stove fire going. The minute we walk into the camp, though, the dogs get very, very upset with us. They sniff us gingerly, and then back away, growling, doing that leaning head tilt 
like they don't understand. Don't let us near them for a while. They always keep a few feet away and then return to being alert. We tell Dad what we found about a mile up, and he tells us about his walk. He agrees to come with us and bring the dogs, if only because he wants to see it too. Evening again, not quite dusk. I'm watching a rabbit fuck around in the distance with the scope, before I get bored and look around in the distance with it. It's absolutely beautiful. The dark stone and brown sand contrasting with bleach grey trees. The purple sunset, the white thing. What? Swing the scope back to the white thing, which was previously perched to my knowledge, on one of the stones in the distance. It's gone now, but I would have bet money on it. Pausing green text again for this preliminary description. I didn't really see it too well the first time, on the rock, but it was crouched, either quadrupedal and standing, or bipedal, and sitting with its arms and hands on the ground. It wasn't especially big at first, but that may have been the distance, bleached white like a bone, not really much detail at the range I was in. Continue observing for the white thing, maybe it's a pale coyote or something else, but don't catch a glimpse of it. Based on where I saw it, it was maybe directly or slightly off kilter to our west. Ask dad if coyotes can be albino. Basically get a response of, yes you fucking idiot, aren't you in school? Shrug. Call it an albino coyote and forget about it. Fast forward for some idiot shenanigans and conversation to true dark. Laying in tent. Dogs inside with us. Suddenly, the younger one goes berserk a few seconds before the other one joins in. Making jerks between sides of the tent, which is relatively large to serve as three men and two dogs, just pacing around it, growling, barking, hackles up. They look like monsters. I've never seen these dogs quite like this. It's full-on, defensive, offensive posture. Genuinely thought they were going to attack us for a few seconds, before I got awake enough. Smell of garbage and sulfur is back, though faint. Dad wakes up. Nick and I can smell it, but he doesn't seem to be bothered, and we don't mention it, and neither does he. He might have smelled it, but who knows. I don't think he did at that point. Steps outside the tent. Dogs run out in front of him the very millisecond the door unzips, and begin pacing the length of the tent and our little camp area. Dad puts their leashes on and says, well, we may as well go now. Didn't get as much of a nap as I wanted, but it's about midnight. Fucking dad and his fucking naps. The dogs are still on defend and destroy, red alert 9000 or some shit, looking around erratically, constantly pulling against the leashes. Finally, my dad snaps at them to heal and shut up, and they do so, albeit still grunting and growling. We all piss into the desert sands like men, and one of the dogs loosens his lizard too. Grab the headlamps and two flashlights, and we're off. Dad carrying a twenty-two pistol. Nick holding the other one. Nick moment. Holy shit. This is so cool. Nick's parents never gave him guns. In hindsight, it was probably stupid to give him one. But he's not a stupid guy, and it's a fucking twenty-two. I, of course, proudly bear the twenty-two rifle. We head north. It's a pretty simple walk back to the grove. Dogs are still not pleased by this venture. Breaking green text to talk about my dogs a bit more. And my dad, myself, and Nick. Physically. Max was slightly smaller of the two. And a few years older. He wasn't as quick on the draw, ever. But was still a very sturdy and reliable animal. He made you feel safe. But was generally more high strung. Beaver was the larger and younger of the two, laid back, but was trained from puppyhood to be a god among animals. I'm about 5'9", was back then too, and Nick was around 6 foot. We were both fit from soccer, dad's about 5'11 and didn't age the best, but was still muscular. Everyone gets a pot belly. Max seems the most irritated, constantly breaking focus to bark once or twice before hushing on his own. 
and Beaver is a silent asshole, minding the leash but on tenter hooks of aggravation. We get to the grove and the garbage slash burn smell is about three times as bad as when we were there the first time. The dogs straight up refuse to go in. Like, they actually refuse. They dig their heels in and Max begins growling and staring before lurching back and forth as if unsure if he wants to bum rush the grove or stay put. Dad sighs and looks around. We can't leave them on their own because it's the desert in the middle of the night, but Dad doesn't want us out here alone. Oh, we can run in on our own and check. You're only a few hundred feet away anyways. Okay, son, don't be long. I'm going to sit down and look for constellations. Not sure if worst dad or best dad, but he's my dad, so it counts for something. Those few hundred feet become very long when you're behind gnarled wood and rock formations in a shadowy black world, and you turn around and all you see is a lone light from a headlamp. Nick and I, however, emboldened by our guns and teenage idiocy, pressed on through and towards the smell. This time, we really did make an effort to be quiet, almost crawling in the dark, our lights all off except one flashlight, which he held having only a one-handed gun. Behind the beginnings of the grove, however, that teenage strength began to fail me just a little. The putrid smell, the eerie darkness, and the lack of dad made me somewhat unnerved. By our low light, we estimated we were maybe 20 feet away from the area of the den. We were correct. However, we had to creep around to the front, having approached it from the back. Breaking green text here. As we cleared the back side of the den and were in the front, we heard a crack from nearby as a very odd white creature fucking sprinted, almost too fast to notice in the low light, about 10 feet in front of us and into the den. If it wasn't for it being so white, the light might not have even caught it, and we might have played the crack off as an owl or an other bird, and been unaware that the den had become occupied right in front of our eyes. We did, however, both notice, and I kindly thank my dad for always preparing us with flashlights and other gear on journeys. The thing was rather tall, and not especially broad as it was long, but then, at first, we only caught the side view in low light. We froze, and here comes the part that haunted me for two years, almost every night, before it passed and what has recently resurfaced it. It all happened very quickly from here, and I'll try not to exaggerate details. Nick and I continued to get close, but this time, both of us had a round chambered and were pointing the guns to the den. We made our way until we were about five or six feet away from the entrance and then flipped on our headlights. I don't know why we did that. I think it was our intent to startle it and be able to see it and then run. It was very startled and let out a very disgusting, screeching growl bark, like a short boof that most canines do, but very ugly sounding. It was also higher pitched and sounded like there was spit and snot behind it. It was very apparent to us at that moment that this was not a coyote. We bounced back a few feet and the creature didn't emerge. We could still see it, but it was moving around inside the den in a bit of a frenzy. It made the scream growls a few more times and Nick and I unanimously began to yell to each other to fucking run, dude. That was probably the biggest mistake of the night, but thankfully, neither of us suffered for it. What we should have done was open fire the minute that we realized it wasn't a coyote. The second that we turned and ran, I could hear sand and bone rattling and being tossed as it ran out after us. Nick squeezed off a few random shots, I think out of fear and I managed to get up into a tree, about five or six feet in the air. Nick was right behind me, but instead chose a rock formation about ten feet away. He played forward after all, so his sprints were harder than mine, 
and I think he just wanted to run at that moment. The white creature pursued Nick, backing off whenever he turned, and then leaping along after he looked away. It was a dangerous game that only took a few seconds to play, but it unfolded in slow motion for me. Nick popped off the rest of the 22 clip, and then the white creature began to scale the rock. I wasted only a second more before leveling the rifle and firing blindly. I could have hit Nick. I'm glad I didn't. I did, however, scare the white thing, or at least attract it. It left Nick, and then it barked screamed at me, leaping off the rock. I began shimmying up the tree, and in the darkness, I cracked my head against a branch sticking out directly over me. The mongrel began to climb the tree below me. My vision blurring a bit, I popped another two or three shots. The clip of the rifle only has six rounds, and I kept that in mind. I figured I only had two left, as I wasn't counting very well, and didn't want to be overconfident. Nick's yelling at something, maybe the white creature, but then I hear a different pitch of scream. Nick has just fucking thrown the gun at the white creature, and hit it. Not hard, but those metal bastards weigh a couple pounds, and later on, I realized why it hurt. Again, this whole sequence took maybe 30 seconds, but it felt so much longer. Then, as the thing is looking to climb again, I see it go flying off of the tree trunk. Beaver, Max, and Dad came to the gunshots and yelling, my dad several seconds behind. Beaver has just ripped the mongrel off of the tree by slamming into it and grabbing it. I'm unsure of how many of you are dog people, but German shepherds have very boxy, broad chests and shoulders. If they leap at you and their teeth miss, they'll still knock you flying a few feet if they intend to. In this moment, time seems to totally slow down. Even in the nightmares, this particular sequence plays out very, very slowly. Nick and Dad are yelling. Max and Beaver are snarling and yelping, and my conked head vision is starting to clear. The headlamp clearly illuminates this thing as it tries to deal with the dogs. It stands up. It's not quadrupedal. It's bipedal. And for two or three seconds, I get a very clear image that's burned forever into my head. It's tall, maybe seven feet, and skinny as hell. I mean scrawny. Long forearms, long hind legs, all of it built like a dog. Somehow, even though it's so thin, I can't make out the bones. But maybe it's the flashlighting and the white fur that's obscuring it. It's blisteringly white, stained now with red. Either my dog's or its own blood. The neck is rather long, and it has a very long, pointed muzzle and face. No discernible ears or facial features. There's a gangly little tail, and its eyes and nose appear to be black. But I could be wrong on the eyes in the circumstance. It had teeth, but I could not tell you what kind. The forearm, paws, hands, whatever, had fairly long digits, and there were short claws on the end. I less saw them and more heard them make contact with the dogs. Overall, the thing most resembled a whippet or a greyhound in how skinny and long it was. And the face. It was built like a canine as well, but it definitely stumbled around on two legs to get the advantage on the dogs for many, many seconds. It wasn't just rearing, it was balanced like that, and its back and chest were appropriate for it. It looked natural to see it on two legs, basically. Again, I'm unsure if you're familiar with German Shepherds, but when they bite, they bite hard. They're the third or fourth hardest biting dog in the world, pound for pound, if I remember correctly. When they bite down, they don't let go. Beaver, at least, had some great purchase on this thing's arm, and I heard a loud crack and the most horrific bark scream released. Max was just snapping and ripping into whatever he could grab, I think. Dad didn't shoot. I don't think he wanted to hit the dogs, and I didn't either, so I didn't waste my shot. The dogs did good work, 
and I don't think this monster even wanted to fight. But we walked up on its house in the middle of ass fuck nowhere. I hear a more normal yelp, and Max's head gets drizzled in blood. The ugly thing flails and Beaver drops a few feet to the ground, as it had been swinging the dog a bit. It screamed again, and then sprinted on its hind legs, and I lost sight of it after it left the grove. This is where the nightmares ended, at least. Max's ear had a hole in it, toward the middle, and had likely been bitten. It bled a lot, but it was minor, and he's had far worse. Beaver was unscathed, thankfully. Overall, None of us were really hurt. Blood was all over the clearing, and in both dogs' mouths. I crept down from the tree, and Nick got off the rock spire. I landed on the twenty-two handgun, where it had been thrown and knocked into the mongrel, picked it up, shoved it in my pocket, and ran to my dad, too scared to cry. Nick was shell-shocked as well. The dogs gave pursuit, but my dad called them back. None of us said anything, really. We walked back to the campsite. I don't remember ever putting the rifle down, and my dad still had a fully loaded gun. The dogs were still aggravated, but seemed quieter, as if they believed the fight was over. We all stayed awake, sitting outside of the tent, my dad and I clutching guns, Nick just staring. Come dawn, we packed up and marched out, still not talking about it. When we got back into town, my dad looked at us in the back seat and said it was some kind of diseased coyote and not to worry about it. We nodded, not really knowing anything else to say. None of us believed it. It was a short encounter relatively, but we were all scared out of our minds because that tall ass white thing wasn't a damn coyote. Nick and I neglected to really keep in touch one soccer season ended, and by then, I had gotten a job, so I didn't sign up again. I tried to bring it up to dad once, but he just shook his head and told me to stop thinking about it. We've never talked about it since. I've been out to the Badlands a few times since then because I still love it, and my dad has too, having once been a part of a search and rescue a few years ago. We've never seen anything, and though we don't mention it, we make a point to never go anywhere within 10 miles of the grove. I would really have loved not to ever think about this again, and for a few years, I haven't. I'm 20 now, and the last two-ish years, it's mostly faded from memory. But in the past week, the nightmares are resurfacing, likely because of stress from other things in my life, and I need to talk this out somewhere, so I put it here. So that concludes my story, X. If anyone has had a similar experience with that white health spawn, or has questions, I'll probably be awake another hour or so. X moves slow, and I'll be back in the fret tomorrow. Beaver's older, but is still healthy, and Max's ear healed fine. He's past elderly now, and missing most of his teeth. But both dogs made it out okay, for those concerned. Finished. A little background to start. I work as a topographer slash tracker for a local group in Colorado and Wyoming. My job consists of surveying areas and mapping out common game trails and popular places for herds to gather for hunting and ecological purposes. When I'm out, I'm mostly on an ATV until I find a game trail, which I then map out on foot. When I'm going a long distance, I stop at outposts that have been set up along the trail to refuel and rest for the night, or go to in case of hazardous weather. I've seen some things that have made me question what's out there, such as mutilated deer, bull elks torn in half, holes dug through the fresh body of animals from the inside out. While seeing things like this is unsettling, I usually shrug them off as some kind of nasty parasite or bear attack. The thing that made me wonder whether or not I was up against something much bigger didn't happen till recently while near the Wyoming-Colorado border 
in between outposts in the first week of December. To start, it was snowing fairly lightly, kinda spitting really. The pines stopped most of the snow falling on me while I was walking back to my ATV. While it was snowing lightly, the layer on the ground was at least a foot deep off trail, making it pretty difficult to move or be quiet while lumbering through it. I got on the ATV and drove about half a mile up the trail, almost crossing over into Wyoming, when I noticed another trail that looked freshly made. When I got off the ATV, I noticed some small droplets of blood in the snow going down the trail with what looked like bear prints with something dragging behind it. I grabbed my gun off the rack on the ATV and slung it over my shoulder. The trail looked fresh, but the prints and blood were starting to get covered in a layer of snowfall. While walking along the trail, I noticed something kind of weird in the middle of the bear tracks. It looked like a human foot almost, but rather elongated and thin, with only four toes on the end. The tracks twisted within the bear prints themselves, almost like the animal's foot spun a bit coming out of the bear track. I continued on, while occasionally glancing back into the track, and sure enough, the prints were still there. When I go to the end in a large clearing, I stopped following the bear tracks. Something about being in this large clearing with an unknown animal was making me uneasy. I mapped it out and placed a red line over it, indicating a high predatory area. On the way back, I noticed something strange about my own boot prints. Now, I'm a pretty big guy, standing at 6 foot 2 with a size 13 boot, but whatever had made the tracks had a footprint significantly larger than my own, but that's not the worst part. Whatever it was had followed my boot prints back, heading in the same direction that I was. Whatever it was, it snuck behind me and was heading towards my ATV. I shouldered my rifle and put a round in the chamber. I walked back, glancing down every so often to see if the twisted footprints were indeed still in mine. When I got back to my ATV, I noticed that the prints circled my vehicle and stopped behind it and shuffled a bit. I then noticed that my jerry can was missing and that thing had left a trail of gasoline down the road from where I came. I hopped on my quad to get going in the opposite direction, hoping to distance myself from whatever stole my fuel. After crossing over into Wyoming, I noticed that everything was rather still. It was still snowing, but the flakes almost seemed to be suspended in the air, not falling but not static either. I couldn't hear anything when my ATV was shut off. No animals, no snowfall, not even my own breathing. Almost like something had stopped all sound from existing. I found another game trail, this time a few hundred yards off the trail. I dismounted and walked towards the opening in the trees, with pristine snow covering the rocky terrain around me. All along the trail, I would catch fleeting glimpses of a shadow. Not shadows, no. Just one. Moving along the trail with me. I put it off to lack of sleep, making me see things. On my way back, I got a chill up my spine. In my own boot prints were the same tracks I saw at the last trail. The same twisty human-like print, but this time, something was touching the ground in front of them. A swipe here and there, almost like whatever it was, was tracking me by scent. I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I reached for my sidearm, kicking myself for leaving the rifle on the ATV. I heard a ragged breath from my left, like if you collapsed a lung on a deer. I drew and fired into the trees, striking on Aspen and blowing a hole in its small frame. I saw nothing, no movement, no snowfall, no animal. I started getting the same feeling 
I was getting from the clearing and ran back to my quad. Whatever had been following me beat me there. I followed the tracks around my ATV like last time and stopped to see what it took next. It took my rifle. My rifle. A large rifle that would require something very large to carry it off in its mouth, or something with hands and the strength to carry it. I looked a little closer at the prints, and found something I had missed every time. Inside the footprints, right where the twist ended, I noticed four very long appendages peeking through the twisted snow. It looked like a monkey foot, but longer and more hand-like, but not quiet enough to be human. I mounted and hit the throttle, spinning out a bit until I got traction and went shooting down the road. I was too low on fuel to go back to a main road where I could get help and was forced to go to my next outpost. When I arrived, the small cabin hut-like structure looked so comforting and protective, I almost cried. It had fuel for the quad, a safe place for me to sleep, and a radio for help. The sun was setting, and I was firing up the stove after starting the generator when my radio crackled and came to life. I jumped when I heard the static hiss. I ran over to the radio and requested an evac or an extra team for a safe escort. When asked why, I lied and said I was being hunted by a bear and lost my rifle on the trail. The voice on the other end scoffed, but obliged. My team would be there by morning. When I hung up the radio and started to get comfy and safe, I heard a loud thump hit my door. I froze in my bed, not knowing what to do. I finally got up after debating whether or not to just hide. I'm no coward, I thought. I grabbed my sidearm and walked towards the door. I peeked out the small window to see if someone or something was out there. All I saw was darkness. Stupidly, I opened the door and shouted, If you don't leave, I'm going to kill you. You took one of my guns, but I still have the other. No response. I looked at my door to see what hit it, and only saw the remnants of a snowball. A fucking snowball. I waited to see if I could see any movement, when another snowball came flying out of the darkness to my left and hit my shoulder. You better run, or I'm gonna fucking kill you, I yelled, as I slammed the door shut and ran out to confront whatever threw the snowball. I ran towards where the ball came from, watching for prints or signs of movement. I saw something in the darkness that looked like a man had fallen and was scrambling on the ground to get up, making that raspy breathing noise. I stopped and aimed, but saw that whatever was in front of me had continued to run on all fours at an alarming speed, faster than I could run. I froze when I saw the black silhouette dart off into the darkness, not sure what to do. After listening and hearing nothing, no breathing, no running, I headed back to my hut. Once I got to the clearing my hut was in, I stopped, relieved I had made it out of the woods alive. I took a deep breath and calmed myself down and started walking towards the cabin, illuminated by the lone porch light on the deck. I looked down, trying to follow my tracks back to conserve energy, and nearly vomited. The twisted footprints were in my tracks heading towards the cabin. I saw the trail heading back towards the cabin, each twisted footprint slamming down into my own until it got to my porch. Amidst all the snow dragged on by the thing was my rifle and jerry can, placed neatly on the porch, leaning against the wall. The door was askew and jarred open a bit. I could have sworn I saw the leg of the thing dart in as soon as I looked at it. I wish I could say I bursted in there and shot the thing dead, but I was too frozen with fear to do anything but stand there. I wish I could say I was brave and fought the good fight, but I didn't. I crumpled onto the ground, 
cradling my knees until sunup. I had spent six hours in the darkness, waiting for whatever that thing was to come out and finish me. But it never happened. My crew found me covered in snow with my gun drawn and pointed at my cabin. They questioned me and searched the cabin. All of my food was eaten. My bed was torn up and made into a makeshift nest thing like a dog would sleep in. And the radio was destroyed, but no sign of whatever was hunting me. Years ago, in southern Mexico, Dad takes me to some road on the outskirts of our town in order to teach me how to drive. Road is surrounded by forest on both sides. We went at night, since there's less traffic at that time. I get the hang of things pretty quickly, and soon enough, I'm driving just fine. I was keeping an eye out in case an animal tried to cross the street. The following events happened within the span of a few seconds. Something hops out of the bushes on the right side of the road and into the middle of the street. I hit the brakes and barely managed to avoid hitting it. The thing briefly stares at the car in shock, like a deer in headlights. As it does, Dad and I manage to get a good look at it, and we both start to freak out. It was a short, humanoid creature around the size of a human child, but its exact size was really hard to tell, since it was crouching. Its body was grayish brown and scaly, like a crocodile's. It had a row of long spines along its back, like an iguana. It had clawed hands, and its legs resembled those of a kangaroo. It had a flat, reptilian-looking nose, no visible ears, and oily black eyes that reflected the glow from the car's headlights. The shocked expression on its face quickly turned into a frown, and it leapt into the bushes on the other side of the road. Dad and I stare at each other in disbelief. We agree not to tell the rest of the family, since they would probably think we're either crazy or liars. What do you think it was, X? An alien? A goblin? Your mom? I've got one story that an acquaintance told me involving a research trip in Brazil. I didn't know the guy very well at the time, so I can't vouch for his trustworthiness, but he definitely seems shaken up by what he told me. I'll tell it from his point of view. 23-year-old ecology student. I get the opportunity to study abroad, field work in Brazil. We'd be camping in the Amazon two nights, staying another night with a small tribe that the university occasionally worked with, then camping one more night on the way out. It took a day to get out there by ferry. When we finished, we'd return to the university and finish up our research there for a total of two weeks worth of work. The boat trip into the Amazon was fun. Drinking and dancing almost got my dick wet from a Brazilian student, but decided against it. Colombian heritage, so I speak Spanish. Overhear the crew talking at one point. They're wondering nervously if they should turn around, but when they see me, they all look away and stop talking. Next morning, we reach the place that we'll be disembarking from. First day of hiking was difficult, but incredible. So much plant and animal life. It was a budding ecologist's wet dream. As the sun began to set, I remember hearing what sounded like an elephant trumpeting from very far away. Suddenly, there were guns in the crew's hands, but no one will tell us what's going on. We hike until it's dark, and then make camp. Most people sleep in ENOs provided by the university. The rest of the crew sleeps on pads on the ground with guns. I hear the same trumpeting sound as before in the middle of the night. Only this time, it's much closer. Maybe only a mile away. From inside the ENO, I hear the crew talking outside. It's Portuguese, so I can hardly understand a word. They say Mapinguari more than once. Eventually, 
I fall asleep. Wake up and some of the crew is gone. Turns out, they went on ahead because a tree had fallen somewhere up the trail and had to be cut up to clear the way for gear porters. We eventually reached the village, which is abuzz with activity. Men, some in shorts, others in native clothes, have spears and bows walking around. Turns out, there was an animal attack the night before, and a little girl was killed by what was likely a jaguar. Damn shame, that webham. Small funeral for the girl in both Christian and native style. Here are more Mapanguari. I asked the head professor what that means. Apparently it's some forest spirit slash animal that is usually docile, but very dangerous if it perceives a threat, kind of like a rhino. Some natives and guides think it was responsible for the girl's death. You're yeah, right, superstitious heathens. Hear odd sound all throughout the first day, at different distances and positions. Natives are wigged out. All of them head inside before dark, instead of partying as planned. I, however, go for a walk around the village. Notice that along one side of it, they have a small crop of corn, and other things set up, like an offering. The whole scene is like something out of a storybook. Beautiful night sky. Quaint jungle village. Nice little farm. Huge hairy thing eating corn. What? A quadruped, standing on its hind legs, is using its claws to cut off the ears of corn and is eating them whole. Has a head like a cross between a bear and a horse. I try to back away quietly, but I trip and fall on a rock. The thing snaps its head and looks around at me. After about a minute, it lets out an ungodly bellow and fucks off into the jungle. Promptly get my ass up and tactically get to my assigned hut. Next morning, the villagers are freaking out, saying it was a map and glory again. The crew and students decide things are getting weird and leave a day early rather than risk an animal attack. The rest of the way back to the boat is relatively uneventful. No sign of the beast, but we kept hearing that strange trumpeting sound in the distance. Pick related. I'm fairly convinced it was a gorp. Long time lurker of this board, but I have never felt more compelled to write my experience without getting accused of talking shit, etc. This was one of the most frightening experiences of my life, and I get shivers just thinking about it. I'm on my phone, so predicted text might kick in. Me and a friend walking along the path in a forest. Path is just a dirt trail which had been walked on for years. It's around 6pm, so the sun was still around until 8 to 9. As soon as it started setting, it got dark quite fast because of the angle of light hitting the trees. Decide to head back to the house, going back the way we came. Not concentrating on the path and slightly veer off. Becomes just woodland twigs with broken patches of pine. Light is still there, but mostly shadow. Get this god-awful feeling something is watching. Say to my friend and he feels the same. Walking. Suddenly, a huge crack of wood. I say wood, but it was really thick sounding. Both turn around to nothing. Staring in the direction of the sound. Holding your breath so you can hear better. Temperature is lower since the sun is about down. We both start breathing again slowly, almost feeling like my heart was pumping harder than usual, but trying to control my breathing. Then we saw it, slowly crawling towards us with a large, cold air breath close to the ground, towards us, literally freeze in fear. It wasn't crawling naturally, but like an adult pretending to be a horse, but slower. It was big, and I mean really big and broad. Dense coat all over. Yellow eyes with a touch of light like a cat. Crept towards us, but slightly hesitant. Then lets out the loudest scream slash yell slash roar slash screech 
I have ever heard. I could have died on the spot with fear. I stood up and just stared. We didn't move. Huge silhouette of a bear-like monster but thinner. It then whimpered like a human and made a fake crying sound. Never forget. Reported to the police. Didn't do anything. Not been in the woods since. Live in rural Appalachia. Be driven home by uncle with mom in the passenger side. Me in the back. Be about six years old. Driving in the woods with no lights besides the moon and stars. It's really late, about midnight. Car screeches to a halt. I end up in the floorboards. Uncle and mom are staring ahead into the high beams, mouths agape. Won't move their eyes. Weird sigh noise escaping their mouths. They're both whispering something? Maybe to each other. Maybe to me. I can't understand it. Look to where they are staring. See a massive owl, easily seven feet or more, standing in the middle of the road. Owl turns to look at me and my family, eyes reflecting the headlights. Owl was about ten feet away. I don't see anything but my own reflection in the high beam lit owl eyes. Fall asleep. Wake up at home, nowhere near where we were, literally half a state away. Mom and uncle don't remember the drive, don't remember the owl, don't even remember me being there. Can't remember the words, but can remember still to this day the feeling the whispers gave me, which was excitement. Sometimes can still hear the whispers, whatever they say. Made sure they were not schizo for years. Nobody knows what the giant owl was. Be me, 2019. Find drain tunnel near friend's house. Try to explore. Get in. Maybe 100 feet before it's pitch black. Go to friend's house. Hey bro, wanna come explore this cool drain with me? Sorry Anon, I'm scared by this kind of thing. You can have my headlamp though. Thanks bro, see ya. Return to tunnel. Sun is setting. Head inside. Observe my surroundings. The deeper into the tunnel, the older the graffiti on the walls. Mostly from the 70s and having to do with weed and sex. My face went, boomers got high and fucked where I'm standing. Try to ignore that fact and keep moving. Walk for 10 more minutes. Long fucking tunnel, that PNG. Notice that the walls have been barren for the past three minutes. Keep walking. More graffiti comes into view. It looks pretty creepy. Probably tagged by some edgy kids 30 years ago to scare people. Don't think too much of it. Been walking for 30 minutes now. Should probably head back. Walk back. Get to a wall. The wall is blocking what would have been the entrance slash exit. Made of concrete. Looks like it's been there for decades. No possible way I could have made a wrong turn. It's all one tube. I'm trapped in the tunnel. Have to head back down to find a way out. Son of a bitch. Dot JPEG. Turn around. Start walking. Walk until I see the occult symbols again. Here's something behind me. Pick related. Hear multiple appendages slash legs splashing around. Clear light breathing coming from it. Take picture, because I had my phone trying to get service. It blinks after I take the picture. Lurches forward. Do a 180 and make tracks. I sprint for a good 10 minutes. Muscles dying, lungs burning, throat as dry as the Sahara. Eventually see outlet. Sweet freedom. Escape the tunnel. Collapse into a puddle of stagnant water and tadpoles. Walk to friend's house. Cold, wet, and tired. Never go back. Reverse image search. Multiple reverse image search sites. No hits. Alright X, I already posted the first part of this green text 
but the story has evolved. If you have already read the first two parts of the story, feel free to skip them. By the way, I'm not posting in the green text thread because it's basically dead already. I am going to need an explanation for this fuckery though, because things have gone from weird to scary. Part 1 out of 4. Be me. Live in rural Finn, Denmark, on farm for my entire life. Own animals, most of them being sheep. Feels comfy, man. .exe. One night, hear an absolutely blood curdling scream at about 5 a.m. Words can't even fucking describe it. Hear two of these. Feel a little bit uneasy, but whatever. Since I live out in the country and next to a small forest, I'm used to hearing some ungodly dying screams of animals, so I didn't think too much of it, but shit still made me exceptionally uneasy. Next morning, have electronic classes. Spot my dad dragging a sheep carcass through our back garden, presumably to the place where we bury the animals that die unexpectedly. Um, okay, I guess? After classes, Ask my dad what the fuck happened. My dad says that he has never seen anything like it. He said that the left half of the thing's face is just gone, cleanly picked to the bone. Pick related. I go out to inspect the corpse. He's right. Not only did the thing cleanly eat only half of its face cleanly to the bone, but it also devoured its tongue and its left ear. What? The fuck is this shit? I inspect the corpse closer, in order to look for the death blow that killed my dear boy. There fucking is none. Whatever killed my dear sheep did not do it quickly. Snap a pick and check out the spot where my dad found the corpse. Get to the spot where my dad found the body. No sign of a struggle. Okay, now I am confused. All I saw were a few feathers. Situation around the killing is too unusual for it to have been one of the many eagles slash hawks in the area. Plus, they never attack animals of this size. If it would have been a huge fox or some shit, it wouldn't have only targeted the face. A fox is the only animal in this part of the country where this shit would be even possible. Even then, it seems highly unlikely. Shit's weird, but okay, I guess. Fast forward a week or two. Be sitting in my room doing whatever, about seven at night. Hear some very unsettling noises from the kitchen. I am a bit intimidated since the recent sheep killing. I get closer. It's my cat, and it is going fucking mental. Whilst it's making said noises, it's looking outside into the darkness. I can see fuck all. About a couple seconds after I enter the line of sight of the window, my cat stops and jumps over to me. What the actual fuck? Fast forward to that night. Blood curdling scream. MP3. Next day. Check on the sheep. Another one dead. Exact same pattern. Pick related. Fast forward a month or two. Two days ago, no new dead sheep. Sitting in my bed, at night, reading about the geopolitical situation of Afghanistan. Quick info, my bed is pushed against my window, so my back is against a window, ground level, with no curtains. Already a bit paranoid because of the events a couple of months ago. Tap, tap, tap. Only God knows how fast I shot myself. Some fucker tapped on my fucking window. Don't have the balls to look around. Just praying to God that I remembered to lock the doors. Wait another 10 minutes or so before having the balls to turn around. Nothing there. Wait another hour. Processing what just happened. Then fall asleep. And that's about it. Now before you say, Lamau, the sheep just died and the birds ate the remains. I have seen my share of of dead sheep in open fields. And let me tell you, the last thing to go are always the ears. Birds don't eat the fucking ears. Something bigger wouldn't just straight up 
eat half its face and fuck off. Besides, as I previously mentioned, nothing bigger than a fox or large predatorial birds live in this area. Please tell me if I'm overreacting and that it isn't a cryptid or some shit. Okay, wow. I didn't know that skinwalkers or goatmen or whatever were a thing. Allegedly a thing. So I always thought I was the only one who'd experienced something like this. Like maybe it was a hallucination or something. But after reading some of these stories, I'm starting to think maybe there's something there. Here's what happened. Few years ago, living with parents. Step out for a cigarette at about 2am. Mom hated cigarettes, had to sneak out back by the woods. Smoking. Notice my neighbor Sean down at the edge of the woods, looking at me. What the fuck? Wave at him. He just stands there. Suddenly, it's hard to breathe. Like the air is thick, kind of humid, I guess. And it smells the way pennies taste. Kick myself for being a scaredy cat. Take a drag from the cigarette and smoke gets in my eyes. If this has happened to you, you know that it hurts like a bitch. I'm forced to close my eyes and rub them for a few seconds. Look up and Sean is closer to me. Like he'd walked from the edge of the forest, but now he's stopped and standing still again. What was he doing in the forest anyway? What the fuck is going on? He waves, but it's like he's jerking his arm instead of moving it fluidly. Like he's not sure what he's doing with it. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? Put out my cigarette without taking my eyes off him. Back into the door and go in. Shut the door. Peek out the window. He's staring right the fuck at me. Closer to the house. Maybe 10 or 15 yards away now. Lock my door. Sprint upstairs. Lock every door in the house. Go to double check every door. Double checking basement door. He's standing right outside the window staring at me. His jaw is just kind of drooping. When I look at him, he does the jerking wave again. Scream with the force of a thousand suns. Went upstairs. Encounter my stepdad. He's like, what the fuck are you screaming for? I tell him there's someone outside. He gets his gun and checks. No one there. Ask neighbor about it at dinner one day. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. Fuck skinwalkers.